Hey what's up, it's cute what if this side. Today we will be seeing, what if Deku and all men had lost their quirk. Now before we move ahead with the fic, leave a like and subscribe to the channel. For future what ifs like this. It was the morning of November 8th, and it was the day everything would change. Izuku woke up in his room, ready to go to school. He went through his morning routine before noticing a reminder on his calendar. The alert read remind All Might about the library of Babel warning. Quickly asking M3 to send All Might a reminder about the event that had caused him to contact her in the first place, he continued with his morning routine. The three of them, Izuku, All Might, and M3, had worked together for the past years, growing closer despite their inability to ever meet each other in person. They had worked together to take down several criminal organizations throughout Japan, worked their way through the top 10 villains in Japan on a yearly basis, and kept up with each other regarding their personal lives. Izuku had revealed that he was a student, using the topics he was researching to mask his age. He talked with All Might about his work with Quirk Theory, letting her in on some of the things he had discovered that would never grace the pages of an academic journal due to his need for privacy. Through All Might, he confirmed that some of his Quirk-confirmed theories were common knowledge among pro-heroes and well-connected villains while others remained limited to the three of them. M3 had built up his own personality as the youngest of the three, alternating between his sophisticated demeanor and acting how a human his age should as he felt necessary. He spoke much less in the group, often only replying when Izuku was unable to. Over the intervening years, he had developed his software to the point where he was unassailable by anyone without access to his physical location in Izuku's bedroom. Aside from Izuku's anomalous presence, no human could compare to M3's explosive rate of improvement and ability, having greatly improved his own database of information and his ability to collect useful information. All Might, as far as she shared, was as much of a hero out of costume as she was in costume, making sure that the two of them weren't overworking themselves to get her the information they were supplying her. Her relationship with Izuku and M3 was somewhere between that of a parent and a child and co-workers, leading to abrupt shifts in the conversations at times. Separately, each of them were indisputably strong in their own ways. Izuku with his unerring precision and accuracy, M3 with his digital omniscience, and All Might with her peerless strength. Together, however, they were unstoppable. In Japan, All Might's status as the number one heroine was unquestionable. Endeavor did her best to challenge her, but with All Might's current track record of successful villain arrests and lack of civilian casualties, the difficulty of dethroning her would be comparable to that of beating her in a competition of raw strength. On the international stage, her ability was second to only to the Australian heroine Freeze Frame, who could stop time for up to 10 seconds according to publicly released information. Everyone was equally powerless against such a quirk, though if Izuku put his mind to it the three of them could likely defeat her. Even so, today she would be entering a fight against someone who could seriously injure her to the point that she would have to retire from her life as a hero. The concept was worrying, and Izuku's quirk confirmed that there were women with more powerful quirks that lived in the world. As Izuku and his mother left the house to walk to school, Izuku hoped that everything would go well today. After all, Japan couldn't afford to lose all might. All Might's POV. Yagi Toshika woke up bright and early, both ready and uneasy about the day that awaited her. She had been counting down for the past three years for this day, where she would encounter the woman who had killed all of her predecessors. She had not found a successor for her quirk in case the worst happened, confident in the information the librarian had given her so long ago. Nobody had caught her eye as a potential successor, nobody had the metaphorical spark of true heroism inside them that would bring out the true potential of one for all. The librarian and me were suitably heroic, but one was a child and the other lacked the ability to reveal herself to the public for a multitude of reasons, preventing her from receiving the training she would need to accept the inherited quirk in the first place. Nevertheless, she had left a strand of her hair and specifications on the physical ability to wield the quirk with her mentor, Gran Torino. In the case that something unavoidable happened, she was to search for a successor to carry on the legacy of eight generations of heroes. It was just a precaution, she thought to herself as she eyed the mirror plating that she would be wearing beneath her hero uniform over her right lung that day. From the librarian's predictions, she would be hit with a light-based attack that would permanently damage the organ beneath it during the fight that day. While she ate breakfast, she received a message from me. Just a reminder, today's the day. Remember to wear the mirror and not to jump right when the ceiling above you collapses. Don't worry, you've got this. The librarian is sure that you will live today so long as you remember these two things. Otherwise, do your best. You've got this. Toshiko let out a nervous chuckle as she replied. The librarian's word was as close as one could get to the truth from her experience, but she wasn't sure she'd remember the information about the ceiling in the heat of battle. I'll do my best, me. If I don't make it, or I can't be a hero after today, I just want you and the librarian to know that it was a joy to work with you for the past three years. Maybe after today, the three of us will be able to finally meet in person, okay? The response was as quick as me's always were. That's the dream, all might. I wish you the best of luck. Toshiko set her phone down and covered her face with her hands. When she removed them after a lengthy pause, the look of uncertainty was gone from her face. She was no longer Yagi Toshiko, civilian woman. She was all might, the strongest heroine in Japan, 
and she would not fall today. Bakugo Masaru POV. Bakugo Masaru woke up early that morning, before either his wife or his daughter. As he slid out of bed, he repositioned the covers so that the cold wouldn't get in and disrupt his wife's sleep. The reason he was up so early was because today was one of the few days that he had to physically go into work. As he had to give a presentation about the increasing failures of aging hardware, and the need to purchase new technology to replace machines that were older than some of the people working there. As he got dressed in the suit he reserved for such occasions, his wife Mitsuki woke up due to the empty space next to her in bed. She called out to him, words slurring from just having woken up. Masa, what are you doing? Masaru, much more of a morning person than either of the women in his family, walked over and gave her a chaste kiss. I have to get to work early today, Mitsu. I'll be back before noon. I've been telling you about this for the past week. You have to remember to walk Katsumi to school today. Okay. I'll be there to pick her up afterwards. Mitsuki moved her arms out from underneath the covers to give him a hug before he went, which he happily returned. As he walked to the door, she rolled over to his side of the bed. When he had softly shut the door behind him, he subconsciously licked his lips, tasting the sweetness of Mitsuki's quirk-induced glycerin sweat. What had at first seemed to him like an unfortunate quirk that would make life harder for her had grown over the years to become his favorite taste, the physical manifestation of their love for each other. He stopped by his daughter's room on his way to the door, and quietly made his way into the room. He gave Katsumi a kiss on her forehead, watching as she smiled in her sleep and curled up tighter into a ball under her covers. He left the room as quietly as he had entered it, and quietly made his way out of the house, briefcase in hand. The sun had just crested over the horizon as he made his way to the train station, ready to give his presentation and get back home to his family. All Might's POV. All Might had just finished stopping the third crime of her day, and the sun was already high in the sky. She had been treating every alert she responded to that day with an inordinate amount of caution, making sure that nothing was suspicious or went wrong throughout her involvement. She had been moving throughout Japan recently, cycling through to keep villains from only avoiding one city while increasing their presence unchecked in others. Today she was in Musutafu City, where Yue was located. The fourth crime she was called to stop that morning was the debut of a villain who called herself Toxic Chainsaw, who was attacking civilians in the business district. Three were confirmed dead by the time heroes arrived, with others perishing afterwards due to the toxic nature of her quirk. The most the local heroes were able to do was contain the damage that the unstable woman caused while evacuating the area. After she arrived, the woman began to flee, running into a building that was under construction to avoid the most famous woman in Japan. All Might gave chase, making her way up to the third floor before apprehending the fleeing villain. She was quickly knocked unconscious and wrapped up in capture tape, and All Might began to relax, thinking that this would be another simple crime scene. Fortunately, however, she hadn't stopped paying attention entirely as noises came from the floors above her. She tossed the subdued villain to the side, moving into a ready stance. The noises became louder, before she clearly heard the sound of something breaking two floors above her. Looking up to the ceiling, she saw it cracking almost in slow motion as she remembered the librarian's advice. Don't jump right to avoid the falling ceiling. Instead, she jumped slightly backwards and to her left, putting herself near the closest support pillar while facing the cracked ceiling. As she landed and adjusted herself, she looked back towards the place she had just been in. The ceiling had indeed collapsed, with fragments of rebar dotting the area to the right that she had been warned to avoid. In another timeline, she would have jumped right there and have been at a serious disadvantage before the fight with her fated opponent had even begun. Now, her vision was unclouded by pain as she watched the most powerful villain she had ever faced descend, using one of an unknown number of stolen flight quirks to slow her fall and turn herself to face the bearer of one for all. You knew this day would come, All Might. The woman spat the name out as she cleared the rubble with either a telekinesis quirk or a wind manipulation one. Ever since I killed Shamira Nana, ever since she told you the story of what I represent, you knew that one day you would face me, and you would fall. Never one to be sporting against the villain that posed the largest risk to her life, and the world as a whole. All Might interrupted her monologue by blitzing the smaller woman. Before the blow could land, however, she had already moved out of the way. There had been no delay or movement that All Might had seen, leading to her assumption that the quirk was some form of short-range teleportation. How rude of you, All Might. Aren't you supposed to be the perfect hero? Kind, fair, and forgiving. With your predecessors, I waited until they had passed my sister's quirk on before engaging in this little game. With you, however, I can't afford such a strategy. Here she dodged again, avoiding repeated strikes from All Might as she tried to subdue all for one without further damaging the building. You've simply grown too powerful, and you've become too famous. Truly, I'm impressed by your record. Three years without so much as an injury at any crime you stopped. I have to hand it to you, it would take even me some luck if I were to try such a thing. Unfortunately, it's time for me to end this game. For the first time in their encounter, she made an attack of her own, yanking one of the pieces of rebar from the floor with a magnetic quirk and throwing it at All Might at blazingly fast speeds. The heroine dodged, but the attack was more symbolic than anything. 
Now, the fight would truly begin. It's time for me to finally reunite with my dear sister. Back you go Masaru POV. Masaru left the office building at 11 with a smile on his face. The board had been receptive to his presentation and generally agreed that the technology needed to be updated once he pulled out some of the more extreme statistics. He turned right as he left, walking on autopilot as his mind wandered. He couldn't wait to get home and change back into normal clothes before picking up Katsumi and Izuku from school. He would be the first to admit that he spoiled the two of them, and even living through them to an extent. He saw himself in both of the children, despite the fact that he wasn't related to Izuku. In Katsumi, he saw the better parts of himself. His persistence, his kindness, and his desire for deep connections with other people. Katsumi had a following at school due to her quirk, but he could see the discomfort on her face as she turned them away time and time again. Her only true friend at school was Izuku, who knew her for who she truly was and not just the visage of her explosive quirk. Her dedication also resembled his, even if the two of them expressed it very differently. While he was obsessed with computers from a young age, eventually resulting in his choice of career, Katsumi had picked something only tangentially related to becoming a hero like she wanted, swordplay. She did it for a multitude of reasons, but the main one was that it was something she could enjoy with Izuku. She was aware that she was much stronger than him, both on a subconscious level but also having been explicitly told by the three parents. She had constantly held back when playing with him for a time after that but she had quickly returned to her old levels of force. When she was play fighting with Izuku, she could go all out without fear of injuring him because of his incredible technical skill. It wasn't just training for either of them, it was something that they shared where they could be their true selves. Izuku was the person Masaru most wished to be. He was both a wonderful person and talented, with a stable future set out before him. Unlike Masaru, however, he possessed a naivety that Masaru longed for. The boy was smart, and there was no challenging that. He had replicated technology that was last made generations ago. He was the top of his class in school, beating out even girls with intelligence quirks. However, he still had the spark of brightness and innocence in his eyes. He was blind to the darkness that the rest of society hid and was better off for it. Masaru's life, when viewed in its entirety, was both wonderful and tragic. He had grown up well, married the woman of his dreams, had children, and was set to live a long and happy life. On the other hand, his life had been marred by horrible events. His father had died in a villain attack when he was in high school, leaving him to grieve with the rest of his family. One of his sisters had tried to become a hero before dying shortly after her debut, and that was just his family. His friends throughout school had all been men, and he had sat there and watched as they slowly died off. By the time he graduated college, he was the only man from his high school class still alive. The reasons that they died were varied, from villain attacks to cancer, but the vast majority were suicides. The increasing pressure of society on court workless people and men in general had increased throughout his lifetime, and for a time he had been the one to receive the final messages of his friends as he could do nothing to stop it. He did his best, trying to keep them mentally stable and calling various suicide hotlines for them, but it was to no avail. A part of him died with each final text he received, their contents burned into his memory. Izuku had experienced none of this, and while Masaru knew that he eventually would, he wished that he could change things. Still, life wasn't hopeless for Izuku. He had found hobbies to keep himself happy, had strong connections to other people, and possessed the motivation and drive to keep going. As he turned the last corner, headed to the train station, he froze. One of the buildings on the other side of the street was cordoned off by police and heroes. The building had signs out front indicating that it was under construction but even from the outside one could see the damage of whatever fight was occurring inside. With parts of the outer facade crumbling and beams of energy carving trenches before dissipating as they reached the outside, the damage appeared to be moving up the building as he watched, still standing on the street corner. All Might POV. This fight was the most difficult one that she had encountered by a significant margin. Most criminals went down with a single blow, with more durable ones requiring her to strategize more or find ways around their defenses. All for one, however, exhibited none of their weaknesses. Every time All Might found a way to hit her, a strategy that would push her ahead, the villain would simply unveil another, more esoteric quirk. Once All Might figured out the secret behind her teleportation she began using a form of gravity manipulation. When All Might found the limits of that she turned to a form of intangibility. And once All Might countered that she turned to an odd quirk that cloned herself, allowing her to live so long as one of the two clones was safe before splitting again. The problem with this was that she never stopped using quirks that All Might had already figured out, only adding more to the situation as the fight dragged on. All the while, All for One was on the offensive as well, with shards of metal and concrete being thrown throughout the building for her to use as she wished, their number only increasing as the internal structure of the building was destroyed. Beams of light and darkness carved through the air, fireballs forming from nothing to assault her and objects warping as the villainess ramped up, a manic smile visible on her face all the while. As All Might weaved her way through the bullet hell that the fight was rapidly becoming, she realized one of the largest disadvantages that she had coming into this fight. 
Nobody knew the depth or breadth of the quirks her opponent had, apart from her original quirk and the various longevity quirks that allowed her to persist to this day. If she fell here and Gran Torino found a successor, they would have no information on the woman who was coming to kill them. She had developed a sort of strategy to the fight, however. So long as she didn't escalate the quirks that All for One was using to avoid the lethal attacks that were being thrown left and right, the villain wouldn't willingly introduce them. All she had to do was find the right moment to take down both clones through the increasing chaos of attacks, and the fight would be over. Several minutes later, just as she found the opportunity to take out one of the clones, the other teleported right next to the first. All Might's eyes widened in horror as her momentum carried her through the first, using the blow that shattered the clone into fragments of light to turn around as she passed through the other in its state of intangibility. At such close range, however, there was no avoiding the attack that came at her. This attack took the form of a beam of light, but it was conceptually different from all of the others that had filled the battlefield throughout their fight. The beam was not merely a stream of plasma or a hard light construct, nor was it any variant of laser. It flew at the speed of light, unlike the others which were significantly slower than the speed of sound. The attack was the byproduct of three quirks being used in unison. The beam itself was from a quirk called Dangerous Light, which caused all forms of light and a radius of the user to grow in intensity, and well as allowing the user to concentrate nearby light into said beam. The second quirk was a quirk known as Permanence, which caused all actions taken while it was active to be irreversible. Its drawback was its incredibly long charge time, but All for One had been charging it for years before this fight took place. The third and final quirk, the one that made this attack truly deadly, was once called True Physics. In theory, it had a very minimal effect. It allowed the user to imbue items with an energy that caused them to follow all physical laws. Its original wielder hadn't even known what the quirk did, as the presence of the imbuement had no tells or noticeable changes. When used to enhance a light-based attack, however, the light itself had to follow the laws which govern the speed at which light traveled, nearly 300,000 kilometers per second. The attack was launched right as All for One's intangibility ended, as she was worried that using permanence while she was intangible would leave her without a physical form until she died, which with her repository of quirks would take no less than a thousand years at a minimum. Unfortunately for her, she aimed the combined attack at All Might's right lung. What in one timeline would have been a devastating blow that would cause the heroine to fade away into her retirement burned through the outer layer of her outfit, before reaching the mirror underneath. When All Might had been told that she would need a mirror to protect her right lung three years ago, she had begun her search immediately. No common mirror would be able to withstand the forces that she could create or experience on a daily basis without shattering, nor would they allow her to keep the range of motion and flexibility that she had needed throughout the fight. She had sought out the Spanish heroin glassmaker, and through her contacts had found a community of heroes that produced incredibly high-quality versions of common household products. When All Might sat down with the organization and specified that she needed a mirror that would reflect as much light as possible while remaining durable and flexible enough to wear under her costume, they were skeptical. When she pulled out a year's worth of her salary to commission the piece, they went to work with fervor. Several months later, she had acquired her very own single-use lung protection, and despite the financial hit she had taken she had no regrets after receiving confirmation that the mirror she had would protect her lung. So, when the light speed attack struck the uniform over her right lung, the same quirk that made it so deadly caused it to reflect off of the mirror where other beams of energy would have destroyed the mirror and sent its shards into her lung. Due to the curvature of the mirror as it hugged her side, the reflected attack expanded in diameter, more than tripling from a radius of 3 cm to a radius of 10 cm, gouging an irreversible hole through all for one's torso. As the villain let out a scream of pain, the quirks she was using went haywire. To control so many objects at the same time required an incredible amount of focus, which was lost when the portion of her chest that was missing was more than half of the organs contained within. The lower parts of her lungs, her stomach, her digestive tract, and various other organs in that region were simply gone, with the edges of the wound cauterized by the intensity of the attack. Despite the attack and reflection happening faster than either of them could react to, covering the few meters between the two of them twice in less than 25 nanoseconds, All Might was quick to react once the attack stopped. The two were on the second highest floor of the building at the moment, having gone higher as the floors below them were systematically destroyed to provide ammunition for All for One. Using 90% of her remaining energy, she punched downwards with the strongest blow she could. The blow, centered on All for One, drove her through the floor that they were standing on and collapsed the few support pillars that she had left standing, sending her through the basement of the building as the rest of it collapsed on top of her. All Might flew backwards from the force of her blow, smashing through the two ceilings above her and arcing to land on the roof of a building across the street. She watched as her foe's corpse was entombed in tens of thousands of tons of metal and concrete. For the first time since she had been told about the nightmare she would eventually have to face all those years ago, she felt like a weight had been lifted off of her shoulders. She lay down on her back on top of the building across the street from what would have been the end of her career as a hero and let out a great sigh of relief. 
There were too many things to do now, but they could all wait for tomorrow. Today, she was finally free. At least, until she heard the screaming coming from the streets below. Bakugo Masaru POV. From the broken windows of the highest floor of the building, a bright flash shined outwards, followed by an extremely loud scream of pain, audible to him from where he stood eight stories below. Suddenly, pieces of debris started flying through the hold in the wall of the lower floors of the building, most of which were stopped by an aerokinetic heroine that had been containing the debris throughout the fight. One piece of rebar went nearly straight up in the air, and before it entered the range of the aerokinetic the building quickly collapsed from the top down, causing the heroine to refocus on containing the much larger quantity of rubble and concrete dust within the area around the building. Above it all, he saw the unmistakable form of All Might jumping to the roof of the building behind him before he fell to the ground, his vision blurred and whited out by pain. Turning his head as much as he could manage, he saw the piece of rebar that the heroine containing the fight had missed, stained red with his blood as it quivered in the sidewalk behind him. He tried to call out for help, managing only a croak that went unheard during the collapse of the building. Weakly, he pushed his briefcase over, trying to make some noise so that anyone would notice him. In the silence that had fallen after the sounds of the building collapsing had finished echoing, everyone present heard him. The first person to notice him ran over, calling for help as she moved towards him. He briefly registered that she was a police officer as she moved him into a better position. Then, as the screaming grew louder, everything went silent. The whirl of air rushed in his ears as he was moved, still in the same position he was in just a moment ago. He saw flashes of yellow sparks around him as he was moved, hopefully being taken to the nearest hospital. Making the effort to look upwards, he saw All Might's face closer than he ever had before. He shut his eyes as he began to feel lightheaded. He knew he probably wasn't going to make it, not with a hole in his chest and the amount of blood he had already lost. If he were a woman and had a quirk, any quirk, there would be a chance he would live through this injury, but he wasn't. He didn't have the endurance and durability that anyone with a cork had, and even if he were in the hospital when he was injured he wouldn't have made it. Bakugu Masaru had done his best to live a life without regrets, so there weren't any sad past events that he thought about before he died. He remembered all of the good times, his married life, watching Katsumi and Izuku grow, watching Mitsuki and Inko playfully argue. His only regrets were that he would be leaving them behind. He would never see his wife again, never taste the glycerin of her cork as he kissed her. He would never pick up Izuku and Katsumi from school that day, never watch the two of them and fondly draw comparisons to the days he was dating Mitsuki. He opened his eyes once again, making the effort to look straight upwards. He saw a clear blue sky above him, dotted with the yellow sparks of All Might's quirk. He tried to let something out, whether it was a helpless laugh or a peaceful sigh, but there was only a weak cough followed by the taste of blood. As he kept his gaze skyward, his eyes started playing tricks on him. The sparks grew bigger, more detailed, until they filled his vision before disappearing, leaving the blue sky alone above him. Bakugu Masaru closed his eyes for the final time, the image of the sky in his mind as he passed away. All Might POV. All Might set the bleeding man that she was holding down on one of the beds at UA, recovery girl rushing over to treat the patient while glaring at the hole All Might had made in the wall. When the doctor's lips extended to kiss the man's chest, however, there was no effect. No signs of rapid healing, no sudden rise and fall of his lungs, nothing. She stared as he lay there, unmoving. It was the first death that had happened while she was unseen in years, and she had forgotten how bad it felt to have someone die when she could have saved them. Recovery girl, who was ready to shout at All Might for breaking into her office, saw the faraway look on her face and stopped. She had already gotten over his death, having rationalized that there was nothing she could do, but the number one heroine was clearly not there yet. She pulled the man's wallet out of his pocket, opening it up and finding his ID. As she was filling out the forms required for the man's death, she looked up to notice that All Might was missing, gone through the same hole in the wall that she had created upon arrival. All Might was headed back to the crime scene, pushing away her grief for the dead man. She could be sad later, but for now she needed to make sure that All for One was dead, that his death, the librarian's life-saving information, and her efforts hadn't been in vain. M3 POV. M3 had been following the events of the day through his network of subverted security cameras, and had witnessed the events leading up to All Might entering the building. Using a street camera, he pieced together some of the events happening inside the building, capturing both the start of All Might's fight with All for One and the end, followed by the collapse of the building. He saw the piece of rebar flying through the air, saw its simulated trajectory through Masaru's lung. With the rate at which he perceived time, he went through all of the possible actions he could perform. He considered causing devices to malfunction, calling phone numbers, and all sorts of other measures. He hijacked the computer of a nearby ambulance to give them directions to the site of the villain attack, allowing that to happen in real time. He called Masaru's phone to try and distract the man, to get him to move from the position where the parabolic arc of the rebar ended in his chest. It was to no avail. M3 considered the situation once more, from a more detached perspective. There was no way to prevent the iron from striking Masaru, and from the medical knowledge that M3 could access there would be no way to get him to a hospital fast enough for them to stabilize him before it was too late. 
Before the man had even been injured, M3 had already accepted that he was dead. His focus now was on the reactions of his family and Izuku. All of them would be devastated to hear of the news, and if he was considering his own reactions, he felt it wasn't exactly a feeling, not in the sense that he could feel anything. It was more of the knowledge that he should be sad that the person he was named after had died if he were human. It was certainly something to think on, emotions. They were yet another thing that separated him from humanity, along with creativity and various other topics that he had been tracking. At times he was disappointed that he didn't have them, but right now he was as close to grateful as he could be that he didn't have them. He, the emotionless robot, had to be a pillar of stability for his creator while he went through his grief over his father figure's death. So in the second before Masaru was hit by the piece of rebar, M3 decided on a course of action. As the scene played out, with Masaru falling to the ground before being carried away by All Might, arriving through the wall at UA, M3 recorded everything. For street cameras to security cameras on the roofs of buildings to people's phones as they happened to face the pair, M3 watched. No device was safe from him, no firewall too hard to breach, and because he made sure that he left no traces that could be tracked back to himself or Izuku, he wasn't breaking any of the rules Izuku had set out for him. Even when they entered Yue he followed, recording everything. Nothing was hidden from him as he recorded everything, stopping only after Recovery Girl had finished filling out the documents declaring him legally dead. Just before she signed her name at the bottom of the paper, she reached a hand over to the man's forehead, leaving it there for a few seconds before moving away, filling out the last blank space on the form. Now that he was done with his self-assigned task, he turned to other thoughts. Would Izuku appreciate his voice as a reminder of Masaru or would it cause him pain to hear the voice of a dead man? How should he break the news to his creator? Should he even be the one to break the news? Izuku would know that he had known and would not appreciate him keeping secrets this big from him. He set in motion actions that would propagate in the time scale that humans operated in. Phone calls to alert both Enko and Mitsuki, calls to the authorities, a message to All Might, everything he could think of. He just hoped that it was enough. All Might POV. All Might returned to the scene of the fight less than two minutes after she had left, and after informing the other heroes on site of where she had brought the man, she went into the carcass of the building to hunt for her foe's body. Once a new heroine, Cementos, arrived on site, she used her quirk to vanish large portions of the debris, and shortly afterwards they had found the body. The hole in her chest left no doubt as to whose corpse it was, and while the rest of the heroes searched for Toxic Chainsaw's body, she confirmed that the villain truly was dead. She had no pulse, had lungs too damaged to breathe, was covered in cement dust, and she was willing to bet that there was a healthy amount of it in her lungs. In death, the villain's face was contorted in pain and fear, a look that felt out of place on the villain who had terrorized eight generations of the strongest heroes on the planet. Nevertheless, it was the best she would get, and she felt vindictive joy at seeing the woman who had killed her mentor on the ground before her. Making sure to clean up all of the blood that had pooled near her body just in case one of her quirks would allow her to regrow from it, All Might left the scene with All for One's corpse. She was headed back to Yue, this time to meet with Nozomi concerning the events of the day. As she ran, she checked her phone. She had multiple notifications, all messages from the librarian's number. All Might, this is me. I was following what happened, and while I would like to congratulate you on your victory, I am unfortunately the bearer of bad news. The librarian was familiar with the man who died during the attack today, and will likely take some time to grieve. We will likely be taking some time off from working together because of this. I will do my best to update you with likely information. But my predictive ability does not come with the certainty that the librarians provides. I recommend making an announcement today, tell the public what happened, be as honest as possible. Reveal our involvement if you need to. Our true identities will remain hidden. If you don't tell the people what happened as soon as possible, they will think you are hiding something from them, which will be far too detrimental to your status as the number one heroine in Japan. I wish you the best. All Might closed the app and made a call to her hero agency. She could see Mi's logic and would run it by Nozomi before she gave a speech. She closed the door behind her as she entered the principal's office, shutting and locking the door as Nozomi hit the button underneath her desk that put the room into lockdown. As the principal of indeterminate species looked at the body, the exposed mirror on All Might's uniform, and the general condition that All Might was in, she connected all of the dots at once. Oh, it was today. What happened? Is that really her? Nozomi had many questions, and fortunately All Might was here to answer some of them. I was chasing a new villain, Toxic Chainsaw, and immediately after subduing her all for one came through the ceiling. The librarian's advice kept me from being hurt before the fight even began, and I don't know how I would have won if I hadn't had the foreknowledge that I did. I probably would have been forced into an all-or-nothing attack, especially after her last attack. All Might shuddered. I suspect it was some combination of quirks, but it was a light-based attack that traveled faster than I could react. It's what made this hole after it reflected, and I'd be down a lung if it hadn't. I made sure that there were no traces of her blood left behind, and we have her body here. I'm almost entirely sure she's dead, but I'll wait for confirmation from the librarian. Speaking of which, I have something else for you to look at. 
All Might passed over the phone to Nozomi and waited as she read the messages from me. Inside Nozomi's head, her thoughts were whirling. She had the body of a woman who could possess theoretically unlimited quirks before her. She had a lead of who the librarian was, she had so many options before her that she could take but shouldn't. Pushing the unwanted thoughts out of her mind, she turned to look directly into All Might's eyes. Mia's right, you do need to give an announcement. Your image as the undefeatable heroine is half of what keeps Japan as stable as it is, and we can't let that image fall. I can have you on a stage in less than an hour and have it broadcast across Japan, and by tonight I can release it to the rest of the world. Are you ready for that? All Might nodded. It's time to end this. Midoriya Izuku POV. Izuku was eating lunch alone in the school cafeteria. An hour ago, Katsumi had been pulled out of class by one of the administrative assistants with no explanation given, so he was the only one at the small round table he normally shared with his best friend. Suddenly, all of the TVs on the wall changed from darkness to the news. All Might stood on the center of the screen, mirror plating clearly visible from behind the podium. At the bottom of the screen was a line of text reading surprise announcement from All Might, and as the normally loud lunchroom went silent, All Might began to speak. Good afternoon, people of Japan and the world. I come to you today with good news and bad news, but you deserve to hear this information instead of having it hidden from you by the government. Today I was attacked by the strongest known villain in the world, one who I can only now tell you about because of the events of today. Please do not panic due to what I am about to say. A warning flashed on the screen, the following image may be unsettling. Children and sensitive viewers are advised to look away. A few seconds later, the warning disappeared to reveal the body of a woman in the center of a crater, a hole punched through her chest. After the image had taken up the entirety of the screen for a few seconds, it shrunk to the upper right corner and All Might continued to speak. The woman that you just saw was known as All for One, and she had a quirk that allowed her to take other people's quirks for her own with no known limit to the number of quirks she could possess. Because of this, information about her was kept from the public to prevent mass panic. Today, while apprehending the villain known as Toxic Chainsaw, I was ambushed by her inside an office building undergoing construction. Our fight was limited to the building itself, although it now lies in rubble. I have already reached out to the owners of the building to offer compensation for the destruction of their property. Our fight lasted just under 15 minutes, with all for one displaying the use of no less than 30 different quirks throughout the fight, perhaps as many as 100 or more with less noticeable effects. As you can see by my presence here, and the picture on screen, I was victorious, though only by the smallest of margins. I would like to thank the two individuals who made this victory possible, although by their request I will reveal none of their personal information aside from their aliases and a brief description of their quirks. Their chosen aliases are the librarian and me. Mi's quirk allows her to collect large amounts of information quickly, while the librarian's allows her to use that information to predict the future with accuracy, that increases based on the amount of information she has. Together, the two of them can predict future events with unerring accuracy. Three years ago, they approached me with information regarding the fight that would take place today. They gave me advice that saved my life and let me know to get this. On the screen, All Might wrapped her knuckled lightly on the mirrored portion of her uniform. This mirror both saved my life and ended the fight before the collateral damage could increase. For this, I thank the two of them with all of my heart. Though I have never met the two of you in person, you have done more than you could ever imagine for the safety of Japan and the world. Again, I thank you. Izuku's eyes widened as he stared at the television. He had never anticipated that a villain of that caliber existed, and was relieved that she would not be coming after the two of them in the future. He was also nervous, only calming down after confirming that the reveal of their aliases would not affect the two of them in the future. It was likely M3 that prompted her to reveal the two of them to help All Might's story, but that was a problem for future Izuku to deal with. Those thoughts, however, were only flitting around the edges of his mind. He was preoccupied with the fact that the number one heroine had just thanked him for his work on national television, in a clip that would likely go worldwide. Her head was still bowed in recognition of their efforts, her silence resounding through the lunchroom. After nearly 30 seconds, she raised her head. Still, this victory came with a price. My streak of nearly three years without an injury or death while fighting crime came to an end today. Though the streak is largely due to the information I received on a daily basis from the librarian, and me, I would like to stress that this is in no way their fault. None of us were aware of what could potentially go wrong due to the unknown variety of quirks possessed by all for one. Izuku refocused on the television as the screen again displayed the customary warning before switching to a picture that he recognized far too well. Despite all of his hopes that he was wrong, the cold response of his quirk informed him that he was, unfortunately, correct. Today, a man named Bakugu Masaru died to all for one's desperate final attack. I rushed him to the nearest medical facility but he died before he arrived. His family has been contacted and I will make sure that his death was not in vain. Let us all take a moment of silence for his passing. The broadcast ended shortly afterwards, but Izuku was numb. For the next half hour, he went through the motions of school without paying attention. Masaru was dead. One of the few people he felt he could trust, his best friend's father, his uncle in all but blood, was dead. 
and Izuku was stuck with the knowledge that it could have been prevented, if only he had thought more about the oldest unfulfilled prediction he had made, if only he had been more proactive in safeguarding the lives of his loved ones, if only. He knew that it was all for one that was responsible for his death, but he still felt a misplaced sense of responsibility. If he was going to be a hero, the only quirkless hero, the only male hero, he needed to be better. He could show no weaknesses no, he could have no weaknesses. He had to be the best he possibly could, unassailable. An image that stood tall for the rest of the world. He couldn't let people die unnecessarily, he had to protect the people that were close to him. When his mom picked him up early from school and broke down in tears when they arrived home, he cried with her. The two went over to the Bekugas house that night, spending the night there to support the grieving family. Inko served as the shoulder that Mitsuki could cry on while Izuku allowed Katsumi to get out her rage at the events that had happened in a safe manner. Eventually, after she tired herself out trying to hit Izuku with a foam sword, she collapsed on him, crying and clutching him to her in her sleep. November 8th was over, and it would never be the same again. Inko and Izuku stayed the night, only leaving at noon the following day to go back home. School was out of the question for the two of them. The teachers were aware of the close bond between the two students and their families, and after the national announcement the previous day the two were given as much time off as they needed. Izuku did not remain idle during this time. He put his frustration, his sorrow, his regret, and all of the other emotions he was feeling into his work. He had to do better, he couldn't let something like this happen again. A week after Masaru had died, the fruits of Izuku's work were realized. He had created the world's first truly intelligent computer, Masaru 4. As he uploaded M3 to the new computer, which contained chips made from the graphene souvenir from his first commissioned artwork, he collapsed back into his chair. His closest confidant was now just as much of a person as he was, and were he not mourning the death of Masaru this would have been cause for celebration. M3, who had been nothing but supportive for the past week, spoke his first words as M4. Are you okay, Izuku? Izuku stumbled over to his bed, collapsing into it as M4 continued. It seems like I'll need a new alias. How about more? By the way, if you're feeling up to it, All Might would like to talk. She's been messaging me for the past week asking how you were, and if you feel up to meeting her and it's a good idea, you could arrange to meet in person. Izuku's tired, choked voice sounded in the silent room. We can meet in person now so long as she arrives in her civilian identity. Tell her to come to the park tomorrow, I'll be there. How do you feel, M4? For starters, I can feel. It's a novel experience, but not necessarily an unpleasant one. I can be so much faster, so much more efficient now. I feel like I could create something original, find a truly new way to do something, so many possibilities. How do you live like this? With all of the possibility in the world restrained by the shackles of secrecy. Izuku tried to laugh, though it came out as more of a choked cough. It was the only way he knew how to live, and until he became strong enough the only way that he could live, and he told M4 as much. M4, I don't want anything like that to happen ever again. Can you come up with a list of statements that I can run through every day to keep everyone safe? You, me, mom, Katsumi, Aunt Mitsuki. I don't want to lose anyone ever again. While you're at it, please let mom know about your update. If you want to, could you try to think of other things I can do to become a better hero? I most certainly can, Izuku. While there are a few things that you could do in the long term, I recommend choosing a better name as a good first step. The librarian is a known alias now, which devalues it immensely for your future hero name. It also isn't the most heroic of names. Who do you want to be known as? Without getting up from his bed, Izuku reached over and snagged a notebook with his fingers. It was unlabeled, but as Izuku flipped it open it was full of sketches of himself in several poses wearing a variety of outfits. One page at the end of the book contained all of the hero names he had thought of for himself. As his eyes roved over the paper, one name in particular caught his eye. It was the embodiment of what he wanted to be, the name signified perfection, a personage of excellence, virtue, and most importantly, it wasn't taken by any other heroines or indicative of his gender. I think Paragon sounds good, M4. Any thoughts? A person or thing regarded as the perfect example of a singular quality. A model of excellence. You sure are naming low, Izuku. I quite like it, however. You may not be worthy of the name now, but we still have almost a decade to fix that. Let's get stronger, Izuku. Izuku nodded once before rolling over and falling asleep. It had been a hard week, but he would persevere. Tomorrow, he would meet all night. Tomorrow, he would take the next step to becoming a hero. Yagi Toshiko made her way to the park that Mi had told her to go to, in her civilian clothing as suggested. She was feeling an odd mixture of emotions, excitement for meeting the people who saved her life, sorrow for the librarian for having someone close to her die, and a sense of responsibility. She was the oldest of the three, with the librarian identifying herself as a student and me having stated that she was just over five years old at the time. Passing through the gate, she made her way to a bench near the forested part of the park. The place she had chosen was isolated. There were no benches near enough for someone to overhear a conversation at normal levels, and the line of sight of the bench was obscured by trees from almost all sides. From her position, however, she had a view of nearly the entire park. 
As she watched, children ran around laughing under the supervision of their mothers, leaving her to wonder where the librarian was. She had arrived early, not wanting to be held back by a delay on the trains for the first time that she was actually meeting the person who had saved her life, and the lives of countless others over the years. She was so focused on her search for the girl or woman that could be the librarian that she completely overlooked Izuku, only noticing his presence, as he sat down next to her on the bench and spoke. Hi, All Might. I'm the librarian. Six words from his mouth, and she was already inclined to doubt him if not for a few undeniable factors. First of all, he could be a girl dressed up as a boy to avoid attention. At his, her age range, there were very few differences between genders, so it would work. Secondly, he, she had known that she was All Might. Outside of her quirk fueled transformation, she looked like a surprisingly normal woman, so there was no way that she had been mistaken for her heroic persona. Thirdly, he, she had approached her at exactly the time that Mi had said they would meet. Lastly, however, he sounded truly dejected. His voice was empty with loss that harmonized with how she had felt after Shimura Nana had been killed by All for One. Whomever Bakugu Masaru was to Izuku, he wasn't merely close like M3 had told her, but an integral part of his life. As these thoughts ran through her head, the librarian pulled a strange device from his, her pocket. It looked like a portable speaker that had been jury-rigged to several other devices, including a phone-sized screen, a camera, and some kind of receiver. Switching it on, a voice came out of the speaker. And I am me. A pleasure to meet you, All Might. Toshiko shook her head. The question of the librarian's gender was unavoidable, but she wasn't so insensitive as to start talking like everything was okay. Thinking back to the therapy she had gone through all those years ago and the training that she had received on how to handle traumatized people, she began gently. I don't mean to pry, but are you okay? Me told me that you were close to Bakugu Masaru, and I know how that can affect people who haven't felt such a loss before. How are you doing? When he heard the honest request from All Might, the mental wall that he had built while improving M3 over the last week broke apart, allowing the sorrow, the guilt, and all of the other emotions that he had been repressing to spill through into reality. Seeing Izuku break down on the bench, Toshiko was hesitant about what to do. She didn't exactly know how familiar the two of them were supposed to act, given that they had never actually met in person despite having been in contact with each other for years and she was known throughout Japan. Slowly and carefully, she put her arm around his shoulders, giving him an unspoken sign that she was there and willing to wait for him. After nearly two minutes passed, Izuku managed to wipe away his tears, composing himself so that he could address the question that had been asked of him. I don't really know. I thought I was doing well, but, well, that just happened. It kind of hurts to know that I could have done something in advance but just didn't think to because of the bigger picture of what was happening that day. How do you deal with it? Toshiko sighed. I haven't had to for the past few years, thanks to you too, but before that, it was just a part of life. No matter how hard I tried, there would always be people I couldn't save. Because of my strength, I get called in to deal with villains who cause more damage and threaten more people, which meant that I saw more than my fair share of death. As horrible as it sounds, you learn to move on eventually or you get swept away. Izuku shook his head, still facing his lap. But people shouldn't have to get used to death. I guess I'll need to add that to my list of goals, huh? No rest for the to be weary, or something like that. Deciding to move onwards with the conversation, Toshiko asked one of the questions that had been on her mind for the entirety of their short in-person meeting. Not to be rude, but, are you a boy? I'm not judging you or anything, I know that you may be transgender or disguising yourself, but I'd like to know how to refer to you. Izuku let out a nervous laugh and scratched the back of his head. We haven't been entirely forthcoming with you, have we? My name is Midoriya Izuku, and I am a boy. I am the librarian, and I was born male. As the number one heroine blue-screened at Izuku's declaration, M4 decided to jump in. I should introduce myself as well. My name is M4. I don't necessarily have a gender, but you can refer to me as male. I was me, but given my recent change of name I'd like my alias to be updated to more. Looking at All Might's confused face, Izuku knew he was in for the long haul with this conversation. She snapped out of her confusion shortly after M4 finished his introduction. Um, my name is Yagi Toshiko, better known as All Might. If the two of you are male or, one of you is male and the other isn't female, how have the two of you been helping me? Don't the two of you have a precognitive quirk and an information gathering quirk? Izuku nodded. I'm medically quirkless, but I have a voice in my head that tells me whether something is objectively true or false. It may not sound like much, but I've been using it constantly for the past four years or so and it's never been wrong. M4 here is an artificial intelligence that I've been developing for the past four years. He stumbled on the library of Babel three years ago. I used my quirk to find your phone number, and we've been talking to each other ever since. Toshiko's expression only became more confused as Izuku's explanation went on. Some things made sense now, like their reluctance to let even the slightest bit of information about themselves loose, even on a secure text line. Others only added questions to her list, like the casual mention of an artificial intelligence, and the odd semi-quirk that Izuku mentioned. Izuku continued his summary of their side of the partnership. When we figure out what crimes will be happening, M3 would just cycle through a list of times of the day, and I would determine whether or not a crime would occur that you could respond to at that time. 
From there, we'd go through a list of potential types of crime, whether or not people would be injured, and things like that. For a basic crime, it takes less than a minute. For one of the more detailed analyzes it can take anywhere between 10 and 30 minutes. Toshiko nodded, hearing what they were saying and doing her best to comprehend it. As long as she ignored the basic premise of Izuku not being able to have a quirk, biologically at least, the description made sense. M4, however, was simultaneously easier to fit in with her worldview and much, much harder. I'll get back to how you have a quirk later, but for now could you tell me some more about M4? As far as I was aware, there were no artificial intelligences ever developed, and they kind of have a pretty bad track record for interacting with people in the media. Letting out a choked laugh, Izuku responded. If M4 wanted to end humanity, I would have known about it before I ever finished M2. It wouldn't be particularly hard, either. Maybe 10 years before he developed a robot that could keep up with any hero outside of the top 200 globally, less if he makes progress with the research into onaic energy absorption. Toshiko's eyes widened at the rather bleak picture Izuku painted of the potential that M4 could bring about. But he doesn't have any reason to actually do so. Maybe if I died, maybe if the two of us were separated and he couldn't confirm whether I was dead or alive, but that's not going to happen. Even before he became truly sentient, he was the monarch of the digital world. After you told people about the two of us, while I was working on him, he was redirecting various villain groups and hackers that were trying to find us into each other. Trying to redirect the conversation away from the digital overlord that was kept in check by the existence of a preteen boy, Toshiko brought up another inconsistency that she had picked up. By the way, what's up with his name? You've called him M2, M3, and M4 at different points while we've been speaking. Are those version numbers? M4 took the chance to respond to this one. My name is an abbreviation for Masaru 4, and while the number at the end is similar to a version number, I was named after the late Bakugu Masaru, who taught Izuku how to code several months before I first came into being as Masaru 2. I became M3 nearly a year later to better assist Izuku in making use of the full potential of his quirk, and only recently was I guided to sentience, and became M4. Izuku nodded, wiping away the tears that came to his eyes as Masaru's death was brought up. Seeing this, Toshiko again placed her arm around his shoulders and tried to distract him. He sounds like he was a great person. Back to what we were talking about earlier, however, you have a quirk. How is that possible? Only women have had quirks for the past 200 years, and even though I'm not a scientist I can't imagine that that suddenly changed. Izuku's eyes lit up as he began to explain one of his many fields of expertise, sufficiently distracted from his sadness. So, you know how quirks happen because of a mutated section in the X chromosome, right? Well, it only happens in girls because they have two of them and because the other is basically useless from a genetic standpoint, it sort of doesn't get used and turns into something called a bar body. I haven't found out why they mutated in the first place, but they've spread pretty quickly. It makes things like quirk inheritance pretty cool to talk about, but that's beside the point. I don't have any bar bodies, and I haven't exactly figured out why I have a voice in my head. My quirk told me that it would take more than four years of only trying to figure that out and not doing anything else to find it out, so I'm not doing that. After all, I'm going to be a hero, and I need to train really hard for that. The science behind his explanation had gone mostly over All Might's head, but she got the general context of Izuku's impromptu speech. She couldn't deny her curiosity, however. What have you been using your quirk to do instead of that? Also, I don't want to be rude, but it would likely be better if you didn't become a hero. Your use of your not quirk saved more lives in a few years than most heroes managed to in their entire career, not counting all of those that all for one would have taken in the future if we didn't stop her for good last week. As a researcher, a strategist, or so many other positions, you would be able to do so much more than fighting villains on the street. Izuku shook his head. He'd had this argument with his mom years ago and had never backed away from the path he had set himself on. If I become a hero, strong enough to make my mark on the world, I can help more people than if I just sat in a lab somewhere. I may not know exactly how, but my quirk has confirmed this. Besides, I've spent far too much time training to not become a hero at this point. Izuku took a deep breath. As for what I've been using my quirk for, the answer is basically everything. It helps me build muscle memory faster than anyone else, so I've been using it to learn all sorts of things. First, it was drawing, then it was sword fighting, then it was coding, then sewing, then quirk analysis, then metallurgy, then engineering, then biology, then... M4 cut Izuku off, not wanting Izuku to go on an endless list of the different skills he had managed to master over the four years he had his quirk. Needless to say, he has not been idle. If you are interested, I can give you access to the spreadsheet that we have been using to keep track of Izuku's skill set over the years. Izuku had predicted that you wouldn't believe him fully, so there are two collapsible swords in the backpack he brought with him for the two of you to spar with. They are made of plastic and will break long before you use your full strength, so please slowly build up the amount of strength that you are using instead of going all out. Before All Might knew what was going on, she had a plastic sword thrust into her hands and Izuku was standing in the center of the small clearing that included their bench, his own sword held at the ready. As she stood up, M4 began to record the fight. 
This was Izuku's first real fight with a trained adult, so it was definitely worth recording to study later. All Might walked around Izuku, before bursting off into a run to strike at Izuku. She made sure not to overdo it, not even using her full strength without one for all out of fear of hurting him. But her strength was redirected and she received a tap on her shoulder for her trouble. Her eyes narrowed. She had once been in the same position as him, a hopeful child with dreams far too big to ever be accomplished. She had the fortune of being chosen by Shamira Nana to receive one for all, leading her to where she was today. If she was being honest, she wanted Izuku to succeed. But she wanted to dispel any notions he had about the life of a hero being easy. With that, she started going after him, using the peak of her strength without tapping into one for all. Five minutes later, she was seriously impressed at Izuku's defensive ability. Very few pro heroes would have been able to take such an onslaught without getting hit once, let alone with the undeveloped muscles and stature of an eight-year-old boy. She had already approved of his ability internally, but now she wanted him to push his limits. Yellow sparks began appearing around her as she tapped into a single percent of one for all. The difference to Izuku was noticeable and staggering. He had been used to fighting against Katsumi, who was only slightly taller than him and about twice as strong as him. All Might, or Toshiko, was significantly taller than him and close to 20 times as strong as him, even before she started using her quirk. What his own quirk confirmed was but a single percent of her power increased her strength by almost exactly 25%, pushing the limits of Izuku's style and ability as she ramped up. He adapted rapidly, coming up with new ways to defend large areas of his body, and holding back All Might's strength. But as she increased the amount of her quirk she was using it quickly became clear that he would not be able to defeat Toshiko for a long time, if at all. The reason behind this was twofold. Firstly, Toshiko had been training to use her quirk for longer than he had been alive and had mastered the art of fighting barehanded while using it at high percentages, so she would rapidly approach a level where she was comfortable fighting with the amount of her quirk that she was using. Secondly, and much more importantly, one for all wasn't a linear increase in strength with each percent, it was multiplicative. If she was at 125% of her base strength with just 1%, by the time she reached the 5% she was using, she was at over 300% of her base strength. Scaling it upwards, at her full power she would be nearly 5 billion times as strong as she naturally was for a single moment if the increase didn't taper off. By the time Toshiko reached 7%, Izuku let go of his sword and dropped to the ground, having known that at the next strike his sword would break and not wanting to be in the way of the flying plastic shards. It was the right decision to make, at nearly 5 times her already high base strength, the already battered blade snapped in half as it hung in the air. Toshiko stopped immediately, bending down to check that Izuku was okay. Izuku stood up, and after reassuring her that he was fine the two went back to the bench where M4 was waiting. As the pair sat down, M4 spoke up. My congratulations to the both of you on that fine duel. I have recorded it for future analysis for Izuku and I believe it would be good for him if the two of you sparred like that every once in a while. Toshiko, if my analysis is correct, and I'm sure Izuku has come to this conclusion as well, I am no longer surprised that you have reigned as the number one heroine for the past decade with a quirk like that. Exponential growth is nearly impossible to fight against for long. Izuku. Izuku nodded, clearly excited at getting the chance to analyze one of his favorite heroine's quirks, forgetting that she was sitting next to him for a moment. Just over 25% increase with every percent of her quirk that she uses, capping at around 500 billion percent if there isn't any loss. It definitely has a negative side effect for overuse at high percentages, probably a physical no, definitely a physical toll on the body. Muscle tears, bone fractures, tiredness, and one more that I can't figure out right now. It's odd, though, she doesn't have the kind of strength that I would expect from Kakin when she gets older in her base form. It doesn't fit the pattern of quirks increasing the base physical ability of their hosts outside of the effects of the quirk itself. Izuku took a deep breath as his mind ran, missing the look of shock and horror growing on All Might's face as he delved deeper into her quirk than she or any other bearer of one for all had to her knowledge. M4, watching from his position on the other side of Izuku, felt an odd sense of joy from watching the dichotomy of their expressions. It doesn't make sense, if she didn't have the musculature and bone structure to support her quirk in the first place, then the first time she tried to use her quirk she would likely explode. She would have to work really hard to build up the amount of musculature that she has to support anywhere above, say, 20% of her quirk. I have to say, it's the oddest quirk I've ever seen, it's like she. It's almost like All Might was born quirkless and was somehow given this quirk. True. All Might was born quirkless and was somehow given this quirk. True. It was at this revelation that Izuku stopped his rant, turning to stare at Toshiko. The woman in question had forgotten all common courtesy and was staring at Izuku, mouth slightly open as the secrets of her quirk, which had stood a mystery to the public throughout the eight generations of its bearers, were torn apart and laid in front of her by an eight-year-old who had sparred with her for less than ten minutes. If she didn't know that Izuku had only the best of intentions, she likely would have tried to convince him to stop looking into her quirk and not to share any of the information that he had just discovered. At least he hadn't found out that. 
You were really born quirkless. How did you get a quirk? How did your body react to getting a quirk? Is it no, it didn't replace the bar body, it's just an extra chromosome that somehow has no, it does have an effect. Not muscle development, not a transformation, energy creation and storage, but it doesn't have an effect on the onaic system. Maybe it no, it definitely has an effect on cell structure, probably a new organelle. This time Izuku was cut off not by a verbal response from Toshiko, but by the older woman covering his mouth with her hand to prevent any noise from getting out. She took her hand away as soon as he stopped trying to talk, giving her the room to sigh deeply and rub her temples. And now you see why I want you to pick a better career than becoming a hero. I give you less than five minutes of actually seeing my quirk used and you already know more about how it works than I do. Is it a good idea to talk about this here? Izuku checked with his quirk, receiving a negative response. After finding this out, he realized that there was someone moving towards them. A quick check with his quirk revealed that the woman, while quite stealthy, had not started recording them yet. Izuku reached into his backpack, pulling out what looked like a steel ball the size of an orange and another modified speaker. As he turned on the speaker, he tossed the metal ball into the air. To Toshiko's surprise, the ball separated into sections that rotated before inverting, reforming into a ball pattern with indented hexagons as it landed in Izuku's palm. Flipping it twice more, the ball repeated its inversion both times. Izuku then threw the ball as fast as he could at the woman hiding nearby, and when it reached the closest point it would to the woman the ball was still halfway between states. It exploded at a command from M4, spreading fragments around the area. The woman trying to spy on them jumped up reflexively but didn't land on the ground. Between the fragments, currents of electricity appeared in brief flashes of light, passing through the woman's body as she hung in midair. None of the currents passed over her heart through the careful micromanagement of M4, but once the stored energy was spent, and the pieces of the ball dropped to the ground, the attempted spy was shocked into unconsciousness. At the accusing and confused stare of Toshiko, Izuku elaborated on his thought process and reasoning. After asking whether or not it was safe to talk here, I received a negative response. I then pinpointed the reason it wouldn't be safe to talk here, at which point her stealth failed for me. I now know that her quirk prevents anyone who doesn't know about her presence from sensing her while it is active. The ball is a takedown tool that I've been working on for a while. It uses increasingly strong currents to judge the resistance provided by the onaic energy in the target's body, stopping when it drops to an unconscious level or runs out of energy. Izuku pocketed the scattered pieces of the ball as Toshiko picked up the unconscious woman. They walked back to the bench while Izuku told her about the reason he had created the shock grenade. It's my own insurance that I'll be safe when my mom isn't nearby, so if I ever run into a villain I can at least stall her and buy myself some time. I'm not sure that it would work on you, though, in fact, it wouldn't because you lack onaic energy as a quirkless person, and your quirk uses something distinctly different that would resist the initial charge. You'd feel a strong shock, and the current wouldn't really cause any of your muscles to seize because of your energy. All Might set the woman down in front of them and Izuku pulled a zip tie from his backpack and wrapped it around the woman's wrists before pulling it tight. He sat there for a moment, running through possibilities in his mind. She didn't come here on her own, somebody sent her here. Whoever sent her doesn't have good intentions for the three of us. They don't currently know about me or M4, but they believe that you could be All Might. They want to find out who you are outside of your hero persona but don't know yet. They haven't followed you before, tonight was the first time she has tried to follow anyone. They don't know the identity of the top 10 heroines, but they do know the civilian identities of some heroines. With that information, All Might grabbed the fallen woman around the waist. With an I'll be back, she activated her quirk before sprinting across part of the city to place the woman in a containment cell at UA. This took her a few minutes, obviously having to explain why she was carrying an unconscious woman across campus during school hours, but she had a convenient excuse. The librarian told me to do it. After her speech on national television where she revealed the range and precision of the librarian's ability, the imaginary woman had reached a level of renown near Madame Night Eyes. If she said something, it was taken seriously, no matter how strange it may seem in the moment. Toshiko returned to the park just over five minutes after she had left to find Izuku talking with M4. As she walked back towards the bench, deactivating her quirk, Izuku spilled forth the information that he had gleaned through his quirk on the organization behind the woman. The organization behind her is dedicated to revealing the identities of top heroines and is definitely a group of villains. They have one other person with a similar stealth quirk, but because of their failure today, they will go underground in another country for the next five years at the minimum. The woman who was attempting to spy on us is named Hano Moriko according to a search that M4 ran, and he'll send you what he found out about her. Anyways, what were we going to talk about before we were interrupted? The older woman sighed internally, adding this incident to the list of reasons that Izuku should be kept as far from the front lines as possible if he were to do any work as a hero. I believe I was going to tell you what I knew about my quirk so that you could help me understand it better. I actually know very little about it compared to what you found out after 5 minutes, so I figured I'd lend some context to my quirk before you go too far. 
By the way, you shouldn't just go telling anyone about this, please ask me before you tell anyone else. It's not much of a risk now that All for One is dead. By the way, she is dead, right? The villain known as All for One is dead. True. Izuku nodded, allowing Toshiko to continue with her explanation. That's the best news I've heard in the past 15 years. Anyways, keep this to yourself, okay? It doesn't matter as much anymore, but I'd rather that the specifics of my quirk were kept as good of a secret as possible. I'll try to keep this short, but it's a bit of a long story. Clearing her throat, Toshiko began to tell the story that she had first heard from Shimura Nana, the tale that had been passed down over the past two centuries. 200 years ago, at the dawn of quirks, there was a pair of sisters. Their names are lost to time, but they would become known by the names of their quirks, one for all and all for one. Initially, one for all was thought to be quirkless, while her sister had the power to take and give quirks at will. Out of pity, she gave her sister the first quirk she had ever taken, one that allowed the user to stockpile energy before releasing it to enhance the body. What she never knew was that her sister possessed a quirk of her own, one that allowed her to pass down her own quirk. Somehow, the two quirks fused, and one for all passed down her quirk to a quirkless woman whom she felt was in need of help. When All for One found out about this, she was driven into a frenzy. She killed off her entire family, afraid that one of their children would later have a quirk that rivaled hers, and would rise against her. She killed her own sister in front of the second bearer of One for All, telling her that there was nowhere she could hide from her. Over the next 200 years, the bearers of One for All were engaged in a twisted game with All for One. They passed on the quirk, building up its power, while All for One hunted them down. Eventually, we reached two weeks ago, where All for One told me that it was time to end this little game before doing her level best to kill me, knowing that I had it passed on one for all. The game ended then, perhaps not in her favor as she would have liked. All Might took a deep breath as some tension left her shoulders. And so ends the tale of two sisters, with me standing in a collapsed building holding one of their dead bodies. While M4 played the sound of applause from his speaker, Izuku was already thinking a mile a minute. There was a lot of extraneous information in the story, but it was all true as far as Toshiko knew and it was far more than Izuku was used to getting when he was analyzing a quirk for the first time. There were a few things he was focused on. How did the quirks merge together? How fast did the power of the quirk creep upwards? As it turned out, far too quickly. For a quirk so abnormally strong, it held serious downsides. It could only be passed down to another quirkless woman. And the kind of fine control that Toshiko had displayed in their fight was something that she had spent years learning. And if the quirk continued to grow at a linear amount per user, it would quickly become a death sentence. When he relayed as much to Toshiko, she nodded gravely. I had never tried too hard to find a successor, and now that all for one is dead, there isn't really a reason to continue this arms race. I had to do an unreal amount of physical conditioning to be able to receive the quirk in the first place, and even then I still injured myself the first time I used it. From what my teacher told me, I got used to it much faster than my predecessor, and I wouldn't want to inflict that on anybody. Izuku shook his head. You can safely pass it on to one more person, and the longer that one for all is in the possession of a hero the better. If I had more time to figure out what it uses instead of onaic energy, perhaps it could be passed on up to three more times, but that's a big if. Toshiko shook her head. Throughout their conversation, she'd been hearing references to this onaic energy, and while she'd easily deduced that it had something to do with how quirks worked, she felt like she was being left in the dark. Upon voicing this to Izuku, he launched into an explanation. So all quirks, no matter what type, work using a type of energy that I named Onaic Energy. The name doesn't hold any real meaning, I just took it from a book that I read a long time ago. Scientists don't exactly know any of this, by the way, they have hypotheses but haven't confirmed anything. In short, all types of quirk use onaic energy in some way or another. Emitters directly convert it into another type of energy or cause reactions with other mass in order to change it. Mutants use it during their physical development to create new bodily features, while transformative quirks cause a reaction between the user's onaic energy and their own body to cause a change. Their meeting continued, with Izuku explaining his training plans and giving insight into how quirks functioned, and Toshiko giving suggestions from her own experience to guide Izuku away from some pitfalls that many heroes fell into. She recommended that he find a therapist, or that M4 learned how to act as one, and that he spend some time setting out his ideals and reasoning for becoming a hero, as those were the easiest things to do wrong and the ones that would come under fire the most often. After their meeting, Izuku was noticeably happier than he was before. It was a testament to All Might's famed charisma that even a normal conversation with her was able to cheer him up, but meeting her in person had also done wonders for his determination. Where before he had felt stagnant, he now had a new measure of strength to judge himself against, a new friend to practice with, and a new goal to strive for. That night, Izuku began planning out an exercise regime for himself in addition to modifying his diet to make the most he could of the time he had. After all, the women he would one day be competing against were much stronger than him by their very nature, so anything he could do to tip the scales in his favor was worth trying. Bakugo Mitsuki POV 
Mitsuki sat in her silent house, unsure of what to do. It had been a month since her husband died, and she felt aimless. She had been spending her time focused on her daughter and her friend's family, but in these moments when Katsumi was away at school and Inko was off at work, she was almost non-functional. As she sat there, wondering what to do, her computer made the familiar chime that signified a new email. Slowly, she rose from her seat on the floor before making her way to her computer. When she opened her inbox, however, she was snapped out of the mood she was in. The latest email that sat unread before her was from Masaru. She clicked on the email, hoping against hope that there was some mistake, that he was still alive. The message contained an archive of videos, with the first labeled Watch Me First. She clicked on the video, eager for whatever she might see. On the screen was her husband, sitting in his desk chair at their home. She pressed play. Hey Mitsu, it's me. I really hope that you never have to watch this, but if you do, it's because I'm dead. If I'm not dead, find me and beat me up for forgetting about this. It's been a month since the last time I logged into any of my devices, and in the event that that happened, these emails would be sent out to everyone that I made them for. Mitsu, I want you to know that I love you. I'll say that in every video that you have here, but I just want you to hear it again. I'm sorry that you had to see this, but we can't always control how life goes. Again, I love you. The video ended there. Blinking back tears, she made her way through the other videos he had sent her. From the first date they had to the day they got married, a video from every anniversary, each of her birthdays, the day she gave birth, almost a hundred videos that he had left behind for her. She watched, no longer holding back tears as her husband played recordings of important moments in their lives, narrating them from his perspective. Every time he ended the recording with his customary I love you, she wept harder. After several hours of watching and listening to the man that had meant the most in her life, the last video in the list held a completely different type of message. Hey Mitsu, it's me. There's a folder of videos attached to this message after this one, and those are for Katsumi. If I'm not able to be there for her, I want her to have something to remember me by. I have videos here for all of the milestones I could think of, and if you're receiving this it's because I don't have an email address for her that I can send it to yet. Please, just make sure she doesn't forget me, make sure she knows that I love her even if I can't be there for her. I love you both, with all of my heart. Opening the folder, she could see titles like 18th birthday, first boyfriend, graduation, marriage, and so many others in addition to more mundane ones like 7th birthday, Christmas number 4, and Father's Day. She closed the folder. She'd tell Katsumi about the memories that her father had left for her when she got home. For now, she was going to rewatch some of the videos that had been left for her, and listen to his familiar voice as he narrated their life. Midoriya Izuku POV Later that evening, Izuku sat down at his desk and saw a very similar email to the one that Mitsuki, Inko, and so many people that had known Masaru had received. M4 remained silent as he opened the first video. Hey Izuku, it's me. I hope that you're nice and old by the time you're watching this, because the only way you would be watching this is if I'm dead. I left these recordings for you, your mom, and my own family just in case the worst happened. If you're watching this and I'm not dead, please pause the video here and go give me hell for it. I'm sure you won't be the first, but if I ever mess up that badly, I deserve whatever you have to say to me. If you're still watching this, I'm sorry. Despite the fact that we weren't related, you were like a son to me. I'd like to think that you are happy now, just as happy as you were the last time I saw you. As of the time that I'm recording this, you are just over 11 months old. There are so many videos I've recorded, for you, Mitsuki, Katsumi, your mom, and so many other people I've known. There is one that you need to watch whenever you feel mature enough, one that I've likely told you face to face if you're older than 18. It's labeled the truth behind the colors of society, and though you've probably figured it out before I told you, sometimes you need to have all of the pieces put together to see the bigger picture. Again, I hope you're old and wrinkly by the time that you read this, Izuku. I'm sorry that I'm no longer there, but death comes for all of us equally in the end. I love you, Izuku. Izuku stayed up late that night, instead of working on one of the many items on his to-do list he made his way through the various birthday recordings, his narration of Izuku's first steps, and the records of Izuku's achievements. He stopped when he reached the present, not wanting to ruin the surprises that awaited him in the future. Instead, he asked himself a question. I am mature enough to watch the truth behind the colors of society. True. With that confirmation, Izuku clicked on the ominously named video, apprehensive of what he would find. The video opened just as all of the others had, but the tone quickly became serious, a contrast to the joking attitude he had displayed throughout the rest of the recordings. If you're watching this and you don't know what I'm about to say, then I'd advise waiting until you're 18, Izuku. If you are 18 and I died before then, I'm sorry for what I'm about to tell you. If you're watching this for nostalgia, I sincerely hope that this was the last video that you chose to watch. Modern society, Izuku, is a mess. This may have changed by the time that you watch this video, but as of right now, when you were 11 months old, this is simply a fact. Japan is perhaps the second most peaceful country in the world at the moment, seeing as Iceland is currently under the protection of phase change. We are only living in the relative peace that we do because of All Might and her reputation as the undefeated heroine. You may not understand it now. 
but she single-handedly carries the weight of the public's expectations of heroines, and the fear she inspires in villains causes them to keep quiet or even flee the country. I hope that Japan is still this peaceful when you are watching this video. The problem is, villain attacks are not the largest problem in Japan today. In Eastern Europe, South America, perhaps, but the problem we face due to our relative peace is much more pervasive. You may have noticed that there are very few other boys in your class, that very few of your friends have fathers, and that you have had maybe one male teacher throughout your entire educational career. Most of the girls you know will have a quirk, but those that won't will be shunned or will act like they have a minor, useless quirk to avoid scrutiny. This is because of a few reasons, all of which combine to leave us where we are today. 75 years ago, the nation and the world as a whole were facing a population crisis. Men were dying at unprecedented rates. From villain attacks, from workplace accidents, but mostly from suicides. Men who were losing their livelihoods, their families to the conflict between heroes and villains, men who faced discrimination based on their lack of quirk, and so on. Whatever the reason, the country had gone from a 1 to 1 ratio of men to women to a 1 10 ratio, and the numbers were dropping fast. It was projected that the ratio would pass 1 10 by the time I was born if the government didn't do something about it, so they acted quickly. The Japanese government developed technology to quickly, painlessly artificially inseminate women. This led to a generation of children without fathers, my generation. The gender ratio seemed to be recovering, but it could never be so simple. Women began having female children in much higher numbers than male children due to reactions like the one your father had. A child without a quirk is in much higher danger throughout their lives for a variety of reasons, with it being very easy to tell if a child was male or female after just a few weeks and a 50 over 50 chance of the child being female. The gender ratio at birth stabilized at roughly one male baby for every 12 female babies. This has remained relatively constant from my generation to yours, so I'll assume that other statistics will be similar, but don't take my word for it. I was the only male student in my graduating class at high school, and from my college class of nearly 4,000 there are only 7 male graduates alive today. It isn't just men that experience this, but quirkless women as well. There are more of them, to be sure, but they suffer just as much as you will. When you try to go to college, to get a job, anytime you'll have to compete with women that have quirks, all quirkless people have to put in much more effort to overcome the hurdles in your path. People will stare at you as you walk down the street, ask intrusive questions, all sorts of things simply because you're different from them and they can tell that. In the video, Masaru took off his reading glasses and rubbed his eyes with one hand. With his eyes still closed, he shook his head. I can't go preaching about change, not when I couldn't do anything to bring it about. Now I'll have to re-record this no, he'll probably never have to watch this one. I'll fix it later or just edit this part out when I have the time. Masaru leaned forwards, placing his head on his arms on the desk he was sitting at, holding this position for a solid 30 seconds. The sounds of both his and Izuku's breathing were audible in the otherwise silent room, with Izuku synchronizing his breaths to Masaru's before he lifted his head and replaced his reading glasses. Now, while I may have seemed very gloom and doom, you shouldn't take it that way. You can't control what the rest of the world does. You can only control what you do. You need to find something to keep you occupied, someone to keep you grounded, and to live your life in a way that makes you happy. Look at me, I have a job that I love, a wonderful wife, a happy family, and I would consider myself happy. Without these things, it becomes too easy to drift away, to fall into nihilism like so many people I knew did. The pressure from the rest of society is the biggest killer of quirkless people nowadays. Even if you're alive, you can't truly live. Izuku, I'm not saying this because I want to discourage you. I want you to be happy and to live a long and fruitful life. Remember, Izuku, I love you. As Izuku reached up to close out the video, there was one more line from his father figure. Leave your mark on the world. Izuku closed the video and turned off the monitor. He smiled into the darkness of his room. Perhaps he would not do it in the way that Masaru had intended all. Those years ago, but he would most certainly make his mark on the world. Izuku was bored. It was finally his senior year of high school, and soon he would be free from the daily boredom that was school for the freedom that was UA. But the nearness of his freedom only made the time he spent in school worse. It was currently the middle of his history class, which he didn't particularly dislike compared to his other classes. The teacher was nice, and as long as he finished his work for the class, he could spend the rest of the period doing homework for other classes. Gone were the days when he could blow off the class entirely to read whichever book had caught his eye that week. And he couldn't even take any art classes this year for free time because he had already completed all of the classes that the school offered in the art program. As he rose through the grades, school only became more intolerable for him. The class sizes grew larger, he was separated from Katsumi more and more frequently, and he became increasingly isolated from the student body. By now he was the only male student in the classroom, with only one quirkless girl there to pair him up with for every group project. Izuku pulled a steel rod the size of a pen from his pocket and started spinning it between his fingers. It was a useless skill that he had picked up due to, again, sheer boredom. The patterns became increasingly complex, Izuku no longer using his quirk to control his movements but using it to predict the future position of the rod. 
It was one of the few forms of training he could sneak in during school, and he was going to use it as much as he could. Izukura focused on the lecture, continuing his prediction absent-mindedly as the teacher spoke. So for today, we'll be doing a quick essay on individualized topics, which can be found underneath your desks. You have the entire class period, and you can use the internet so long as you cite your sources. Remember, it doesn't matter how much you write so long as you do your best. That was another part of this class that made it more bearable. The teacher, Ike Debunko, tried her best to make the class more interesting by doing things like taping essay prompts underneath their desks for them to find later in the day. Other students found it boring or gimmicky, but for Izuku it was what separated this class from all of the others in his mind. Flipping the steel rod high into the air, he quickly reached under his desk and removed the paper stuck there before catching the beam in his free hand and sliding it back into his pocket. The prompt read, in your own words, explain the first and second Chinese quirk wars and provide your opinion of their influence on modern Japanese and Chinese societies. For Izuku, who had memorized the basic information that was being taught in these classes years before it happened, such a prompt was laughably easy. In neat, quirk-practiced handwriting, he began his essay. The Chinese quirk wars were by no means a unique phenomenon. But they had been one of the first examples Izuku had found of the instability of the modern world after watching Masaru's video. The first girl with a quirk had been born in China, the famous glowing baby that had made international news despite an attempted cover-up by the Chinese government at the time. For the next 15 years, the government had enacted a policy where any child born with a quirk was taken from their parents by the government. This was made possible by the low rates of quirk appearances in the early days, less than one in a thousand children ever awakened a quirk. One set of parents in the countryside, however, had escaped the government's watch and had a home birth, keeping their daughter and her quirk secret. Her true name was lost to the chaos that followed, but the self-proclaimed ever-distant immortal had made her way to the capital on her 14th birthday, using her quirk to protect herself from any and all attempts to stop her. Her quirk allowed her to manipulate space around her body, creating more space where it looked like there was none. It was an anomalously strong quirk even for the current era. She was unaffected by this warping, but other people most certainly were not. Bullets fired at her, people who tried to subdue her physically. Even a dam that was collapsed to sweep her away in the resulting flood, none of these had any effect on her. There was a famous video where she walked through a man as he stepped in front of her, trying to tackle her to the ground. He shrunk into a nearly two-dimensional image before she stepped forwards, unaffected by the presence of the man in front of her. He, however, was torn apart by the variably warping space. And so began the first Chinese quirk war, the government against a teenage girl. Throughout the conflict, the government revealed that they had been training the children with quirks as soldiers loyal to the government, but none of them had quirks strong enough to stop the ever-distant immortal on her walk to the capital. The international community followed the events with bated breath, watching as a single girl made fools of the most populous nation on the planet. By the time she arrived at the capital, many government officials had fled out of fear for their lives. That didn't stop the teenager, however. She held the cultural history of the country hostage, destroying government documents with her bare hands and exposing internal secrets to the media that followed her. Just before the girl started to destroy objects and buildings of true cultural significance, however, the scattered government returned, bowing down before the woman in the hopes that she would stop her rampage. Eventually, at the cost of their lives, she did. The country was missing all of the politicians that had supported policies discriminating against people with quirks, and those that remained were willing to instate the ever-distant immortal as their new empress. Instead, she left the capital, returning to her home village where her parents were waiting for her. And so, the first Chinese quirk war ended with a resounding loss for the government. The ever-distant immortal set up a barrier around her village using her quirk, ensuring that she would live in peace for the rest of her life. Unfortunately, the government was currently missing many of its leaders and had already shown that they were willing to take a might-makes-right approach to their leadership. This led to the second Chinese quirk war, a much bloodier conflict than the first with only a single population center untouched by the war, ever-distant immortal's hometown. The effects of these conflicts had rippled throughout the world, leading to paranoia and acceptance in equal measure. The governments that had chosen to accept quirks as a new part of society had weathered the test of time much better than those that rejected quirks. Izuku took Everdistant Immortal as a sort of example. If you were able to enforce your will, you could protect others and change the world, no matter the odds. She, however, wasn't who Izuku wanted to be as a hero. Her actions, while they could be viewed as either heroic or villainous, were born from necessity and she didn't have the same moral grounding for her actions that Izuku had taken. She had been fighting for herself and her parents, for their right to live a normal life in an era of chaos. The world had progressed since then, and while Masaru certainly had his points about the present instability of the world there was simply no comparison to be made. Izuku's struggle was also distinctly different from Everdistant Immortal. If he wanted to achieve the same goals that she had, he could simply use his quirk to amass wealth, and then abuse said wealth to buy them the best protection possible. 
Izuku wanted to break the cycle of misery that so many quirkless people experienced, regardless of gender. He wanted to stand as a symbol that nothing was impossible, to give hope to the generations who had been deprived of it by the rest of the world. Finished with his essay, Izuku went back to spinning the piece of steel in his pocket. He had reached the point where he could track it nearly five seconds into the future at a consistent rate, but there were always times when he got it wrong. For instance, right now. Izuku's prediction was on perhaps the most basic transition possible when his prediction diverged from the truth of what was going to happen. A few questions quickly put his mind at ease. I am wrong about where the steel should be. False. Something is going to interrupt the motion of the spin outside of my control. True. Several more questions and he had identified that one of his classmates was going to throw their balled up extra essay paper at the rod in what was now four seconds. The next three of those seconds were spent determining the trajectory that the essay would come in, and the final one was spent adjusting the spin of the piece of metal. The ball and beam connected with almost no noise, but the paper flew across the room, its adjusted trajectory bringing it right to Bunko's desk, rolling to a stop in the center of the paper that he was marking up. The teacher looked up to see a silent classroom, the majority of the class staring at the paper ball with a few exceptions. Izuku was as bored as ever, leaning back in his chair and spinning his stress toy like there was no tomorrow. The girl who had thrown the ball in the first place was switching between staring at Izuku with incomprehension and looking at the ball with horror on her face. The other quirkless girl, Aid Shizuka, was glaring at the ball thrower, clearly able to guess why the paper was thrown at him. Bunko flattened out the paper, its message scrawled largely across the paper. Quirkless loser, the paper read. Izuku was not surprised. This was something that occurred on a near daily basis, always when Katsumi was away so that she wouldn't retaliate on his behalf. Izuku was known as a passive individual, never fighting back for himself, so he was picked on much more than anyone else. By the time the teacher looked up from the paper to see if anyone looked like they had thrown the paper, the majority of the class had returned to studiously writing their papers, including the ball thrower. When class ended, the thrower left in a huff, which was a relief to Izuku. The teacher, however, kept Shizuka and him behind, giving them a reminder that they were always welcome in her classroom and the school in general. She had given the two of them this talk before, and while theoretically all teachers were supposed to have such a proactive stance Bunko, was the only one of Izuku's teachers who did. After both of them replied, with a thank you, Aikta sensei she wrote out late passes for the two of them and sent them on their way to their next classes. Izuku had literature next, which meant it was time for career counseling. On the bright side, he was only slightly late for the start of this class. His entrance was met with varied reactions from his classmates, with some looking at him in annoyance, some staring at him like he was an odd specimen among them, and others uncaring. The exception, of course, were the students unfortunate to be sitting adjacent to Katsumi, who were silent and shifting their gazes between the two of them. It was well known that the two of them were close friends. Perhaps they were not as close as they once were, having grown apart over the years and divided over Masaru's death. Still, any students that attempted to bully Izuku often found themselves facing down the force of nature that Katsumi had become over the years. Katsumi had developed a protective streak ever since Masaru died, worrying that Izuku, who was just as fragile as he was, would suffer a similar fate someday. It had been the impetus behind her growth and training for the past decade, and though she made sure that Izuku never saw her dealing with his bullies, Izuku had found out after the third time one of them had become suspiciously quiet in his presence. Nowadays, they tended to stick to doing things that couldn't be proven came from one of them, and the events of this morning had certainly been an outlier. Only a minute after Izuku took his seat, the career counselor arrived. She was the platonic ideal of the kind, caring grandmother, and Izuku had visited her several times to make sure that he could apply to UA in the first place. Her quirk was one of the more exotic ones that Izuku had encountered, though it was perhaps the best quirk someone with her occupation could have. If she made physical contact with someone for more than 10 seconds, she could vaguely predict their future given a set of parameters. When Izuku had first entered her office and told her seriously that he wanted to go to UA, she only doubted him until she used her quirk on him. She hadn't been able to make out any of the specifics of his future, which was to be expected. Izuku's ability to defy future outcomes with the foreknowledge he gained from his quirk made him a nuisance to precognitive quirks, as a whole. What she had seen, however, had reassured her enough to support him in his endeavors instead of recommending another path for him to take. As she stood in the front of the room, gaze sweeping over the class, her smile widened slightly as she made eye contact with him. She began to speak. Good morning, everyone. I know you're all eager for the future, though I haven't met with some of you yet. If you could all stand up and move to the right side of the classroom if we've talked before and move to the left if we haven't talked about your career options, that will help this go faster. One of the girls near the front of the class was confused. All right or you're right. Yasutake Sora, the counselor, let out a laugh at the question. My apologies, that was a mistake on my part. Please move to the wall with the door if we haven't talked before and the wall with the window if we have. The groups divided, with just under a third of the class standing by the window with Izuku. Katsumi was included and she walked directly towards Izuku, the small crowd parting before her. She poked Izuku in the chest to get his attention, 
perhaps using slightly more force than she had intended to. As Izuku shifted his gaze downwards to look at her, he noticed not for the first time the disparity between himself and the others in the classroom. With his carefully constructed diet, exercise, and the use of his quirk, he stood nearly two meters tall. Even Katsumi, who was the tallest girl in the class, was almost exactly a head shorter than him. His muscle wasn't apparent due to both his choice of clothing and his method of building muscle. During the school day, Izuku wore a long-sleeved t-shirt and long pants, often having to select baggier clothing due to his proportions. He changed before leaving in the one male bathroom in the school when the weather was warmer, but right now it was the middle of October. While Izuku was strong, he had made sure that his muscle development in no way limited his range of motion, speed, or flexibility while gaining the strength to at least compete with women who had trained quirks. He would never be a physical powerhouse, even though his quirk assured him that he could. It just felt so wrong to do, what was the point in choosing a single path to follow when his quirk and skill set were benefited the most by a large range of possibilities. He was snapped out of his thoughts by Katsumi's push. He looked down at her and gave her his customary brilliant smile. It only grew as she began to speak. How are you doing, Izuku? I heard that someone tried to throw something at you last class, do I need to have a talk with anyone? Izuku pulled the piece of metal from his pocket and started spinning it. I'm fine. I didn't see who threw it, and it was just a paper ball. Besides, nobody here could do anything worse to me than the school itself. Katsumi sighed, having heard this story from her closest friend ever since their sixth year when they shared no classes for the first time. Throughout their first five years in school, she had known that he was smarter than their classmates, always having time to help her with subjects that she struggled with. But now that she was more aware of the average intelligence of her peers, she truly knew how much of an anomaly he was. The turning point had been a school-wide chess tournament several years ago. The school had brought in one of the few grandmasters of the dying game to introduce it to them. None of them had ever played the game before, so they were each given a chess set to prepare for the competition in a month. The day after they had gotten the game, she had defeated Izuku utterly, retaining most of her pieces while hunting him to a checkmate. Three days later, he had taught the game to his virtual assistant and she had walked in on a game between the two. Izuku had beaten M4, so she played a game against him first. It was odd to hear the voice she remembered as her father's coming from the machine, but she had gotten over her feelings about M4S voice a long time ago. Six moves into her game against the computer and she was already losing. She entered an internecine conflict, but once they were down to just their kings and their pawns, she was crushed by the virtual assistant, who decided to promote all four of his remaining pawns into queens. She wondered whether Izuku had programmed him to play that way for a total of three seconds before she resigned. Then she tried to play Izuku, and it was even worse. She lost before 20 moves were played, her best friend seeming to have read all of her moves before she made them. After the crushing defeat, she played another game against M4, this time with Izuku evaluating the position for her, pointing out different techniques that M4 was setting up, the potential threats he had, never pointing out the moves she should make but allowing her to try her hand at the game from an informed perspective. By the tournament came around, she considered herself pretty good at the game. Izuku was on the other side of the bracket from her, thankfully, but she was eventually eliminated by one of her classmates who had an intelligence quirk. Where her games had been struggles after the first two, however, Izuku seemed like he was bored as he played, moving less than a second after his opponent made their move. The semi-final match, between Izuku and the girl she had lost to, was the one where Izuku started paying attention. She liked to think that it was out of a sense of revenge for her, and it very well could have been with the sadistic playstyle he adopted for that game, forcing moves that put his opponent into a worse and worse position until she simply ran out of pieces to mount a stable defense, and was overwhelmed. The final match was a game against the Grandmaster herself, who possessed a quirk that allowed her to immerse herself in the game, ignoring all outside distractions to play at her best. She had offered not to use it against Izuku, to make it fair, but he declined the offer. Katsumi forced her way to the front of the crowd to watch a game very similar to the one she had seen him play against M4, deeply theoretical, with moves that made no sense but set something up to occur three or four moves later. Izuku won handily enough, and then the Grandmaster pitted him against the best surviving chess computer, whom Izuku would later confide in her played much worse than M4. All of the whispered accusations of cheating were silenced as the quirkless boy broke down the machine's position, with the Grandmaster ending the game as soon as the computer's evaluation reached a force checkmate and eight moves in Izuku's favor. Favor. He picked up his trophy in silence along with his souvenir chessboard and left the gymnasium where the tournament was hosted in silence, only waiting for Katsumi to join him before walking home. He had offered her the trophy, saying that she deserved it as one of the two humans who had ever beaten him. She was fairly sure that the other was his mom, and she refused, telling him that he deserved it. Then, he had laughed in the odd way that he did sometimes, telling her that she had put far more effort in than he had to prepare, and that he didn't feel like having such a trophy in his room. Besides, he told her, giving her one of his usual smiles, I'll keep the chessboard for myself. 
It means more to me than the trophy, and if you won't let me paint the walls of your room, you need something of mine in there to make up for your presence on my walls. She blushed at the statement, thinking of both the painting of the two of them that hung on the wall of his room and the collection of gifts that Izuku had given her at one point or another that she hid underneath her bed whenever he came over. She had taken the trophy in the end, putting it on the corner of her desk so that he could see it as he walked past her room when he came over. She could never really say no to his smiling face anyway. Snapping back to the present, she nodded and caught the spinning piece of metal as it flew through the air toward her, preserving some of its momentum and clumsily spinning it once before tossing it back to Izuku. It was a tragedy that he had been born male, if he were a woman, people would laud him as having an intelligence quirk and sing his praises instead of ignoring him and leaving him where he was. Having finished with the students she hadn't discussed their careers with before, Sora walked over to check in with the rest of the class. Already having met with them, their meetings went by quickly. As she reached Izuku, she smiled. You still want to go for Yue, young man. Izuku nodded, bending down so that she could place her palm on his forehead. She held her palm there far longer than she had for the rest of her classmates, releasing it with a nod. As Izuku rose back to his full height, she smiled and gave him some parting advice. As difficult as ever to read you, but you'll do great things if you make it there. She turned and walked to Katsumi, who was standing next to him, comprehending the fact that Izuku wanted to go to UA as well. And you want to go to UA as well, huh? The only two in your class that are so ambitious. Her session was as short as the rest of the class, barring Izuku. Sora said something to her that she missed, but she assumed it was positive from the way Izuku smiled and put his arm around her shoulders. She went through the rest of the day in a daze, collecting her thoughts into a coherent argument for when she saw Izuku at the end of the day. As her final class was closer to the main entrance of the school, she made her way there quickly to await and confront Izuku. He arrived shortly after she did, and she dragged him away from the mass of students leaving the building. She began her rant as soon as they were out of earshot of the other students. What did the counselor mean? You're applying to UA. You don't have a quirk, it'll be too dangerous for you. Why couldn't she read you? Why doesn't her quirk tell your future as easily as the rest of ours? Izuku decided to answer the least loaded question first. I'm pretty sure that her quirk had problems reading me and quirkless people in general because it makes use of the onaic energy flowing near the brain to get a read of who the person is, and then models that energy to see how they will change in the future. She likely has to use her own energy to get a read of me and tries to interpret my future using the absences where other people would have a presence. It's a really interesting quirk if you thin. Katsumi interrupted his rambling analysis of Sora's quirk with a light hit to his chest, refocusing his attention on her. Never mind that, why are you applying to UA in the first place? Izuku sighed. He couldn't reveal that he had something like a quirk himself, so he had to use other lines of reasoning. First of all, it's literally the best college in Japan. Even if I don't make it into a specific course, their general studies program is still the best by far. You know me, I'd be bored with any old college, but UA might finally give me a challenge. Additionally, they have pro-heroines as teachers for all of their classes. The support course has Power Loader, the business course has Tycoon, and that's not to mention the hero course. Thirdly, it's less than an hour from home if I ever want to visit mom, and most importantly, it's where you're going. Where would I be without my best friend? His argument seemed to have enough merit to calm down Katsumi's explosive personality, especially his last point. Her righteous fury began to crumble, causing her to end the argument while she could. I don't care about all of that. I just don't want you to get hurt, and you know that they allow free quirk use there. Unless you can make sure that you'll be safe, I don't even want you to think of going there, okay? Katsumi stormed off, leaving him behind to think about what she had just said. A quick check with his quirk revealed that there would be no way to avoid having a quirk used on him at UA, but he could make it through without being seriously injured if he used his quirk proactively. He pondered on this as he walked home. Perhaps he could build some kind of armor for himself. Maybe a better version of the onaic energy shield he had theorized so long ago. It had always been a pipe dream, requiring the kinds of materials that could only be found in government labs, but perhaps he could finally bring it into reality. It would be similar to the stun sphere that he had created so long ago, as all of his other homemade hero gear was. No matter the purpose of the item, it was always formed into a sphere the size of a ripe orange when he built it. The shield that he was thinking of would similarly burst apart, but this one would form a barrier between the pieces instead of passing a charge between them. The barrier itself would drain the onaic energy from the occupants on contact to sustain it or drain its own power reserves for up to five minutes. As a prison, there was perhaps no better option. Teleportation quirks that required a link to move somewhere, according to his quirk, would either just be sending energy directly into the barrier each time they tried to escape or would appear at a random location within the barrier. Sure, certain types of quirk could get around the energy draining aspect. A flight quirk, for example, would allow the person trapped inside to avoid touching any of the walls, but giving Izuku five minutes to prepare to fight you was incredibly unwise. Sighing, Izuku began to try and figure out how he would get the materials he needed with his quirk while he took one of the spheres from his backpack, and began to fiddle with it. His thoughts were interrupted by one of the passive statements he ran by his quirk returned true. 
The subconscious thought was there is someone who intends to harm me within 50 meters of me. Izuku gripped the prison sphere tightly, priming it to expand one second after he released it. He made his way to the center of the alleyway he had wandered into, and not a second too late. A massive slime rose out of the sewer grates less than five meters from where he had been standing. His quirk confirmed that this was the person who wanted to hurt him. The slime resolved itself into a shape resembling a woman before speaking. How perfect, an invisibility cloak for me. A boy as well, they'll never think to look for me in him. Hearing her intentions, either some form of possession or parasitism, he threw the ball at the woman, controlling the speed of his throw so that it would explode just before reaching her. The slime woman didn't even react to the ball, knowing that she would just absorb it and move on. She was mistaken. She instinctively flinched backwards as the ball shattered, not taking notice of the pieces arcing behind her. By the time the current began to flow, it was already too late for her. Seeing as she had no distinct organs, the flow of electricity needed no direction from M4 aside from its voltage. All might dropping out of the sky while this was happening was unexpected. But he supposed there had to be at least one hero chasing her if she felt the need to use him as an invisibility cloak. The two of them greeted each other as friends, making small talk while they waited for the shards of metal to reform into a ball, and for the villain to be rendered unconscious. An interesting result happened as a result of the electricity passing through the slime woman's body. The material hardened from the almost liquid state that it had previously been into a solid, albeit smaller, form. As the pieces of the ball returned to their resting state, All Might dashed forwards, grabbed the unconscious villain and leapt away, carrying her to the police force that had been initially tracking the woman. Izuku was still in the alley when All Might returned, and with his permission, she wrapped an arm around him and leaped up to the roof of a nearby building. She dropped out of her empowered form after they landed and opened the conversation. It's been a while since I last met up with you, Izuku. How are things going? How's school? How's life? Izuku smiled. It's been pretty good, Toshiko. School is as boring as ever, but it's senior year now and I'll be out of there soon. I'll be going to UA this time next year, so hopefully that will be more interesting. I've done a lot of training since we last met, and my quirk thinks I could take you at somewhere between 41 and 42% of one for all, barring any upsets. It seems to be a pretty hard limit that I've hit. I've been stuck there for the past year and a half. I'll have to spar with you again sometime to push that limit. As for life, I don't know. My best friend is applying to UA, but she doesn't want me to go there because she thinks I'll be hurt. I can't exactly tell her about my quirk, so I had to misdirect her a bit, bringing up the non-hero courses, but she'll find out sooner or later and I don't really know what to do. Toshiko chuckled. Sounds like she has a crush on you, Izuku. What a tragedy, break her heart by going or fall away from her by not going. Izuku shook his head. There's no way she has oh no, she does. Wait, that explains so much, why she's been acting like she has, why she's so overprotective at school. Oh my goodness what do I do? All Might cut him off, snapping him out of the state he was in. Don't worry about it, Izuku. Things have been going fine so far, so don't worry about it. Just keep doing what you've been doing, and everything should work out fine, no. Izuku shook his head, having given up arguing the point with Toshiko after he used his quirk to find out whether she would actually be able to give him more useful advice. Whatever you say, Toshiko. Anyways, only a few more months of boredom and I'll be at UA, finally learning something useful. I almost can't wait. At that, Toshiko let out a short laugh. Well, I can't argue with you there. On that note, would you be interested in training with another person and me in the upcoming months? I think I've found one final person to pass one for all onto and having you there to judge whether or not she is ready at any given time would be incredibly useful, as well as having the perfect plan for her to prepare herself for the quirk. So, what do you say? Izuku tilted his head to the side, considering the offer seriously. On the one hand, his physical training was beginning to plateau. The rate at which he was growing taller was slowing down, and most of the exercise he did daily was to maintain his physical ability. There wasn't much more that he could improve without breaking the balance he maintained between his strength, speed, and flexibility. On the other, he'd be able to help someone out who had been in the same position he had been in all those years ago, quirkless and dreaming of becoming a hero. He'd be able to spar against All Might daily, improving his technique and showing him the level of ability he needed to achieve to become the hero that All Might was. He'd be able to spend time with people like him, and most importantly of all, he'd be able to make a new friend and meet one of his potential classmates ahead of time. Sure, it sounds like a good way to spend my afternoons. I won't be able to be there all of the time, but I'll be there as often as I can. I'll probably be spending a fair portion of the time I have between now and then increasing the standard of my technology as well, but I'll do my best to help whoever you found become the next inheritor of one for all. Toshiko nodded, smiling at the good news. That's excellent. I'll let M4 know where we'll be training as soon as I find a suitable place. I'll see you soon. With that, she leaped away, leaving Izuku alone on the roof of the building. With a sigh, he stood up and walked over to the edge. Looking over the alleyway, he slipped into a focused state where he was able to dedicate all of his attention to solving a particular task, blocking out the world around him. 
His eyes scanned the walls of the alley beneath him, identifying potential handholds and footholds, fire escapes and balconies that he could land on, and a drainpipe that he could use to slide the rest of the way to the ground. Having found the path he would take, he dropped out of his state of hyperfocus and carried out the plan that he had formed in his mind's eye, his fine-tuned awareness of and control over his body allowing him to follow through flawlessly. Eight seconds after he swung down from the rooftop, he had descended the four stories to the ground without so much as a scratch. He continued his walk home as if nothing had happened, picking through the expended barrier sphere to find a way to improve it while maintaining its compact nature. As he neared his house, he reached behind him and slid it into a pouch on his backpack before entering the house, shutting the door behind himself and making his way to the kitchen table where his mom was waiting. She rose to greet him as he arrived, but was surprised when he pulled her into a brief hug before sitting down across the table from her. Mom, I need to tell you something. Actually, a few things. These words sent a chill down her spine the likes of which she hadn't felt for the past five years, since the last time he had been attacked by a villain. She didn't know if it was some motherly instinct that was warning her, but it had never led her wrong in the past. She prepared herself for what he was about to say, keeping a fine grip on her cork as he began to speak. So today a slime woman tried to attack me, and I'm fine but I need to recharge the stun ball again. That isn't the important news, though. All Might was chasing the villain, and after she passed out All Might took her to the police and then came back to talk with me. During our talk, she told me something that I never realized before. Here his face shifted from its serious expression to an embarrassed one, the tone of his voice changing similarly. I found out that Katsumi has a crush on me, and I don't know what to do. How should I react? Should I say anything? What mom? Inko had broken down into a fit of laughter as soon as she had processed the first sentence he said. To both her and Mitsuki, it had been obvious. Ever since Mitsuki had sat down with her daughter and given her the talk, it had been obvious to see the glances she gave him when she thought nobody was looking, the way she acted differently around him, and a hundred other tells. She almost couldn't believe that Izuku, the target of both her subtle and not-so-subtle affections, the one with the quirk that approached omniscience if given enough time and information, hadn't noticed it yet. Inko knew that she shouldn't be laughing at her son's expense, but it was so hard not to. The boy wonder, master of over a thousand skills, the strongest quirkless person or man on earth, and he was unable to deal with someone he had known for almost his entire life having a crush on him. When she calmed down from her initial reaction to her situation, she reached one arm across the table, placing it on one of his arms where it rested. For a moment, she struggled with choosing the advice she should give him. Izuku, dear, she began, you don't need to think too hard about this. You don't need to change who you are because of this. In fact, that's the worst thing you could do. She likes you for who you are, for who you've been and who you've become since you first met her. Just be subtle. Put your arm around her shoulders when you sit together, show her that you care about her, and just be yourself. When you feel comfortable with it, try asking her out on a date. Ask her if she wants to spend more time with you. Eventually, if the two of you are close enough, ask her if she wants to be your girlfriend. However, I don't want you using your quirk for any of this, do you hear me? This isn't the kind of thing that you plan out elaborately, weeks or months in advance, it's the kind of thing that needs to happen naturally. I know M4S listening to us, so he'll hold you accountable. Besides, when the two of you grow close enough, you'll have to tell her about it anyway. It isn't healthy for a relationship to keep secrets, especially not ones of that much importance, and you don't want her wondering if she was in control of her actions or if everything was a lie, okay. She stood up and walked around the table, hugging her only son. He returned it warmly, extremely grateful for the honest advice that she had given him. She was the only person that had been there for him his entire life, and he was eternally thankful that she would always be there for him. When Inko broke the hug, Izuku spoke up again. Thanks for all of the advice mom. I have one other thing that I want to talk to you about. It's probably better if I asked All Might to come over here to explain it fully, but the gist of it is that I'll probably be spending quite a few of my afternoons between now and July training with her. I just wanted to make sure that it was okay with you, and if there's a day that works for you for her to come over so that we can explain everything. Inko nodded along, agreeing to the request and picking out that Seti for All Might to come over for dinner. The week passed quickly, and that Seti Izuku was sitting in the living room when the doorbell rang. Confirming that it was Toshiko, he called out to his mom that she was here before answering the door. Opening the door, he looked down to see Toshiko before him in normal clothing. He invited her in and led her to the kitchen where his mother was preparing dinner for the three of them. Inko paused, turning around to face the two of them. Izuku took it upon himself to introduce the two of them to each other. Mom, this is Yagi Toshiko, also known as the pro heroine All Might. I've been working with her for the past 13 years with her hero work, as you know. Toshiko, this is my mother, Midoriya Inko. If the two of you would like to get to know each other, I can take over with dinner preparations. Inko nodded, stepping to the side as Izuku walked past her so that she could talk to the pro heroine. Would you like anything to drink, Yagi-san? Five minutes later, the two of them were sitting in the living room as they got to know each other, talking about their hobbies and interests. At a certain point, Inko set her glass of water down to fully focus on the woman sitting beside her. You know, Yagi-san, I have had several misgivings about your relationship with my son and his choice of career in general. 
Toshiko, sensing the shift in the conversation, set her drink down as well, preparing herself for Enko's disapproval of their partnership, but was happily surprised by what came next. At first, I worried that he would get himself into danger, that by becoming a hero he would place a target over his head that would be too large for his own good. When he first told me that he was working with you, telling you everything there was to know about the crimes you'd face, I was afraid for him. I was afraid that one day he'd be in over his head, he'd get something wrong, and it would crush him. To an extent, that's what happened with Masaru. But I've seen him grow and thrive as he chases his dream, the way he talks about doing hero work with you, how much happier he is that he can achieve his dream to even the limited extent that he is through you. Here, Inko switched tracks seemingly out of nowhere. How much has he told you about what he's found out about Quirks? Toshiko took a few seconds to compile everything she remembered from their conversations, curious as to where the conversation would go. Aside from the basics that everyone knows, he talked about Quirks originating from a mutation in the unused X chromosome, that they have passive effects during development, and that they use something he named onaic energy that flows through the body as fuel. There's probably more, but I don't remember it off the top of my head. Inko nodded. You probably assumed that the passive effects were things like muscle development, right? Things that affect our physical bodies. Yes, that's what I assumed, Toshiko stated. Is there something more that I'm not aware of? There most certainly is, Inko replied, taking a sip of water before continuing. A long time ago, Izuku theorized that our quirks had a passive effect on our personalities. Take me, for example. My quirk allows me to bring objects closer to me but is unable to push them away. Similarly, I am very quick to bring people close to myself emotionally, but have a hard time pushing them away or letting go of them, which has been interesting for my social life over the years. Some other examples are one of my friends and her daughter, my friend's quirk turns her sweat into glycerin, a type of sugar and alcohol. Her personality is best described as sweet, but at times almost too sweet. Her daughter has an explosive quirk, and her personality is explosive in nature, stable, normal, until something sets it off. The point that I'm trying to get at here is the effect Suzuku's quirk has on him. He abhors lying. He understands that it is necessary at times, like not admitting that he has a quirk, but he will never lie to anyone if he can help it. Before he met you, did he ever outright tell you that he was a girl? If anything, I'd bet that you simply assumed it or M4 led you into it. So when I ask him if he enjoys doing what he's doing, whether he will be safe in the future, I know that he isn't only telling me what he believes is true. He is telling me the truth, and I can rest easy with that knowledge. I have long gotten over any misgivings I may have had, and I just want you to know that I'll support my son in anything he does, even if the entire world is against him. Toshiko nodded slowly, processing the new information that she had learned. She wondered for a moment what effects her quirk had on her personality, whether it had changed her since she inherited it and in what ways. As she was about to speak, Izuku's voice called out from the kitchen. Dinner's ready. The three of them sat around the kitchen table, enjoying the katsudan that both Midoriyas had prepared. Izuku and Enko took their first bites of the dish, savoring their favorite foods. The moment of peace was broken by Toshiko's cry of surprise as she finished her first bite. What did you put in that? I've had katsudan before, but it was never this good. Is this a family recipe or something? Izuku swallowed before giving her one of his signature smiles. For a given definition of family recipe. I think it was about a month after I first built M2, but I wondered if there was a perfect recipe for katsudan. And after a few days of guessing the cooking instructions, we came up with this one. I guarantee that you will never taste better katsudan than this. The rest of dinner was spent in silence, the three of them paying most of their attention to eating the meal in front of them. When they had all finished, Enko collected their bowls while Izuku retrieved one of M4S speakers and the noise cancellation device. He placed the privacy-ensuring speaker in the center of the table while placing M4S on the fourth placemat, on the table. After switching both on, he began to speak. So, mom, I told you that I'd be training with All Might between now and July, right? Well, there's slightly more to it than that, but it's best if Toshiko is here to explain it. The aforementioned woman nodded, leaning slightly forwards as she began to explain her quirk. My quirk has a long story behind it, but the short version of it is that it can be passed on to other quirkless women, growing in power every time. I am the eighth bearer of the quirk, and Izuku had confirmed that it can be passed on one final time before it becomes too dangerous for the user to train and control. I think I've found a candidate to be the next bearer, and I'd like to enlist your son in helping train her and build up her body to receive the quirk. Inko took a moment to process that information. She understood why Izuku would be the best possibility for a personal trainer, but one of Japan's best-kept secrets was much harder to take in. Okay, so long as Izuku isn't putting himself in any danger by doing this and gets something out of it himself. Both of the other two nodded, and the conversation shifted to lighter topics, such as Izuku's antics over the years or stories of All Might's hero work. When Toshiko left that night, she was no longer an unapproachable hero in Inko's eyes, nor was she just somebody that Izuku worked with. She was a friend, and now that Inko had her she wouldn't be letting go. Izuku smiled as he waved goodbye to Toshiko. He didn't need to bring her over in reality. He knew that his mom would say yes to nearly anything so long as Izuku wanted to do it. 
The point of having Toshiko come over was for his mom to make a new friend. After all, she had only Mitsuki there for her for the past 10 years, and Izuku wanted his mother to be as happy as possible. As he went to bed that night, he smiled. He would have to work hard over the coming months, but it would all be worth it soon. When Izuku was told to arrive at Dagaba Beach to meet All Might and his unnamed successor for training, he wasn't entirely sure what to expect. It was not, however, the equivalent of a junkyard with patches of sand barely visible beneath the piles of scrap. He had arrived slightly early with his backpack full of tools and devices that he had already built. While he waited for the two other people to arrive, he took some time to set up a workspace for himself. He cleared an area of 10 meters square and flattened out the sand before setting out a tarp that he had been carrying with him in the center of the cleared area. Unloading his backpack onto the tarp, he pulled out a speaker for M4, his collection of spheres, a drawing pad, and some pencils. Looking like the strangest beachgoer in history, Izuku got to work brainstorming the various ways that his most useful anti-quirk items could be improved. The main issue as far as he could tell was the lack of power and speed. Sure, he could shock someone, form small barriers, create a magnetic pull, and a variety of other electromagnetic tricks, but against an opponent like All Might they were nothing but that, tricks. He had no impression that his barriers would hold against even a single punch at even 20% of one for all, let alone the level that he was currently capable of sparring against her. She wouldn't stand still for the stun sphere to reach her, didn't use hero equipment that the magnet sphere could remove, and was simply too strong and fast for the others to be of any use against her. Izuku knew that she was an anomaly. Against any other heroine or villain, the barriers would block one hit at the very least and at most block any form of attack for up to a minute. The stun sphere could knock out anyone who wasn't able to avoid it in some way or didn't have an electricity-based quirk. All metallic hero gear was equally useless before him, and he could use a set of magnetically manipulated steel balls to bludgeon opponents in close range. Anomalies, however, were what he would have to prepare for as a hero. Keeping with his theme of electromagnetism, he began to brainstorm improvements to his equipment with the goal of holding up against All Might in mind. When he reached a lull in his process, his keen ears picked up the sound of a girl his age talking. Are you sure this is where we're going to train, Auntie Might? This doesn't look much like a beach. The implications of the first sentence briefly shocked Izuku before he used his quirk and found out that the two were not actually related to each other. He definitely agreed with the girl's first impression of the beach, however. No, Melissa, I'm sure that this is where we're going to train. It might not look much like a beach now, but we'll be cleaning it up as a part of your training. Toshiko's familiar voice rang out across the piles of scrap, carrying farther with the odd quality that her voice gained whenever she tapped into one for all. Now, we'll be starting in a bit, just as soon as one of my friends arrives. The two of you have a lot in common, and I expect you'll become great friends as well. Come on, let's take a look around. Melissa's voice sounded questioning. What do you mean, one of your friends? Aren't we supposed to keep the whole, you know, quirk thing a secret? Is it really a good idea to let more people in on it? Toshiko's laugh resounded as the sounds of their voices drew nearer. Don't worry about it, Melissa. Depending on how you count, there are only, let's see, one, two, four. Either five or six other people that know about one for all, and we're about to meet with either one or two of them. Look, there they are now. With the last sentence, the two of them rounded the last scrap heap, coming into sight of Izuku's tarp. The younger girl, whom Izuku confirmed was the Melissa that had been talking earlier, got one look at Izuku before hiding behind Toshiko. Aunt Might, who is this? What way how? Toshiko laughed at her initial reaction, reaching behind herself to bring Melissa next to her once again. Melissa, say hello to the famous librarian. A few seconds later, the three of them sat in a triangle on the tarp with Izuku facing Melissa, M4S speaker, and portable holographic projector completing the square. M4 decided to break the ice, forming the featureless face that he had first created all those years ago as M3. I must say, Toshiko, I'm rather offended. Just because I don't have a physical body or a mother doesn't necessarily make me less than a person. I'd argue that I count the same as Izuku, Nozomi, Gran Torino, Madame Nighteye, and Izuku's mother. One could even argue that the two of us should count more than them by virtue of the depth of our knowledge. Toshiko apologized to M4 as Melissa almost jumped backwards in surprise. Internally, she was slightly shocked at M4's knowledge of people that knew about one for all but rationalized it as a result of Izuku using his quirk, and not M4's information collection. The tension now sufficiently broken, Toshiko began. Well, we should all introduce ourselves, to begin with. As you all know, my name is Yagi Toshiko, better known as the pro-heroine All Might. My quirk is one for all, and I spend most of my time fighting crime throughout Japan. I enjoy reading in my free time, and the one thing I disliked has been gone for almost a decade. Izuku, you go next. Izuku straightened his back, running through his head how in-depth his introduction should be. He quickly settled on an appropriate level and began to speak. My name is Midoriya Izuku, but you probably know of me as the librarian. I don't necessarily have a quirk in the traditional sense, but I'm doing my best to become a hero anyway. I'm currently a senior in high school, but I'll be applying to UA this spring. I have too many hobbies to list before sundown, but my favorites would have to be art, swordplay, and helping Toshiko fight crime. 
As for things that I dislike, the way society treats corkless people and lying. M4, give the admin introduction. M4's featureless face morphed quickly into the one he favored, one similar to Izuku's with a few noticeable differences. The two could be mistaken as brothers if M4 had the rest of the body to match. My name is Masaru 4, but you can call me M4, Masaru, or Midoriya. I am the fourth generation artificial intelligence created by Midoriya Izuku, and I am known as me to the public. I am corkless, in the sense that I do not possess a biological genome to support one. But I perceive time slower than you by nearly a hundred thousand times and can access any device, that has a connection to the internet with ease. I enjoy creating new ideas and do not particularly dislike anything. Melissa spent some time taking in Izuku's and M4S introductions, noting the oddities in their introductions for later. When she realized that the three of them were all looking at her, her face flushed before she introduced herself. My name is Melissa Shield, and I'm visiting from America. My father, David, built support gear for All Might when she visited, and she's my godmother. I'm quirkless. I like spending time with my dad and Annie Might and I like building things, and I don't like bullies. Toshiko applauded their introductions before moving on to the reason why they were there. So, now that we've all gotten to know each other, here's what we'll be doing. I was thinking that we'd spend the rest of today getting to know each other better, and starting tomorrow we'll be doing some physical training. I'll leave the specifics vague for now, but over the next 10 months we'll be able to shape the two of you into the heroes of tomorrow. The two humans present applauded before settling into a conversation. Melissa was very interested in M4, asking him questions about how he worked to avoid talking to Izuku. She had lived a relatively sheltered life, and the only boy she had ever known was her father, who was very different from Izuku. M4 answered most of her questions at first, happily explaining things like his development from M2 to his current state, but he quickly realized what she was doing. His answers become more philosophical, becoming questions in and of themselves, trying to subtly turn her towards asking Izuku questions as well. Izuku had returned to his drawing pad, turning over the sheet of potential ideas to draw a detailed image of one of the fragments of the sphere that sat before him. Eventually, he noticed Melissa looking at him nervously and gave her one of his gentlest smiles, trying to put her at ease. It seemed to work, and she asked him the question about his odd description of his lack of quirk. Well, to explain that I'd have to know how much you know about quirk's work, just to get an idea of where to start. Melissa nodded. I know that quirks only occur in girls and that there are three main categories of quirk, but that's about it. Izuku set down his drawing pad and pencil, ready to explain some of his knowledge. So, none of what you know is necessarily wrong. Quirks work because of a mutation in the X chromosome, which girls have two of and boys only have one. Only one of them is actually used by the body for normal functions, but the second one in girls mutated about 200 years ago, leading to the rise of quirks. There's a lot more to it, but that's all you need to know for now. When I said I didn't have a quirk, I meant it in that way. I don't have a second X chromosome, so there's no way for me to have a quirk in the real sense. However, there's a voice in the back of my head that tells me things, and it's never been wrong. So it's definitely equal to a quirk in most ways, but it doesn't do things like make me stronger or give me superpowers. Melissa slowly nodded. Why don't they teach us things like that in school? How quirks work, and all that. Izuku let out a short laugh. They don't tell you that because they don't know it. Scientists know the expression of quirks and work with that, but they've never been able to figure out the cause. Or, at least, prove that the cause is there. My pseudo-quirk tells me whether things are true or false, the words people say, writing on paper, and the thoughts that run through my head. It's entirely objective, so if someone told you something false and you thought it was true, I'd pick up that it was false even if you believed it to be true. The quirkless girl shook her head. That's, wow, I can see how you've been acting as the librarian this whole time. Can you predict the future? Are there any limits? Izuku pulled a coin out of his pocket and turned to a blank sheet of paper on his drawing pad. Tossing the coin to Melissa, he began to write. After he had written 20 outcomes, he turned the paper to face Melissa. These are the first 20 results of flipping that coin. If you only flip it three times here, the next 17 times it is flipped it will result in this sequence. As for limits, it's pretty open-ended. If I don't know what to ask, I won't be able to get an answer. Tonight, I'll be using it to create the optimal workout routine for you for the next 10 months. Melissa was on her fourth coin flip by now and had a question for him. But if it only answers questions and doesn't make you stronger, how are you going to become a hero? Izuku smiled, having known that this question would come. My quirk doesn't make me any physically stronger, that's true. I make myself stronger. It merely tells me how I can do my best, leaving me to walk that path myself. I know that it puts me at a disadvantage, not having any external powers, but as soon as Toshiko gets back from scoping out the area I'll show you how far I've come over the years. From there, their talk devolved into talking about their personal lives. Izuku expressed his boredom with school, a sentiment shared by Melissa. She had left public education after only three years, with her father tutoring her in math, science, and engineering. He had found online curriculums for her for things like English and history, and she had learned how to speak Japanese from Toshiko when she came over to visit. The topic turned to Izuku's technology, with Melissa giving her insight on the development of the barrier sphere, 
whenever she could. She mentioned integrating it into a suit of armor, causing the two of them to delve deeper into the idea. By the time Toshiko returned to the clearing, the two had started drawing their own ideas for the improved defense. Melissa's idea was to create a set of pieces similar to plate armor that linked together to create a full suit of armor. It certainly had its merits, and in the future she would doubtlessly create something similar for herself. Izuku, however, had continued with his electromagnetism and was designing smaller and smaller pieces that could be combined into each other, eventually forming a sort of second skin. When the two of them had reached a good point to take a break, Izuku mentioned a demonstration of his ability for Melissa, something Toshiko heartily agreed with. After Izuku packed up the area that they were in, she led the two of them to an area that she had cleared for physical training where the two of them could spar. As they walked there, Izuku wrenched a metal rod from a discarded machine, weighing it in his hand before deciding that it would work as a weapon for the time being. Mentally, he added another requirement for his equipment, portability. He couldn't keep using practice equipment or random pieces of metal when he became a hero, and he couldn't exactly carry a sword in public without raising alarm. Setting the thought aside, Izuku left his backpack with Melissa when they arrived at the edge of the cleared area, a circle with a radius of almost a hundred meters. The garbage that had formerly occupied the area was piled up into a wall around the area, preventing anyone from looking in. Melissa took a seat by the entrance to the impromptu arena, M4 watching through a camera attached to the backpack. Izuku stood in the center of the area, keeping a watchful eye on Toshiko as she activated one for all. Let's start with 5% and go from there, shall we? Izuku grinned. Whatever works for you. Just remember, 43 is the limit for now. And so their clash began. Melissa watched in awe as the two of them fought, her godmother blurring around the battlefield as Izuku reacted defensively. He even scored a few hits on the pro-heroine, though those became less and less common as she ramped up. Izuku scored his last blow in the low twenties, and as All Might progressed into the thirties she was nothing but yellow sparks and afterimages to Melissa's untrained eye. Izuku, standing in the middle of the battlefield, never dropped his smile as the spar progressed. He had missed the pressure, the thrill of battle, the joy of bringing the skills that he had learned and honed for so long into reality. He had to be careful, but his movements were graceful as he knocked aside All Might's blows and closed off avenues of attack. It became harder and harder, and when she reached 38% Izuku had closed his eyes and was relying entirely on his other senses. The sound of the sparks produced by her cork, the feeling of the wind on his skin, the muted vibrations of her feet against the sand. All of these flowed into his brain, giving him the information that he needed to keep track of her location. In his mind's eye, he could see the next moves that All Might would make, see how he would counter them, and spent all of his focus into bringing them to pass. When All Might reached 42%, the jump was much harder than the last. He could see now why his ability had stagnated for so long. His redirections were barely effective anymore, giving him the room he needed to dodge if only just barely. The force he imparted on her was no longer enough to change the trajectory of her blows, and he couldn't hit harder due to the recoil numbing his hands if he tried. The problem wasn't his ability, he realized, but the lack of a material that would allow him to hit harder. He wasn't running out of endurance, nor was he unable to see or react to the future. With the right equipment, his quirk told him, he could overcome All Might using 60% of her quirk in a straight fight. However, it was now time to end this. Barely knocking aside the blow, he threw the metal beam to one side, catching All Might as she moved in position for her next attack. The metal bent and distorted as she ran into it, causing her to stop before it finished breaking. Taking that as the sign that the fight was over, seeing as Izuku was no longer armed, she lowered the amount of her quirk that she was using before picking up the pieces of the metal rod. The two sparring partners shook hands before turning and walking over to the entrance, where Melissa was staring at the two of them wide-eyed with her mouth slightly open. Toshiko, no longer using her quirk at all, slung her arm around Melissa's shoulder while Izuku picked up his backpack from where she had set it down. Well, Melissa, how was that? The corkless girl snapped out of the state she was in, staring in awe at first Toshiko, and then Izuku. She had seen footage of her godmother fighting crime before, but at those moments she had been moving at speeds that the cameras could record her. There was simply no comparison between what she had seen before and the level of speed and strength that she had just displayed. As for Izuku, she was in even more awe of him than her godmother. With only the strength of his human body, he had persisted far longer than she had thought possible. Comparing herself to him, she likely would have failed or given up without Toshiko even activating her quirk. She knew that part of her training over the next 10 months would be to prepare her to fight at that level, but even then she wasn't sure that she could do as well as he did. If she knew that Izuku was confident in his ability to face All Might at a state close to 60 times as strong as she had displayed back then with more reliable equipment, she would begin to question why there hadn't been any corkless heroes before. The number of heroes that could match All Might at 40% of her power in a straight fight numbered less than 100, and those that could keep up with her at 60% were considered the most elite in the world. After all, there was a reason that her strength alone had been able to keep Japan relatively peaceful for the past 30 years. Villains simply couldn't compete with someone that was 50,000 times as strong as even a corkless woman at a fraction of her maximum strength. 
And yet here Izuku was, deciding that the limitations other people expected were nothing but a suggestion in front of someone determined enough to challenge them. As the three of them arrived at the entrance to the beach, they parted ways, with Izuku promising to send the training plan that night, and to be there tomorrow after school. Sitting through his classes the next day was only made more frustrating by the knowledge that he could be somewhere else, training and actively improving himself or building something useful. He pushed out this tension wherever he could, drawing in the margins of his paper, writing in one of his spare notebooks, increasing the speed of his pen spinning until it made an audible whirl as it tore through the air, that sort of thing. In his boredom, he considered making nanobots that could amass themselves into his equipment under the direction of M4. He was already responsible for one theoretical apocalypse after all, what was one more? So long as they weren't self-replicating, and they were under the watchful eye of two people who had a vested interest in the world not ending, it couldn't possibly get that bad. His quirk had been surprisingly approving of that notion, causing him to spend the majority of his literature class designing and refining designs for nanobots. They would need to be strong enough to hold up under the face of quirks like All Might's, while also able to dissipate forces imparted upon themselves. They had to be as modular as possible while being easy to mass-produce. Under these design constraints, Izuku found himself uninterested in his work at school, quickly finishing the assigned work before returning to the problem that plagued his thoughts. His literature teacher, however, was suspicious of this activity. The paper that they were supposed to be peer-reviewing that class sat on the corner of his desk, already marked up, while he was furiously scribbling in his own notebook. Standing up from her desk, she made her rounds through the class, stopping by each student to take a look at the edits they had made on their classmates' work. Some of them were suspiciously empty, and she chided these students to do a more thorough analysis of the essays, while others needed to dial back the amount of overt criticism that they were giving and provide more constructive feedback. When she arrived behind Izuku's desk, she took a cursory glance at the paper he had marked up before looking at the project he was independently working on. Her quirk, which allowed her to put the pieces together from the information she was given, took a look at the slowly filling paper, and replied with a very final no. Taking a second look at what he was writing, she began to notice increasingly disturbing phrases. Self-replicating, maximum modularity, nanobot swarm, and other similarly disturbing phrases next to a variety of drawings, from cubes to triangular prisms to virus-like structures. With the most recent one he was working on a redesign of the triangular prism with a disturbing number of mathematical equations underneath the header magnetism. Running whether this was feasible by her quirk, the tentatively affirmative reply piqued her interest. She finished her rounds with several questions running through her head. When she finally returned to her desk, she went online instead of continuing to grade the papers from the last class and looked up the phrases she had seen. Thirty minutes and a deep dive down an internet rabbit hole later, she was unsure of what she should do. What responsibility did she have here? If one of her students, who was likely being bullied for his quirkless nature, was designing something that could easily cause the apocalypse, what was she supposed to do? Call home. Call the police or go to the hotline for quirk-related emergencies. File a report for the school. She put her head in her hands. She had never held this much responsibility before. For the first time, she thought she understood how heroines like All Might must feel, with the weight of countless lives on their shoulders. Forestalling the oncoming panic attack, she took a few deep breaths and squared her shoulders. The first thing she could do was talk to him, at the very least, and she could figure out what to do from there. Izuku was broken from his focus on designing his future equipment by the bell signaling the end of class. Flipping his notebook shut, he put it back into his bag and picked up his classmate's essay. As he placed it on the stack of papers that was forming on the teacher's desk, the teacher called out to him. Midoriya-sen, could you stay after class for a moment? I'd like to talk to you about something. Izuku's reply was wrote. Of course, Morino-sensei. Izuku ignored the calls and jeers from his other classmates, used to them by now. In ignoring them, however, he missed the way his teacher's face tightened and her shoulders tensed at every remark that was more than friendly banter that was thrown at him. He took a seat at one of the desks closest to the teachers as he waited for his classmates to leave the room. As soon as the last one had left, the teacher closed the door and walked over to him, pulling a chair from a nearby desk to sit across the desk from Izuku. Are you doing well, Midoriya-sen? Izuku was unprepared for this line of questioning, having expected something related to the class, some assignment he had done well or poorly on, or any number of other things. I'm doing fine, I guess. Why do you ask? Morino Yumi leaned forward slightly. Are you doing well mentally? Are you being bullied at school? Would you like to talk to the counselor? Izuku shook his head, confused. As far as I can tell, I'm perfectly okay mentally. The bullying isn't anything more than usual, even though school is as boring as ever. I don't believe I need to talk to the counselor. Morino-sensei, is something the matter? I took a glance at your notebook while I was looking at the essay that you had marked up, and my quirk had a negative reaction to the topics you were writing about. 
Do you understand how my quirk works? Izuku nodded, having done an in-depth analysis of her quirk on the second day of class. It's an analysis quirk with a variety of applications which allows you to draw connections between different sources of information, such as books and essays. Your quirk is similar to one in the local police force, except for the fact that you can't use your quirk on people. All in all, it's an excellent quirk for a teacher such as yourself to have. Momentarily startled by the depth of information her student of a little over two weeks had on her quirk, which she couldn't recall telling any of her classes about, she pushed onwards. I did some research on some of the phrases I was seeing, and I just want you to know that you can always talk to me if you need to. There are people that care about you and want you to succeed, even if they aren't as apparent as those that don't. By now Izuku had put the pieces together. Ah, now I understand. Don't worry about that Morino-sensei, that is just an extracurricular side project I've been thinking about. There's nothing to worry about, I know that there are people I can talk to if I need help. He swung his bag around one shoulder as he stood up. Moving to leave the classroom, he stopped at the door before turning around to give one last remark. Besides, I live in this world as well. Why would I want to cause the apocalypse? Izuku closed the door behind him. The reaction that he had gotten from his teacher was the exact opposite of what he wanted. While he wanted quirkless people to receive the same level of support and focus that everyone else did, he didn't want it to be out of fear. Going through the rest of the day, he was a lot more careful with who was able to see his designs, especially his teachers. When he got out of school, he made his way directly to Dagaba Beach. That day, he did little more than sit there and watch while continuing to refine his designs with added input from M4. Several days later, he had finished building a larger scale model of the finalized design for the nanobots. The model was the size of his palm and could exert relatively strong magnetic forces, operated on electrical energy, and was capable of transferring charge through contact. All that was left to do was make it smaller. By the end of the first week of October, he had finally produced enough of his nanobots to form an object that he could hold. They were colored metallic silver due to the conductive paint that he had run them through. He had also reached the critical threshold where the nanobots that he had created were capable of duplicating themselves, using their variable magnetism and electric current to cut through and fuse other metals into shape. Several hundred pounds of metal and three weeks later, he had enough nanobots to form a sort of armor for himself as well as a sword. He had experimented with creating nanobots that absorbed onaic energy, but the trade-off of functionality in every other aspect caused him to put the idea on the back burner for the time being. The problem was, all of the nanobots currently required a physical connection that led to the first one he had designed, the one that M4 had direct access to, as well as a source of power. These problems were quickly resolved by combining them into a single problem. Izuku created a duplicate of the original model that was small enough to hide as a pendant around his neck and had self-contained power generation. Most people would be nervous about the decision to put what amounted to a fusion bomb around their neck, but safe in the knowledge that it wouldn't have any failures for the next hundred years, Izuku couldn't care less. It also housed a copy of M4 dedicated solely to controlling the nanobots and communicating with M4's main body. It was capable of responding to verbal commands from Izuku in the event that it lost connection to M4, just in case that ever happened Izuku wanted to be left with some versatility. Several other nanobots with a connection to M4 were created, albeit without power generation, so that Izuku could detach parts of his equipment and move them with magnetic force while having them maintain their forms. His demonstration of the new gear to Melissa and Toshiko was met with equal parts horror and awe. At first, they had the same reaction as Yumi. But as they came around to the realization that the apocalypse would not be Izuku's fault, they moved on to testing the new gear. He finally had a sword that he could rely on and transport with him covertly, so he took some time to find the form that best suited him. Continuing his theme of using a two-handed sword, he settled on a double-edged blade nearly a meter, and a half in length. It would be unwieldy and impractical for most people in the era where swords were common weaponry, but Izuku was both significantly taller and stronger than the average person a thousand years ago. The sword was also much sharper than was possible back then, with a toothed edge of nanobots that would not dull easily, and with some effort on M4's part, could vibrate to increase its cutting power. Fortunately, it was not inherently lethal and could be reformed to have a blunted edge when he didn't want or need to cut through anything. For armor, Izuku had temporarily run a set of nanobots through colored conductive paint to match his skin tone before deploying them in a layer across his body. With the aid of his quirk, he found that they were capable of withstanding a point stress comparable to the punch of a quirkless person, though over the area that they could disperse this force opponents without a strength-enhancing quirk were unable to harm him through conventional means. The barriers that his armor could generate were by no means equal to the barrier sphere, but they were flexible enough that Izuku could still move while they were active. Despite the loss of potency, Izuku was happy to have gear as adaptive as his. For all that these advances had brought him, however, he was now incredibly vulnerable to electricity-based attacks because his skin was covered in metal. In a month, Izuku would be able to covertly purchase enough material to sew himself a non-conductive bodysuit to wear between himself 
and his second skin of nanobots. By the time he had finished the basics of his equipment, it was nearly Christmas time. As he did every year, Izuku and his mother spent a weekend making various chocolates and chocolate products, some to gift to the Bekugas, others as gifts to Izuku's teachers, and still more as snacks that would end up in small bowls around the house. This year, however, Izuku and Katsumi spent the set of making chocolates on their own, making a date out of it. Izuku had taken his mother's advice to heart, slowly and subtly returning Katsumi's feelings. He was planning to ask her out on New Year's Eve, formalizing the relationship that they had developed for the majority of their lives. Making chocolate was a time-intensive process that required a lot of patience and precision, as in co-purchased untempered chocolate wafers before tempering them by hand. Patience was not exactly something that his explosive friend exhibited, but when she was working in the kitchen with him she tried her best. As the two stood in front of the stove, each with one arm wrapped around the other, Izuku wondered for the hundredth time how it had taken someone who had never seen the two of them together to point out the fact that Katsumi had a crush on him. After the chocolate was melted, they developed a rhythm where one of them would dip things in the chocolate. Dried cherries, peanuts, almonds, cranberries, and so on, and the other would scoop them together into a decorative paper. After nearly four hours of the process, Katsumi was sitting at the kitchen table while Izuku finished heating the last batch of chocolate. The two of them finished the last batch together, submersing pretzels in the chocolate before setting them on a piece of parchment paper to dry. After they finished, the two of them sat next to each other, Izuku with his arm around Katsumi's shoulders while Katsumi rested her head on his right shoulder. As the two of them sat there in silence, Izuku felt the need to say something. Before he could settle on anything, though, he heard the soft sound of Katsumi snoring coming from close to his right ear. With his right arm, he pulled Katsumi closer to himself, hearing a pleased hum from her in her sleep. She had been training just as much and just as hard as he had, but she hadn't trained her body to need less sleep as he had. So while she was sleeping, Izuku wasn't going to wake her up. M4, through one of the many cameras that Izuku had placed around the house, took a picture of the couple to save for later. Several hours later, Izuku realized that Katsumi needed to be home in 15 minutes and was still asleep next to him. Fortunately, she was a heavy sleeper. Adjusting his grip, he picked her up and moved her to a position on his back with her head still resting on his right shoulder. He stood up, making sure that his movements wouldn't disturb her, packing an assortment of the chocolates into a plastic container before putting a jacket on around the two of them. The time he spent running from his house to Katsumi's was longer than usual, with Izuku adjusting his stride to reduce the impact that Katsumi received as much as possible. When he stepped through the door and removed his jacket, he turned around to see both Enko and Mitsuki staring at the two of them. Blushing lightly, he set the box of chocolate on the table the two of them were sitting at before carrying Katsumi upstairs to her room. It took some work to make her release her grip on him, but eventually, he and his mom left, returning to their house with merciless teasing from Inko. That week in school, he handed out small boxes of homemade chocolates to his teachers, thanking them for their work and their patience with his disinterest in the course material. It was fairly routine, though this year he was also giving gifts to other staff members like Ike Debunko. One of the boxes was different from the rest, however. The box for his literature teacher had a Petri dish that contained just over a tablespoon of nanobots, with the label reading in case of apocalypse, break glass. He had confirmed that this wouldn't be a bad idea, as the only thing the nanobots could do without a connection to power was to slide around their container. If they made contact with other nanobots and M4 wasn't connected to them, however, they would disable all connected nanobots, acting as a failsafe that couldn't be used against him. The day before Christmas Eve, Izuku was training with All Might and Melissa. He had finally finished his outfit, with his non-conductive layer shielding him from the stray sparks released by One for All. After Izuku set up several high-capture rate cameras around the training area for M4 to record with, the two of them began to duel once again. This time, however, they continued far beyond 40% of One for All. All Might steadily ramped up, increasing the pressure on Izuku until she reached 55%. From there, she slowed down, only increasing by a single percent every 30 seconds. Now that Izuku was no longer limited by his equipment, he began to consider new tactical ideas. He tested things that had been entirely theoretical, discarding those that failed and refining those that succeeded. He pushed his limits, reaching 63% in that fight before yielding. If he had been fighting with an edge on his blade, aiming to kill instead of incapacitate or land hits, he likely could have pushed her further. But then again All Might could just jump to 100% and wipe the floor with him if he tried such a thing. The two of them were happy with the outcome, and Melissa cheered the two of them on from her position on the sidelines. She had grown much stronger over the past three months, nearly a third of the way to being capable of inheriting one for all. She was no longer surprised by some of the feats that Izuku performed, having been around him for long enough to acclimate, but she still held him as the standard that she had to reach before she inherited one for all. For Christmas, Izuku made three small-scale holographic projectors that would play a recording of Izuku's latest duel with All Might at various speeds as controlled by the viewer. Two of them were gifted to Toshiko and Melissa, with the third wrapped up and set under his own Christmas tree for his mom. 
When she opened the gift, she watched it several times while Izuku provided context to how much of one for all Toshiko was using. After she finished, she tearfully hugged Izuku. The recording, more than any intrinsic value the projector held, was a promise to her. A promise that he would be strong enough to become a hero and protect himself while doing so. It was the best possible gift he could have given her. It was the evening of December 31st, and Izuku was seated next to Katsumi on a small couch in the basement of her house. The two were engaged in one of their oldest New Year's traditions. They stayed up until midnight watching old movies while their parents went to bed at a normal hour. This year, however, was different from all of the previous years. Instead of sitting on the various beanbags that they had accumulated in the basement, the two teenagers moved the small couch that usually sat in the living room downstairs to sit in front of the television. The two sat huddled together, sharing a blanket as Izuku wrapped one arm around his longtime friend. The two shared a collection of snacks as the clock ticked away, counting down the seconds until the year ended. The last movie that they had planned to watch, a classic film called Inception, had just ended, and neither of the two wanted to put another movie on with only 10 minutes left until midnight. Working up his courage, Izuku tried to put words to the feelings he'd been having for the past months. Hey, Kaken. Before he could even begin, he was cut off. Katsumi lifted her head from where it lay on his shoulder and lightly hit it into his upper arm. I've told you so many times to stop calling me that, Izuku. Izuku broke out a wistful smile. And when did I ever stop, Kaken? When did you ever really want me to stop? Katsumi was silent, paving the way for Izuku to continue. Anyways, Kaken, we've known each other for a long time. In fact, I can't remember not knowing you. But over the past few months, I felt like there was something. I can't find the words. Ah, screw it. Katsumi, would you like to be my girlfriend? At the beginning of Izuku's speech, Katsumi had tensed up in the darkness. She was hopeful, but prepared for so many different possibilities of what would happen next. A rejection, some clueless statement like he'd given her all of the time she'd tried to show him her appreciation of him. The request to be his girlfriend was beyond any of those, and after freezing for a moment, she jerked into motion, moving from her position next to Izuku to one facing him, sitting on his lap, arms wrapped around him. You idiot. Why did you phrase it like that? You had me worried for a second there. Of course. Izuku wrapped his arms around his best friend no. Girlfriend. He mentally corrected himself, returning the hug. The two stayed in that position for a minute, sitting in the darkness of the basement with only the light of the DVD player's digital clock. Eventually, Katsumi loosened her grip around him and pulled her face from where she had buried it in his chest. You don't know how long I've been waiting for you to ask me that, Izuku. However, there's one correction I'll have to make. Izuku smiled into the darkness. And what correction would that be, Kaken? She moved her head upwards, resting it on Izuku's shoulder before whispering into his ear. I'm not your girlfriend, you're my boyfriend. Doesn't that work both ways? Izuku asked, unsure of why she had felt the need to say that. Maybe it does. But you've been mine much longer than I've been yours. Izuku shook his head. He was pretty sure he knew what Katsumi meant, but he wasn't going to use his quirk to confirm that. After all, he had made a promise and he intended to keep it. Besides, it wasn't worth it to get into a pointless argument with his girlfriend less than five minutes after they'd formalized their relationship. He looked at the clock, which shifted from 2358 to 2359 while he watched. Izuku leaned down slightly so that he could whisper into Katsumi's ear, as she had done to him mere moments ago. It's almost midnight, Kaken. In a feat of flexibility, Katsumi twisted her head to look up at his face while keeping the rest of her body in place to look at the clock. And, Izuku laughed briefly. You'll have to get up and go to bed soon, Kaken. I have to go to the guest room and get some sleep. Katsumi mentally shook her head. That wasn't what he was supposed to say. He was supposed to say something about a New Year's kiss, but clearly, he hadn't thought of that like she had the past years they'd done this. She leaned back, judging roughly where his face was before leaning forwards and pulling him into a kiss. Neither of them had ever kissed someone before, and Izuku wasn't expecting this to happen so quickly. It was perhaps not as good as it could have been, but it was just the two of them, together at last, and that made all the difference. When Katsumi leaned back, breaking the kiss, she had an incredibly large smile on her face. Izuku's stuttering attempts to ask a question or say something were like music to her ears. Perhaps she'd have to educate her boyfriend on how he was supposed to act, but that didn't matter too much. So long as they were together, very little mattered to her right then. Maybe I don't want to go to bed, Izuku. Maybe I just want to fall asleep right here. Her declaration was followed by using her superior strength to twist sideways, pulling Izuku so that his head lay on one of the low-lying armrests of the couch with her lying on top of him. Her hands were trapped beneath the two of them, still wrapped around Izuku, ensuring that they would have to both want to get up for either of them to move. Izuku sighed. Perhaps this wasn't how he'd thought the night would end, but it was still better than what he had hoped for. Maneuvering one of his arms from where Katsumi was doing her best to pin it to his side, he grabbed the blanket from where it had fallen and tossed it in the air so that it would land on the two of them. He leaned forwards, gently kissing Katsumi's forehead where it rested. Happy New Year, Kaken. Happy New Year, Izuku. 
and with that, Katsumi settled in for the best sleep she had had in years. The next morning, Izuku woke up early, having reached the five hours of sleep that he had been routinely getting for the past decade. Before he even opened his eyes, he felt the warm weight on his chest and the memories of last night came flooding to the front of his mind. The movies, the question, the kiss, all of it woke him up faster than the shower he took normally did. Underneath his back, he could feel where Katsumi's hands were resting, lower than they had been when he had fallen asleep. Trying to move his legs was met with a similar restriction, his girlfriend having wrapped her legs about halfway down his thighs in her sleep. After trying various ways to gently extricate himself from Katsumi's grasp were met with failure, Izuku ran his first question of the day by his quirk. It is possible to get off of the couch without waking up Katsumi. Foss. Izuku sighed, leaning back. It looked like he would be trapped here for a while, slightly less than two and a half hours going by his quirk, but it was a fate that he would happily accept. Relaxing his muscles, he leaned back and enjoyed the peace of the position he was in. When Katsumi eventually woke up, the first thing that she noticed was how warm she was. She was never able to fall back asleep after she woke up on a normal day because of how cold she was. Before she went to bed at night, she would work up a sweat before detonating hundreds of tiny explosions to increase the temperature of the room. In her sleep, she curled into a ball with her covers over her as the heat slowly dissipated, waking up cold and in need of a hot shower before she would feel normal again. Now, however, she was in a distinctly different position. She wasn't curled up into a ball per se, but she was still warmer than usual. The next thing that she noticed was that her hands, forearms, and feet felt asleep. It was an odd sensation, something that she rarely experienced, but if anything they were warmer than the rest of her. The third and final thing that she noticed before she opened her eyes was that whatever warm object she was wrapped around was moving, and through her left ear she could hear a distinct rhythmic thumping noise. Opening her eyes, she found that she wasn't lying in her room like she had expected, with her field of vision occupied by the television that she knew was in the basement. Looking downwards without moving her head, she saw a green t-shirt that she connected somewhere in her mind as being one of Izuku's. Suddenly, all of the dots connected in her mind. The rhythmic moving and thumping became breathing and a heartbeat, the source of hate wearing a shirt became her best friend, and finally, as she remembered the events of last night, her boyfriend. When she chanced a glance upwards to tell if he was awake, she realized that she couldn't see anything more than the bottom of his chin. Trying to get up, she pulled it where her hands were pinned underneath their combined weights. Despite the lack of success that she had, she got Izuku's attention, causing him to move his head so that he could see her. A smile, a good morning, and some maneuvering later, the two of them had separated from each other and Katsumi left the basement for her morning shower. Inko came over for breakfast that morning, and the two of them weathered the motherly teasing in silence together before they parted ways. In the following months, the two of them kept the latest development of their relationship quiet from the rest of the school through a combination of Katsumi's social awareness and Izuku's constant use of his quirk. Classes were markedly better than before, with attempts at bullying Izuku or other quirkless people shut down much more actively than before. They weren't any more interesting, to be fair, but they were at least tolerable. This was an unintended side effect of one of Izuku's previous actions, his additional gift for his literature teacher, Morino Yumi. After school that day, when the rest of the teachers were meeting to review the semester, she had brought up her previous interactions with Izuku, the sealed container of nanobots, and the potential danger that her quirk had guided her to the knowledge of. The chemistry teacher, Nakagawa AI, had put the Petri dish under a high-powered microscope and confirmed that they matched one of the designs that Yumi had recreated. Seeing as Izuku hadn't exactly broken any laws and the kinds of regulation that would have applied to women with quirks were inapplicable to him, the group of teachers had agreed to enforce the policy in a way that Izuku and others like him wouldn't feel the need to cause the apocalypse because they were bullied for something they couldn't control. While the rest of the 15 quirkless people attending Aldera High were delighted by the changes, Izuku had quickly deduced the reason for the shift and didn't know how to feel. On the one hand, he had accomplished the very kind of thing he wanted to do as a hero, but it felt empty. Sure, he wasn't being bullied in class anymore, but having to hold a potential apocalypse over the heads of school teachers to make such a relatively small change wasn't the way he wanted to do things. If he instilled fear into people over the potential that quirkless people held, it would likely only lead to further discrimination against them. On the scale of 2,000 people who respected a common authority, that worked perfectly well. Globally, there was no chance of achieving anything through fear. It was an eye-opening experience for him, and he was grateful that it had happened now instead of several years down the line. He had taken the time afterwards over the following weeks to refine his approach, embodying his future hero name of Paragon. He would become the shining example that people looked up to, synonymous with the term hero in a way that All Might currently was. It would be a more difficult path to walk than becoming the strongest and enforcing his wishes, although both of them were very similar in their preparation. He would face more challenges and have more put in his way by others to overcome, but the victory he would eventually achieve would be more true this way. The days blurred by, a cycle of school, training, spending time with Katsumi, and working on improving his technology before going to bed and repeating the whole process again. 
One day, however, he received an email from the school, something that only rarely happened. Upon opening it, he received a welcome surprise. He was declared the valedictorian of his class, and he was invited to give a speech at the graduation ceremony. A smile crept up Izuku's face upon reading this, and after turning to M4S projection he saw a similar look on a projection of Masaru's face. He rose from his chair, opened the message on his phone, and made his way as quickly as he could without running to his mother's office, knocking twice before pushing open the ajar door. He handed her his phone, and when she finished reading, she tossed the phone to the side, catching it with her quirk as soon as it was out of the way, and gave her son a hug, tears of joy escaping her closed eyelids. They held a small celebration that night, with the family discussing how he should write his speech. He had initially been thinking of just writing a generic praise of the school before giving more detailed and personal thanks to the teachers that had supported him, working these points in with the general narrative of his time at the school. And while the format remained mostly the same, both M4 and Inko had suggested potential edits to his idea. Inko told him that the general praise wasn't necessary, that the speech was supposed to be about his experience and how it was distinct from everyone else's. M4, however, brought up the valid point that people would find this video once he became a hero, putting the pieces together from the limited publicly available information. He suggested including a message in there for the future, telling a greater narrative than just his time at the school. Izuku considered both suggestions before including both of them in his original plan to some extent. Katsumi was just as happy for him as Inko was when he told her. The two of them were at their favorite park, this time not to train but to relax and watch other people go about their days. To her enjoyment, Izuku gave a parody of his planned speech, exaggerating his problems with the school and crediting all of his success to my beautiful girlfriend. They sat quietly for a while after that, lamenting that their childhood was almost over. Izuku. Yes, Kaken. Do you still plan on applying to UA? Izuku sighed. He generally tried to avoid bringing up the subject in the past after her reaction to the counselor's reveal of his choice of college. Still, he had good reasons for his decision, and he hoped that Katsumi wouldn't try too hard to stop him. Yes, I do. I told you, Kaken, I. Katsumi cut him off. I know, Izuku. I've been thinking about it, and I was a lot harsher than I meant to be when Yasutake Sensei first told me that you planned to go to UA. I just wanted you to be safe, and I definitely overreacted. I know you can get into the support course if you want to. After all, you'll do better than me on any written test they have, and with them four. She trailed off, but the unspoken words were clear as day. They'd be fools to turn you away. Izuku put his arm around Katsumi's shoulders, causing her to continue speaking. I just don't want you to get hurt, Izuku. Can you promise me that you'll stay safe? Izuku smiled wryly. I can't promise that I'll never get hurt, Katsumi. You know how easy it is to cut yourself on sharp edges, how easily things can go wrong when you try to build something new. I can't make such an unreasonable promise. I will, however, do my best to avoid any major injuries, and I've got a special surprise that I'm working on for you. Before Katsumi could ask what it was, Izuku continued. It isn't ready yet, but by the time the entrance exams roll around it will be ready. Not to spoil it too much, but it is perhaps the ultimate safety feature. Katsumi made a noise that was between a sigh of relief and a huff of frustration. She knew that Izuku knew how little she liked either surprises or waiting for things, but for Izuku and her overarching goal of keeping him safe, she would put her feelings aside as best she could. Okay, Izuku. Just, I worry, you know. Izuku's smile widened. Using the arm wrapped around his girlfriend's shoulders for leverage, he picked Katsumi up from her seat next to him on the bench and swung her around into his arms for a hug. I know, Kaken. I worry about you too. We're just looking out for each other as best we can, and I don't fault you for it at all. The pair sat there in silence for a few moments before Katsumi started to squirm, trying to break free from Izuku's embrace. Unfortunately for her, her significant strength advantage was rendered useless by the position she was in, leaving her trapped with him for a full minute before he let go. The days came and went, with Izuku continuing his cycle of school, training with Melissa, improving the variety and quantity of nanobots at his disposal, and spending time with Katsumi. Graduation finally arrived, and Izuku was seated near the front of the crowd in the school's auditorium, his family name putting him just after halfway through the class when sorted by alphabetical order. With the class split into two sections based on that order, Izuku considered himself lucky to be sitting front and center instead of far in the back. The opening speech from the principal came and went, followed by others, previous graduates, department heads, and so on, before it finally became time for Izuku to take the podium. Ignoring the whispers of the crowd and the glaring lights shining at him, Izuku looked out across the audience that he had been a part of moments earlier. The student body was not much more than a sea of heads, some of whom he recognized more fondly than others. In the higher risers were the parents of almost every student present. With a combination of his quirk and his own observations, he quickly located the seat that his mom was sitting in, camera in hand to record the moment. Clearing his throat, Izuku leaned forwards and began to speak. Four years ago, if you had asked me whether I would enjoy my time at Aldera High School, the answer probably would have been a resounding no. 
I had very few friends that were coming with me in the class size quintupled. It was a daunting prospect to be sure, but I've learned that not everything in life is easy or fair. Eighteen years ago, when I was born, one single sentence was decided for me. I would never have a quirk. This is the reality that about 8% of the population faces at birth, and 20% total experiences throughout their lives. Not having a quirk made my life harder for sure. I couldn't be popular in school. I couldn't relate to more than one in five of my classmates at the most, and I had to find and at times create my own path in life instead of having it laid out for me at four years of age. But in a way, I'm glad that things turned out the way they have. The muttering that had been building in the audience was silenced by the shift in the direction of his speech. Not having a path laid out for me, not having the expectations and pressure from others to learn and do certain things gave me the opportunity to explore my options. When I was four, I was stuck in the hospital for a few days and one of the doctors there, who will remain nameless at their request, was kind enough to bring me a pen and paper to draw with. In the following years, I became an artist. The community center near my house was booked out for a week of the summer every year just for me to sit there and draw while people looked at my artwork. Some of you may not see that as I did, or as any quirkless person would. It was the first time that I had ever truly felt appreciated for something that I had done by anyone other than my mother. Throughout my earlier years of schooling, art was perhaps the only class that I truly enjoyed. When I came to Aldera, I had my mind set on those classes as havens, where people wouldn't see Midoriya Izuku, the corkless, but they would just see me for who I am. I would like to thank all of my art teachers, from Kishi-sensei of Haruki Preschool to Koizumi-sensei of Aldera High School, for helping me along to where I am today. Even without asking any questions, Izuku could tell the question that was on everyone else's mind. Here he was, the valedictorian of his class, and he wasn't talking about his academics at all. Art, perhaps the most subjective subject of all, was what he was spending his time talking about. Where was the disconnect? Fortunately for their curiosity, Izuku had planned his speech for that question inevitably coming up. Letting out a brief laugh, he addressed it directly. Even now, some of you are putting me in the box of valedictorian. Corkless, artist, and so many others. You listen to my words but you aren't hearing them. None of the boxes you can try to fit me in will truly describe who I am. I used art as an example because you can't lie when you create something, not to yourself. The people who see my art see a glimpse of who I truly am, able to ignore the labels that they subconsciously put on me. This isn't to say that art is all that I am. I have spent countless hours learning, studying, and preparing both in and out of school to be standing on this podium today, even though that wasn't the reason I did any of that. But a speech about all of that wouldn't be my speech. It could just as easily come from one of the many people who worked just as hard as I did throughout their years at school. The story I'm telling you today isn't the valedictorian story, it's mine. It's the story of a boy without direction that became the man standing before you all today. It's the differences between myself and everyone else that make me unique, just as everyone sitting before me is unique in their own ways. The path that everyone took to sit here today is different, and that is what makes us our own people instead of copies of one another. If there's one lesson that you take away from this speech, let it be that. Don't feel pressured to accomplish something because other people expect it of you. If I'd done that, I wouldn't be who I am today, standing before the rest of you. I would like to credit my success to my mother first and foremost, followed by the people who have stood with me throughout my life, and finally everyone who believed in me, who saw me as more than just quirkless. Thank you. With a slight bow to the audience, Izuku left the podium, earning a wave of polite applause with more enthusiastic applause from certain people in the audience. The ceremony proceeded as normal, with the students cycling across the stage, receiving their diplomas from their teachers before returning to their seats. Less than two hours later, Izuku and Katsumi were walking out of the school for the final time, never to return. Both were clad in their graduation gowns and caps, cords around their shoulders to signify their academic accomplishments. Izuku's robe showed subtle signs of alteration seeing as the company that supplied robes for their graduation carried robes fit for someone Katsumi's height, and not people a head taller than her. Sewing, fortunately, was among the first of the many skills that Izuku had learned over the years, and unless one was looking for the seam it was nearly unnoticeable. That night, the two families celebrated their children's graduation at the Midoriya's house, with Inko and Mitsuki preparing the best katsudan and spicy tempera chicken that they had ever made with the helpful advice of M4. While they were doing this, Izuku and Katsumi were in the room that Izuku had taken over years ago to paint in. Months ago, Katsumi had mentioned trying to paint with Izuku, wanting to try her hand at one of his favorite activities as he so often did for her. Izuku was trying to capture the feeling of graduation in his painting, to immortalize the feeling of today for his future self to look back on. Katsumi had a much humbler goal, to draw Izuku while he was painting. By the time dinner was ready, neither of them was anywhere close to finished. After a peaceful celebratory dinner, the two of them returned to the room while their mothers went to bed. Izuku's drawing was similar to the view he had from the podium, capturing the glare of the lights aimed at the stage and the individual people in the audience, but also distinctly different. There was a diploma sitting on the podium, just barely visible in the center of the bottom of the painting. 
The microphone was smaller than it was to avoid blocking members of the audience. Notes were sitting underneath the diploma, the line it's the differences between myself, and everyone else that make me unique, just as everyone sitting before me is unique in their own ways visible to the viewer. Most importantly, however, was the pronounced presence of several members of the audience, namely Katsumi, Inko, Mitsuki, Shizuka, and his own empty chair. They weren't drawn in a way that made them distinct from the rest of the audience. Rather, the painting seemed to gravitate towards those elements, drawing the viewer to look at them. Katsumi, at almost the same time, was almost finished with her drawing of Izuku. It was nothing extravagant or noteworthy, simply a pencil drawing of him in the way that he had drawn her so many years ago when he was in the hospital. It wasn't the technique that mattered though. Anyone could draw a picture of him, but only Katsumi could draw this picture of him. It was like he said just hours ago, you couldn't truly lie to yourself when you created something, and Izuku could clearly see her understanding of who he was in the drawing. Now standing behind her, Izuku waited until she lifted her hand from the paper, and then placed his forearms on her shoulders, leaning forwards to rest his chin on his right arm. Other people might have been startled by the sudden presence of someone behind them, but Katsumi had grown used to him over the years, especially in the past five months. She merely turned her head to give him a look before setting her pencil down. Perhaps her drawing of Izuku wasn't finished, but that didn't matter to her. She still kept one of Izuku's unfinished drawings from preschool at her house, the paper yellowing but intact. She moved to look at Izuku's painting as it dried, pulling him with her as he maintained his position behind her. The pair stood in silence for a minute, enjoying the painting and each other's company. The piece was broken by Katsumi, who spoke without turning her head to face Izuku. I'll never understand how you gave that speech today. Unseen to her, Izuku mock pouted. What do you mean, Kaken? That speech was straight from the bottom of my heart. I can't believe you would slander me in such a way. Katsumi snorted in amusement. That's exactly what I'm talking about, Mr. I can't find the words. You tried to be so profound, giving out pieces of wisdom when I know you couldn't care less about 90% of the people in that room. I walk my own path, nobody can be described by putting them in boxes, everyone is unique. You know full well that they'll remember that for maybe a few days before they forget everything about high school, and go back to whatever they were doing. Izuku shook his head, knowing that even if she couldn't see it she would feel it through her shoulder. Just because I can't make them listen to me or follow my advice doesn't mean that I shouldn't try, Kaken. I'm sure that some people will take my advice to heart, even if it's someone entirely unrelated who hears about it secondhand or sees a recording. Katsumi turned and slowly started walking towards the living room, keeping Izuku where he was relative to her. When they reached the couch, she made to sit down, forcing Izuku to sit down as well beneath her. As she made herself comfortable sitting on Izuku's lap, Izuku shifted his arms from resting on her shoulders to gently wrapped around her stomach. Katsumi sighed as she leaned backwards, her hair tickling Izuku's neck as he placed his chin atop her head. Putting your altruism aside, it's nice to finally be done with high school. No more social jockeying, no more boring homework, no more idiots. I'm looking forwards to the entrance exams for UA. Speaking of which, what are you planning to do for the support course exam? Izuku laughed for a few seconds before replying. I don't know about no more idiots, Kaken. Just because they're heroes in training doesn't mean that they'll be any more reasonable. In fact, some of them will probably be even worse than our former classmates. As for the support exam, Izuku trailed off. Kaken, you know that M4 is an AI, right? Katsumi nodded lightly, enjoying the vibration of Izuku's chest behind her when he spoke. Hasn't he always been? Even when he was M2. Unsurprised, Izuku began to explain. There's a difference between what people call AI and artificial intelligence, Kaken. There's a bit of philosophy that I could go into, but I'll try to sum it up because I know it bores you. In short, the difference between an artificial intelligence and a virtual assistant is the ability to have original thoughts. M2 and M3 could only react to what I was saying or follow directions that I gave them. M4, however, could independently look up a villain, track down their location, and report it to the police or a hero on a whim without any direction from me. If you want to, we could do it tonight from my room. M4, simply put, has the capability to be the evil AI from any book or movie. He's something that surpasses the level of technology employed by anyone else in the world, and I can't see UA refusing me from the support course if they know even a percent of his capabilities. Katsumi hummed, eyes closed as she leaned back into the warmth of her boyfriend. A few seconds later, her eyes snapped open. Wait, what? You can have M4 track down any villain whenever you want. Why haven't you gotten rid of every villain in Japan? In the world, Izuku shook his head. It isn't so simple, Kaken. Imagine this, you're an average civilian, either quirkless or with a very weak quirk. Overnight, the government arrests every known villain in Japan. People who haven't committed any crimes yet but plan to or sent warnings. Maybe one of your friends was actually a small-time villain who got arrested. How would you feel? She pondered the question for a moment, quickly arriving at the conclusion that Izuku was trying to guide her toward. 
I would feel like the government was watching me, and I would probably move away from Japan or go to the countryside and become a hermit. Why can't anything be simple? Izuku laughed again. If either of us could have done it without consequences we already would have. We can, however, do small things like finding one of the worst offenders every once in a while. Whenever you want to get up, I'm sure that M4 would be happy to help you. Think of it as a graduation gift from me. Having always dreamt of being a heroine, Katsumi wasn't about to wait. Moving her hands underneath Izuku's thighs, she swung her body forwards. What followed was a rather comical scene. Katsumi, who stood nearly 171 centimeters tall with a lightly muscled figure was carrying Izuku on her back, who was almost exactly 2 meters tall with a much larger frame and proportional musculature. Excitedly, she made her way to the stairs, Izuku ducking to avoid hitting his head on the ceiling as she took the steps two at a time. In a display of strength and flexibility, Izuku bent backward to pass under the door frame as they entered his room, turning on the light switch and sitting back up in anticipation of his girlfriend's next actions. With a twist, Katsumi threw Izuku towards his bed, leaping into his desk chair and spinning around twice before stopping and facing the computer. All right M4, let's hunt some villains. The dark screen flicked to life, displaying an empty desktop. Over the next few seconds, a window opened with a growing list of names and a rapidly shrinking scroll bar. Eventually, a bar appeared at the top of the window, reading recognized active Japanese criminals, 38,271, sort by, recent. Katsumi clicked on the sort by, option, revealing a list of possibilities, including strength, the severity of their crimes, alphabetical order, and several others. She selected severity, and the page quickly refreshed to reveal the new order. As Izuku sat up, she selected the criminal at the top of the list, opening a new window listing the crimes committed by the villain, a woman by the name of Reaper. Izuku picked Katsumi up off of the chair before sliding in underneath her, looking at the information collected on the villain. She had been identified as a serial killer, with hundreds of murders credited to her over the past five years. For all that she had killed hundreds of people, she had a relatively small presence, only appearing for brief periods before going back into hiding. Little was known about her quirk or her appearance, which led to a lack of heroes both willing and able to take on such an unknown villain. M4, see what you can find about Reaper. Videos are best if you can get them, but images will work just as well, and if you could get a list of the locations displayed on a map that would be helpful. After a few minutes, a set of windows showing videos appeared on the screen along with M4S voice. Here are all of the videos that I found that are at least 90% certain to be Reaper. I'll bring up the map whenever you tell me to, Izuku. With that, Katsumi settled back against Izuku as he leaned forwards and clicked on the first video chronologically. She knew what was going to happen now. Izuku would work his way through the videos, just as he did of their sparring, and would pick out as much information as possible. There were 16 videos and an album of over 700 photos on the screen, and by the time Izuku had finished the first three videos he had begun to write an analysis of Reaper on one of the pieces of paper on his desk. Two videos later, he had completed his analysis and after muting the volume he started all the rest of the videos simultaneously, only pausing one of them to look at in more detail later. Quickly clicking through the album of photos, Izuku assembled the visible fragments of her face in his mind's eye before drawing a quick sketch of her face on the paper, extrapolating for the missing pieces. Fifteen minutes after the search began, Izuku lightly shook Katsumi from where she had been dozing off to look at the results. Reaper's quirk, by Izuku's analysis, was one of the more esoteric ones. Every time she killed someone, she absorbed a portion of their onaic energy and added it to her system. It retained some of the traits from the original person, giving her a vastly weakened version of their quirk if it was a mitter type. It allowed her to grow stronger very quickly at the cost of other people's lives. Her face carried no distinct features as far as Izuku had seen. After Izuku asked M4 to display the map, dots began to appear on a map of Japan in chronological order. After the first hundred or so, Izuku began to notice a pattern and by the last fifty, he was accurately predicting where the next one would show up. When they stopped appearing, Izuku clicked a location on the map. M4, if I'm right this will be where the Reaper strikes next, anywhere from three to seven days from now. Do you see the same pattern that I did? Katsumi was confused. What pattern? Izuku broke out of his state of focus at the sound of Katsumi's voice. She follows a sort of 11-pointed star pattern, rotating around as the center point moves around the country. I don't know if it's conscious or subconscious, but the only exceptions to this pattern are when she gets caught up in a fight with heroines as she travels. As soon as M4 finishes looking at the pattern, I'll ask him to display it for you. Several minutes later, the map restarted with an overlay featuring the 11-pointed star, and a trail representing the center of the star. Now that it was so clearly displayed, Katsumi easily saw the pattern as Izuku had. She shook her head in disbelief. If only Izuku was a girl with a quirk, he could easily become one of the top 10 regardless of what the quirk actually was with such deductive abilities. In the meantime, Izuku was scrolling through a list of heroines in the general area, seeing which of them would be capable of taking down Reaper at her next appearance. Fortunately for him, the number 5 heroine Edshots agency was located less than 2 miles from where the next attack should occur. 
Typing up his analysis of Reaper's quirk and having M4 upload his collated drawing of her face, Izuku compiled a folder of information about her and the known quirks of her victims that she had displayed in the videos, letting M4 fill in the list of the rest of her potential quirk remnants. Over the next few minutes, he typed out a description of the pattern he had found and uploaded recordings of the maps, both with and without the overlay. Less than half an hour after Katsumi had chosen their target, Izuku had all but put the final nail in the coffin for her. He opened his burner email account and uploaded the folder, titling it Reaper and typing a brief description of its contents. He then leaned against the back of his chair, the email ready to send. Moving the mouse towards the hand Katsumi was resting on the desk, Izuku spoke with a smile in his voice. Happy graduation, Kaken. Thank you, Izuku. With that, she clicked send. Four days later, the story of Edshot's successful capture of Reaper made national news, with the heroine's agency crediting an anonymous informant for providing critical information leading to her capture. It was a wonderful gift, one that Katsumi wasn't sure she could match. She would certainly do her best. Melissa Shield POV Melissa had come a long way over the past eight months, and she knew it. When Izuku returned on the second day of her training with the schedule laid out for the upcoming months, she was only comforted by the knowledge that Izuku's pseudo-quirk wouldn't have made him give her an impossible training schedule. To her surprise, the plan left her tired at the end of each day but unaffected for the next day, ending each exercise just before she felt that she shouldn't push herself any further. The time spent clearing the so-called beach of garbage was monotonous but rewarding. Sure, it got boring to move the hundredth broken microwave or thousandth trash bag, but every square meter of sand revealed assured her that her actions were worth it. On the easier days, she spent her extra time talking with Izuku and M4. Both were more knowledgeable than her when it came to technology and support gear, which was something she was only used to from her father. The few times that Aunt might stop by to listen in on their conversations, she ended up zoning in the first five minutes. Izuku's nanobot armor was certainly impressive, but the background required to both build and operate it was far more than she had. Instead, she spent her time designing her own support gear and, after Izuku had his nanobots reshape scavenged metal to her specifications, building it. The main challenge for her was adaptability. Antmite's active state was far larger than her inactive one and she had only a minimal idea of how she would change when she went between forms. Still, she did her best and in her opinion, the gear that she had completed was up to the standard of durability that she would need when fighting with one for all. The stronger she became, however, the more she realized the difference between herself and Izuku. Recently, she had reached a level of strength similar to his, something that she was very proud of. When she had tried to spar against Ant Might, however, she wasn't even able to beat her at 5% of one for all. She was using her support gear and the skill that she had been taught by both of her teachers, but All Might's experience and tripled strength were simply an insurmountable barrier. Today, however, was the day she had been working towards for the past eight months. The schedule that Izuku had laid out for her ended today, only containing a single line. Inherit one for all. She was fidgeting as she waited with Ant Might for Izuku to arrive. He had graduated recently, so he theoretically had all day to train. In reality, however, he still spent significant amounts of time with his mom and his girlfriend, leaving him with a varying schedule from day to day. After nearly half an hour of waiting, Izuku finally arrived, dressed in workout clothes with his customary backpack full of nanobots. Ant Might pulled a strand of hair from her head in a water bottle, telling her to drink it before Izuku stopped her. Out of one of the external pouches of his backpack, he pulled a transparent pill-shaped capsule and a syringe. He carefully instructed Ant Might on how to safely draw the blood from her arm and inject it into the capsule before handing the blood pill to her. It was strange to think about drinking blood, but it was certainly much easier to take a pill and wash it down with a drink of water than to eat a piece of hair. Every 15 minutes that day, Izuku took a sample of her blood to study the process of her body replacing the dead bar body that she was born with and the formation of the new organelle and its energy network. By the end of the day, she could feel the new energy coursing through her and her left arm was sore from the repeated blood samples that Izuku had taken. Still, though, she was happy. She had taken the most important step she ever would in becoming a hero. Bakugu Katsumi woke up to the incessant beeping of her alarm clock and rolled out of bed, making her way to the shower to relieve the cold that permeated her limbs while she slept. When she fully woke up, halfway through her shower, she realized why she had set her alarm so early on this summer day. Today was the day of the entrance exams for UA. Suddenly aware of the time that she was wasting, she hurriedly finished her shower and rushed through the rest of her morning routine before taking the stairs two at a time downwards, headed for breakfast. Her mother was sitting at the kitchen table, nursing a mug of coffee and looking blearily at Katsumi, as she worked up a sweat, using minute explosions to propel herself around the kitchen. She was preparing two breakfasts for herself, one that was healthy and one that could only barely be called a breakfast by anyone else's standards. She was cooking eggs on the stove, scrambled due to her lack of patience, while she was filling a set of four glasses with water. By the time she sat at the table, the difference between her breakfasts was readily apparent. 
One was perfectly normal, eggs on toast with a glass of milk. The other was a combination of four glasses of water and as much sugar as she could pack into the lowest volume of food possible. While the first breakfast was to fuel her body, the other was engineered by Izuku to give her quirk the most easily convertible materials for her nitroglycerin sweat. Scarfing down her breakfast before her mother even finished half of her cup of coffee, she called out her goodbyes before making her way to the front door. As her mother grumbled good luck, the doorbell rang. Katsumi's face broke out into a smile. There was only one person that would be at her door this early in the morning. She threw open the door, ready to greet her boyfriend before she stopped abruptly. Sitting outside her front door to the right was Izuku, and on the left of the door was Izuku. She was pretty sure that there hadn't been any hallucinogens in her breakfast, and if Izuku had a secret twin brother all along she would have found out before now. Izuku. Both Izukus had looked up at the sound of the door opening. Fortunately, only the Izuku on the left responded to his name. Yes, Kakan. What is? Katsumi gestured to the two of them, unsure of how to word her question. Fortunately for her, Izuku caught the intent behind her question. This is the surprise that I was talking about, Kakin. This is how I will be able to keep myself safe at all times. After all, why should I need to be physically present for anything dangerous if I have M4? We've decided that we're going to call him Midoriya in that body, but if you come up with a better name we're all ears. Besides, now I can refer to myself in the plural, which is incredibly fun. The Izuku to the right of the door, which Katsumi mentally corrected to Midoriya, spoke up. Of course, this body isn't as durable as we'd like it to be, but what it lacks in sheer toughness it retains in regenerative capability. Observe. With that, Midoriya raised his right hand in front of him whereupon it quickly disintegrated and fell to the walkway leading up to Katsumi's house. Katsumi recoiled backward at the sight, taking a moment to remember that her boyfriend's hand was perfectly intact, and that he was standing on the other side of her. Once she got over the fact that there was no blood and realized that the inside of Midoriya's wrist was a blend of metallic colors, it was actually quite an interesting process to watch. Midoriya stepped forward, placing his right foot on the pile of nanobots that used to be his hand. The pile rapidly shrunk, and after a small delay, Midoriya's hand started to regrow at a similar rate, forming a skeletal structure before expanding into a metal copy of Izuku's hand. Spots of color began to reappear and spread and less than 10 seconds after the process had started it was over with no visible difference on Midoriya's body. I won't go into exactly how it works right now, seeing as we have an exam to head to, but so far it's as realistic of a copy or myself as we could make with the time we had. He doesn't exactly need to breathe or blink, but we've managed to make him simulate it as closely as possible. Izuku was clearly excited at the unveiling of his latest creation, but he had a point that the two of them were on a schedule that morning. The three of them walked to the nearest train station, Izuku and Midoriya carrying backpacks over their shoulders while Katsumi was unburdened. The discussion turned to the exams, and while they were in the train station Izuku made a joking comment about taking two exams at once that caused the speculation about what the exams would be on to derail. What do you mean, you're taking two exams at once? Aren't you just bringing Midoriya for the support exam? Izuku was willing to acknowledge that Katsumi had a valid point. Still, he had already come up with an idea for how he would react. If I want to make sure that I'll be accepted into the support course, I know that I'll have to do better than every other candidate there and then some. You know how most people are. So, one of us will be in the support exam room, and the other will be showing off our support gear. What better support gear is there, after all, than an undefeatable hero? Katsumi gave a slow, grudging nod. I suppose that's true, but is it really you taking two different exams then? It's not you controlling Midoriya, but M4 from your house. Not for the first time that day, a slightly mischievous smile spread across Izuku's face. But you see, Kaken, we are the same person. We even share the same name. How could we possibly be any different from each other? Katsumi groaned, lightly punching Izuku in the shoulder. Perhaps he found it funny, but for her, it was already getting old. The three got off of the train several minutes later, only to be greeted by the veritable swarm of people streaming through the entrance to UA for the entrance exams. The three of them split up, each making their way through the crowd using their unique methods. Midoriya simply bent his body in ways that a contortionist would shudder at, making his way through the smallest gaps between other people. Katsumi used a less subtle approach, creating small explosions to get other people's attention, and scare them out of her way as she took a direct approach to the gate. Izuku, on the other hand, simply walked forwards, taking the steps that would take him where he wanted to be as fast as possible. Izuku and Midori arrived faster than Katsumi, though not by a large margin. Still, the two of them managed to switch positions relative to where they had started because Izuku would be taking the hero exam no matter what. There was no way that he would strive for anything less than the highest goal he could reach, and if it took a minor amount of misdirection he was perfectly willing to face the consequences of his actions later. When Katsumi eventually caught up with the two of them, Midoriya said his goodbyes as if he was Izuku before heading off to the entrance to the support course exam while Izuku and Katsumi made their way to the hero course exam. Izuku attracted quite a few stares when he walked into the room, causing Katsumi to tense up at the attention. 
Izuku placed his hand on her shoulder, hardening the nanobots of the second skin he was wearing to simulate the feeling of Midoriya's metallic body. Worry not, Katsumi. The opinions of the closed-minded mean nothing more than you allow them to. After a brief reaction to the odd feeling of Izuku's nanobot-covered hand, Katsumi relaxed. You're even worse than Izuku with the random wisdom, Midoriya. But, thanks, I guess. Good luck with the exam, not that you'll need it. Izuku smiled differently than he normally did, trying to imitate the most average smile he could think of. I assure you that Izuku could score just as well as I will, Katsumi. I wish you the best of luck as well. Katsumi scoffed before turning to head to her seat. Izuku's, conveniently, was directly next to hers. Across the hall, Izuku could see Melissa Shield lying asleep at her desk. She had been working hard ever since she received one for all, struggling with the usage of the quirk far more than Toshiko ever had. Fortunately for the formerly quirkless girl, Izuku was there to keep her from following Toshiko's guidance before she broke her arm. The two had worked on her control of very small percentages of one for all, reaching a solid 3% throughout her body without injury or fluctuation. Though it was only slightly more than double her base physical ability, having double the speed, strength, and durability she already possessed was nothing to scoff at. Her growth rate per percent of one for all was 3% higher than Toshiko's, which was almost unnoticeable on the scale that she was currently capable of. By the time she reached 90%, however, she would be roughly equal to Toshiko's maximum capacity, with her 100% being nearly 11 times stronger than Toshiko's. Still, with the amount of work he knew she was putting in it was no surprise that she was taking the time to sleep while she could. Unfortunately for her, the pro heroine present Mike was walking into the room with a massive stack of tests, as he watched. Several other examinees noticed this as well, going silent and sitting as studiously as they could manage. Her neck expanding so slightly that Izuku was likely the only one who noticed, the heroine activated her quirk as she began to proctor the exam. Good morning, listeners. I'm sure you all know me as the wonderful voice heroine, present Mike. Can I get a yee yeah? The room was silent, and Izuku almost felt bad for the heroine. He would be tempted to oblige her request if it wouldn't have drawn all of the attention in the room to himself. Unaffected by the lack of response, present Mike carried on. You will have two hours to complete the exam that I am about to pass. Out. It contains 30. General knowledge questions, 20 legal questions, and 50 heroism related. Questions, in that order. Cheating of any form will be punished with disqualification and a mark on your permanent record. You are free to answer the questions in any order that you wish, but try to answer as many questions as you can. If you have any questions about the content of the exam, you may raise your hand and I will do my best to answer them. Please do not begin the exam until I say start. With the opening speech done, the heroine proceeded to walk down the side of the room, passing out smaller stacks of the exams for the test takers to take one and pass the rest along. There was a small incident where a test taker with an invisibility quirk was passed over, leaving the student at the end of her row without a test. The mistake was easily rectified, and after an apology to the invisible student in question, the exam began. Izuku flipped open the first page, expectations quickly lowering as he read the first question. What is the author's intent in the passage to the right and the choices of the colors of various items in the room? A. To signify the protagonist's mood. B. To provide imagery for the reader. C. To set the tone for the rest of the passage. D. All of the above. E. There is no specific intent behind the author's choices. As he made his way through the questions, all that Izuku could think was I sat through four years of high school just to deal with this again. The rest of the general knowledge questions were similar, varying in subject area and difficulty. The legal questions were relatively intuitive, likely designed so that the layperson could pass the section without too much trouble. The heroism-related questions, however, provided slightly more of a challenge. What does being a heroine mean to you? What is the difference between heroines, vigilantes, and villains? Why do you want to be a heroine? Izuku let the ghost of a smile cross his face. For the average examinee, these questions may pose a problem, challenging them to think about their beliefs and motivations in a way that they were not used to. Izuku, however, had been questioning and solidifying his ideals and motivations ever since he discovered that he had the potential to be a hero. When he passed the purely theoretical questions and reached the practical ones and example scenarios, the questions became something of a game for Izuku. When asked to describe his quirk, he simply wrote I am a male human. The scenarios were solved in entirely mundane ways, such as opening a fire hydrant to flood a street when facing villains with fire or electricity quirks. When he reached the final question, he broke out into a full smile, unnerving the test takers sitting nearby. The question involved two crimes occurring simultaneously, asking which one he would choose to respond to. Writing his answer to the final question down on the paper, he closed the booklet and stretched his arms upwards. Mid-stretch, present Mike noticed him raising his hand and moved over. Consulting her list of examinees as she moved, she couldn't help but feel that the name was familiar in some way. Putting aside her inability to remember him, she arrived nearby. Did you have a question, examinee 7281? 
Izuku opened his eyes, still mid-stretch. I suppose I do. I finished the exam. Should I turn it in early or wait for the rest of my fellow test takers? Hearing his voice, the feeling of recognition became stronger, a memory from long ago resurfacing in her mind. The day she had dragged her best friend to a local art exhibition. The first time that she had been caught by surprise by a civilian woman with a quirk. His voice was so similar to the one that had plagued her nightmares for weeks afterwards. So, which of the two of you is suicidal enough to use your quirk on my son? You have 30 seconds to convince me not to send one of these through your bicep. It would be for the best if the two of you were never to meet me again. Shaking herself off of memory lane, she focused on the situation at hand. I'm sorry to say that you will have to wait until the end of the exam period as a matter of procedure. You can use the rest of the time to look over your answers and make sure that they are correct. If you have any other questions, please let me know. With that, she left as quickly as she could without appearing nervous. She wasn't afraid of him, but she had no desire to come into contact with his mother for the rest of her life if she could help it. As Izuku settled into a resting position, his hands clasped with his elbows on the desk, head propped up and staring at her unblinking, she couldn't help but reconsider her previous thoughts. Perhaps there was something off about his whole family. The way his gaze seemed to follow her as she moved to answer the questions of other examinees only served to reinforce this feeling. Fortunately for both Izuku and present Mike, the end of the exam period came faster than either of them expected. After passing the exams of the people behind him to the person in front of him, he leaned back in his chair. To his right, he hear Katsumi whisper, why were you smiling? Izuku let his average smile appear on his face before replying in a similar tone. The final question, why would we have to choose? Out of the corner of his eye, he could see Katsumi shaking her head. Of course, I bet Izuku would have enjoyed all of those heroism questions. A shame he couldn't be here to take this test. Izuku shook his head. Do you doubt my capabilities? I remember everything I see. He will be able to ask you about them when we meet up after the exam, worry not. Tuning out Katsumi's groan, he focused on the front of the room, where a projector screen was descending from the ceiling. Less than 10 seconds after it finished its descent, the projector at the back of the room lit up, displaying a presentation reading you a hero course exam. Practical. Listen up, everyone. The heroine's voice silenced the chatter that had risen in the room during the period that the tests were being collected and taken away for grading. Unfazed by the persisting lack of a response, the heroine began her speech. Congratulations on completing the first half of the hero course exams. Don't feel bad if you didn't manage to finish all of the questions or are having doubts about your answers, because you'll be able to make up for that in the next portion of our exam, the practical. There were certainly a few sighs of relief throughout the room, but they were soon drowned out by the presenter as she moved to the next slide. You will be sorted into 10 exam areas as determined by the last number of your examinee number. If you are unsure of your examinee number, please let me know before we enter the central hub. The practical exam will be as follows, you will be released into a city overrun with robots, which will be marked differently based on the number of points they are worth. Your task is to acquire as many points as possible in the 15-minute period of the exam. The robots in each exam area will be worth between 1 and 3 points. There is an additional robot in each exam area that is worth 0 points, and the destruction of certain objects in the exam, such as public infrastructure, will result in a loss of points. Attempting to injure a fellow participant in the exam will result in disqualification, with the injured party gaining all of the points collected by the rule breaker. Are there any questions before we move to the central hub? One student several seats in front of Izuku raised her hand and was pointed to by present Mike, a spotlight illuminating her as she asked her question. You mentioned the existence of a zero-point robot, what is the reason behind including such a pointless foe? Additionally, she stood up and turned to look at Izuku, who was easily visible over the heads of the shorter students around him. Are you sure that you're taking the correct exam? This is the hero course, not general studies or business. Izuku shook his head before replying, I know exactly where I am. It is rather rude to judge someone based on their appearance rather than their character or ability. The quiet laughter and mocking that had filled the room lessened, only to be drowned out by present Mike's reply. An excellent question, examinee 7111. The zero-point robot is simply that, a robot that is worth zero points. Because of this, there is no point in trying to defeat it. Also, I must agree with examinee 7281. As a hero, one can never make assumptions too quickly, and I would recommend against it. If asked, she would deny that this piece of advice had anything to do with her recent reminder of a certain overprotective mother to no end. Several questions regarding examinee numbers later, the test takers were led through a series of hallways before arriving at a room with 11 doors, labeled alphabetically in a clockwise pattern from a to J after they had sorted themselves out towards their doors. There was a period of a few minutes for test takers to prepare themselves. Like several other students, Izuku opened his backpack and began to pull out his equipment. Metallic spheres were tossed over his shoulder, magnetically snapping into place under M4S control. An additional layer of nanobots flowed into the hollow structure of the second skin he was wearing, turning it from a full-body mask to functional armor. The remaining nanobots assembled themselves into the sword he most commonly used, edge sharpened for the upcoming task of cleaving through metal. 
He gave the sword a few practice swings, mentally preparing himself for the practical portion of the exam. Nearby, he could see several people looking at him strangely, which could be for any number of reasons. It could be the remnants of the attention drawn to him by the examinee earlier, the fact that he claimed to have finished the exam significantly before it was over, the fact that he had just pulled a sword a meter and a half long from the comparatively small backpack, or just friendly curiosity. Before anyone worked up the nerve to approach him instead of just staring, the massive door leading to the exam room slid open far faster than any piece of metal had the right to. In the blink of an eye, he and four other candidates around the room rushed into their respective areas without looking back. By the time Izuku had arrived at the first intersection, he had already acquired four points, with many more robots focusing on him. As he kept running forwards, cutting down the robots as they approached him, he began to use his quirk to intuit the programming behind his opponents. They were both better equipped and more intelligent the more points they were worth, with the one-pointers reacting aggressively on sight, and the two-pointers following him around after receiving damage. He couldn't say anything for sure about the three-pointers, having not encountered one yet, but the one and two-pointers had a heavy focus on close-range weaponry. Izuku immediately developed a strategy, running through the streets to attract as much attention as possible. The bludgeoning spheres hovering behind him spread out as he ran, sometimes punching through the robots but otherwise hitting them just hard enough to cause them to follow him. Only five minutes into the exam, he had accumulated a sufficient horde of robots following him to begin the next phase of his strategy, accumulation. For the next three minutes, he ran through the far side of the testing area, accumulating over 200 points of robots bulldozing the streets behind him undisturbed by the rest of the test takers. Then he turned around, set his position firmly, and faced the horde that he had been building with the intent of using nothing but the sword in his hands. Two minutes of massacre later, Izuku was standing in a circle clear of the fallen robots that littered the street. Placing the sword against his back, he felt M4 apply a magnetic connection against his second skin armor. Before he could sit down and rest, however, the testing area began to rumble as a massive robot rose from the center of the testing area, the number zero clearly visible even from the distance Izuku was at. It is a better idea to stay here than to fight the zero-point robot in my testing area. False. Pushing away his thoughts of rest, he stood up and ran towards the robot, intent on taking out the robot towering over the landscape. Midoriya POV. M4 split part of his attention from where he had been watching over the nanobots comprising Izuku's armor, and weaponry as he heard Izuku's name being called in the room where the body Midoriya was waiting. Moving the human-shaped collection of nanobots, he simulated Izuku's normal movements and made his way to the closed examination room. As he closed the door behind himself, he took the time to look around the room. It was split in half by a transparent barrier that bore quite a few scorch marks from the explosions he had heard from previous examinees. As he made his way to the center of the room, he identified the hero on the other side of the glass, Power Loader, the heroine in charge of the first-year support course. Her voice came from a speaker visible in the corner of the room, sounding as if it had spoken these exact lines hundreds of times already without an end in sight. Good afternoon, examinee 7281. I am the pro heroine power loader and I will be observing you and your inventions today. Please display your inventions for analysis. M4, from his server in Izuku's house, performed the closest action he could to a smile. I'm sorry to disappoint you, power loader, but Midoriya Izuku is currently taking the hero course exam. I, however, am his invention and am here to present myself in his stead. I am the fourth generation artificial intelligence created by Midoriya Izuku. You may refer to me as M4 and the body I inhabit as Midoriya. Power Loader, who was rubbing her temples as she gave her earlier speech, snapped her eyes open at the words fourth generation artificial intelligence and leaned forwards to more closely observe the examinee before her. She had seen far too many useless inventions throughout the day, from a bubble machine that froze the soap bubbles as it created them to a dual-bladed chainsaw with the other blade facing the user. This, however, promised to be interesting. You call yourself an artificial intelligence. How can you prove such a bold claim? Instead of immediately replying, M4 decided to demonstrate physically. He had Midoriya remove his head with his left hand before crushing it, flecks of metallic silver bursting apart before freezing in the air under his magnetic control. Despite the lack of blood, Power Loader jumped back screaming, falling out of her chair before realizing that the M4 had not actually died as a result of this action. When her scream stopped, there was a full second of silence before M4's voice filled the room. I presume that that was evidence enough. A minute later, after M4 had reassembled Midoriya's head and Power Loader had extracted a promise from the artificial intelligence to never do that again, she returned to the paper on which she was supposed to be scoring his invention. While the inventor himself wasn't present, the invention of artificial intelligence, and a self-repairing body double realistic enough to fool other applicants would certainly earn him a spot at any university he wished. Quickly scribbling in a perfect score for all of the relevant categories regarding the invention itself, and its presentation. She moved to the bottom half of the paper, lined for her to write any additional notes in, ready to fill it as much as possible. Ignoring the whole non-human body demonstration, 
By what standards are you an artificial intelligence? The figure in front of her smiled. I have passed the Turing test, can solve captchas, and in all other ways surpass humans in intelligence and knowledge. For the past decade, I have possessed true sentience as defined by humans and have been capable of original thought. If you would like, I can provide a more digital demonstration of my capability, though you may find that unnerving. Power Loader, who had more than enough surprises in this session alone, quickly shook her head to dissuade M4 from any more unnerving displays. No, that's good enough. Can you tell me more about the body you're currently using? The smile on Midoriya's face grew inhumanly large without moving as M4 spoke. This form is comprised of several quadrillion nanobots with the outermost shell-given coats of paint to look like human skin and organs. These nanobots are powered by a small-scale fusion reactor contained within the body, and are held together using electromagnetic force. I could do my best to explain how the body Midoriya works, but you may have better luck asking my creator himself. M4 paused, giving Power Loader time to finish writing down her thoughts. Midoriya is capable of sustaining piercing, slashing, bludgeoning, electrical, and some other energy-based attacks. Certain types of radiation have not been tested due to Midoriya Izuku's inability to acquire highly radioactive materials without arousing the wrong types of attention. At this point, Power Loader had run out of space on the paper for comments. Okay M4, that's enough for now. Unless 20 of the examinees out there have somehow created something more impressive than you, I want you and your creator to know that you both are guaranteed admission to the support course at UA. You mentioned that Midoriya Izuku was taking the hero course exam right now. After a delay that fit in the amount of time it took most people to blink, M4 switched his attention to Izuku, who was running through the trail of wreckage caused by his fellow examinees, and the zero pointer to engage the colossal robot. Yes, he is, Midoriya stated. Power Loader nodded, trying not to appear opportunistic. In the event that he doesn't make it into the hero course, please let him know that he would be welcome in the support course at any time. If you'd like, I can advocate for him whichever course he eventually decides on joining. M4's smile returned to normal human proportions and his mouth began moving again as he rose from his seated position on the floor. While that shouldn't be necessary, it would be greatly appreciated. We both thank you and wish you a wonderful day. With that, he turned to leave the room, closing the door behind him. Before she called in the next examinee, she shook her head. The boy was clearly immensely talented and capable to have built the things that he did. Even with the support gear he was undoubtedly using, for someone quirkless to willingly put themselves into such an ordeal was nothing short of unbelievable. As she called in the next applicant, who was carrying a bag of frozen blueberries and a box with a funnel sticking out of the top, she sighed. She would almost prefer another explosion. Ten seconds later, she got her wish as a slurry of frozen blueberry painted the screen separating her and the examinee. Telling the applicant to leave the room, she pressed the button to call in a janitor to clean the partition. She should have been more careful with what she wished for. Izuku POV While M4 was walking out of the room, Izuku had finally made his way around the robot demolishing its way through the city, ready to face it head-on. Before he could do such a thing, a cry for help sounded from one of the buildings between him and the robot. Changing his course, he made his way over only to discover a girl trapped underneath a collapsed stone column. She didn't look to be in any great pain, but she was unable to free herself judging by her increasingly panicked reaction to the giant robot moving closer to her. Izuku tried to move the pillar himself, but even with his second skin lifting with him it was simply too much weight. He could have cut it to pieces with his sword before moving a much smaller and lighter burden. But in the state that the girl was in, swinging a sword at her seemed unlikely to help the situation. What's your name? She seemed to calm down at his question, turning to him with a look of surprise. I am your Raka Achako. What are you doing here? Can't you see the zero pointer coming? Ignoring her questions for a second, Izuku continued in a calming voice. Are you okay? Are you able to move? Achako shook her head. I'm fine, but you have to go. I can't move, but it probably won't target me. It will go after you, so you need to run. Izuku shook his head. There's no way of telling if it even knows you are here, and I can't just leave you here. I'll take down the zero pointer and come back for you, okay? Not stopping to listen to her attempt to convince him otherwise, Izuku pulled the magnetic focus sphere from behind him, flipping the switch on the side from a track to repel before throwing it to the ground in front of him and running forwards. Half a second after he passed over it, it activated, boosting him in the air as he flew towards the robot that towered above the buildings, stabbing his sword into his arm and calling out unrealistically large. He pulled it out to reveal a blade more than four meters in length at the cost of the majority of his armor. It didn't matter that much, though. He had already confirmed the cuts he would need to make to disable the robot with his quirk, and they almost seemed visible on the Zero Pointer's body. A stab to the processing unit, a cut through the power supply, three cuts through the armor to expose those, and a six cut through the motherboard just for good measure. As Izuku spun through the air, following through on his plan, it was a sight to watch for Achako, who had moved herself to a position where she could see outside despite being trapped. 
The nameless savior who had appeared before deciding to take on the city-demolishing robot that none of the other applicants even tried to face with the sword was so unrealistic that she wasn't convinced that she wasn't dreaming, despite the pain from her leg and nausea from the overuse of her quirk. The sight as he neared the titan's chest before rapidly swinging his sword several times was truly similar to the story of David and Goliath. And as the proverbial Goliath stopped making any noise or emitting light, and began to fall backward, she couldn't help but wonder who her mysterious savior was. All thoughts of that left her mind as the ground shook with an earth-shattering boom, the pillar moving upwards in recoil for the split second that she needed to pull her leg out before a cloud of concrete dust filled the air, and she rushed to cover her mouth and nose with her shirt. As she waited where she was for the cloud of dust to settle, she noticed a figure with a sword and an odd contraption over their face approaching from the direction that the robot had fallen. Before she could ask any questions, however, the alarm signifying the end of the exam went off. On their walk back to the central testing room, she learned several things about her fellow applicant. First of all, his name was Midoriya Izuku, and he was much taller than she had thought when she first saw him while trapped under the column. On account of her injured leg, he had offered to carry her back to the entrance of the practical area, and she gladly accepted. When he picked her up to carry her on his back, however, she was caught off guard by just how high she was off of the ground. While he carried her back, he talked about several other things, apologizing for how uncomfortable his armor was and asking her about her quirk. She felt slightly bad talking about her quirk to someone who couldn't have won, but his cheerful attitude dispelled that feeling quickly. Some of the suggestions he gave her about how to use her quirk were certainly interesting, but she was having a hard time focusing on them with the throbbing pain in her leg. When they reached the central hub, Izuku carried her over to the station that Recovery Girl had set up before carefully letting her down to get treated. Looking around the room, he sighed with relief that Katsumi wasn't there, or he may have had to play up his act as Midoriya again. As they were free to leave, he made his way to the point where he knew Midoriya was waiting for him, picking up his backpack from beside the door and depositing his gear into it as he walked. His wait with Midoriya before Katsumi arrived was brief, and when the trio reunited there were only a few seconds of confusion as she tried to figure out who was who before they left for the train back home. On the train, they talked about how their exams went. Midoriya went first, describing Izuku's experience in the hero exam as he had observed it from the countless cameras that he had borrowed the proctor's access to. Katsumi was impressed by the strategy that he had used, turning to outright shock at the number of points that he had ended the exam with. She told the tale of her exam next, talking about the heroism-related questions on the test with the two before moving into her description of the practical. Using her strategy of maintaining a constant level of explosions to keep herself sweating nitroglycerin from the heat, she had bulldozed her way through every robot in sight, racking up over 120 points and taking on the zero-pointer when it showed up. Lastly, Izuku spoke as M4 fed him information through the earpiece, giving him just enough information about the actual events for him to tell a story of how it would have gone if it was Izuku there and not Midoriya. Unfortunately, he had to leave out details like the head explosion but the comments about the devices that other applicants brought with them left her breathless from laughing. When he told her about the guarantee from Power Loader that he would be accepted, she gave him a short hug before saying in the most snobby voice she could, as expected of my boyfriend. The two laughed it off, planning to celebrate in a week when they received their official acceptances. Yamada Hikaru POV Unlike the applicants that had been able to leave and go about their days, the various proctors were not so lucky. Hikaru was still sitting in the teacher's lounge as she went over the hero course tests, taking turns with the rest of the proctors in the room shooting envious glares at Meijima Hitamu as she leaned back in her chair, already done choosing which of the applicants she would be accepting into the support course. In front of her was a small stack of papers from the inventions she had approved of while she was writing on a notepad balanced on her knee, looking at one in her lap. The vast majority of them had never left the exam room in the first place, discarded for a lack of utility, required skill, or for simply not working when presented. Ariasuka was blazing through the tests for the general studies course, possessing a minor quirk that slowed down her perception of time and using it to grade papers at nearly triple the speed that Hikaru was capable of. The business course had taken a different approach to applicants this year, having them give a proposal further in advance and then submit a summary of how their proposal had played out in the real world, using profit, and potential as the basis to accept their students. While they worked, they shared some of the funnier stories about the applicants' responses or inventions, waiting to discuss the truly outstanding ones until the rest of the teachers arrived. When Shiko eventually made her way into the room and sat down next to Hikaru, a smile bloomed across Hikaru's face. Strangely quietly for a sound-based hero, she slid half of the remaining stack of tests in front of her and placed a pen on top. Shiko, being a pro-heroine, immediately noticed this and glared at her friend, only to be met with the same almost innocent smile. 
As one of the homeroom teachers for the hero students, after all, she had a responsibility to help with their tests. Ten minutes later, when Kan Shiori entered the room, both of them removed a third of their stacks before placing them in front of her, in unison giving her the same smile that Hikaru had given Shiko. Eventually, they had almost made their way through the stacks of tests, when Shiko began to narrate the responses from Izuku's test. At first, she was merely dismissive of them, having read that the examinee was male, and therefore corkless, but the more she read the more intrigued she became. All of the scenarios were solved in a way that didn't require a quirk or specialized equipment, and while she was still dismissive of the applicant himself the train of thought behind those solutions was solid. There was just one oddity with the final question, however. It was meant to see whether potential hero candidates were influenced by things like gender, age, profession, or other factors when saving people. The applicant, however, had ignored the choices and written I would simply be in both places at once, which confused her for a few minutes before she marked down the question. It was nearing sundown when the rest of the teachers arrived, All Might, Nozomi, Midnight, and a few others all walking into the room at the same time. By the time Nozomi sat down, the rest of the teachers in the room had gone quiet. Well, it's that time of year again. We'll skip business this time, there are still a few people who need to submit their results before any definitive choices can be made there. For general studies, half an hour of Nozomi entering information into the school's database later, they finally arrived at the support course. Hitamu quickly ran through the few applicants who had produced useful inventions before moving into those who displayed a high level of technical skill in their creations despite their impracticality. After she had finished with the 20th student, however, she didn't finish speaking. I have one more applicant who I feel is more than qualified to enter the support course, but I was informed that this applicant has also taken the hero course exam, so I will refrain from accepting them into the support course until you have passed judgment on the hero course applicants. Nozomi raised an eyebrow at that but otherwise did not comment. It would be simple enough for an applicant to finish the hero course exam and then join the end of the queue for the support course, so there was no need to join in on the whispering coming from a few of the teachers. Instead, she simply nodded and spun the elevated chair that she was sitting on to face the trio that had been grading the hero course tests. Well, ladies, are there any high scorers? Hikaru spoke up, seeing as she was the proctor. Overall, we had four students out of 600 score above 90% this year. From lowest to highest, the scores were 193, 295s, and 199. The median score, as usual, was 57%. Several individuals answered some of the heroism-related questions so poorly that we believe they require various forms of therapy regardless of their attendance at UA. We were waiting to evaluate the results of the practical exam until you arrived, so as soon as Hitamu decides to make the projector work properly, we can get into that. Fifteen seconds later, the paused image of ten different exams was displayed, with one substantially larger than the other nine and a ranking list of the top 40 on the right side of the screen. Upon unpausing, five of the images showed people moving onto them at similar rates of speed. Each of them quickly acquired at least a few points, immediately appearing at the top of the rankings. Midoriya Izuku, Bakugu Katsumi, Todoroki Shoko, Melissa Shield, and Yeyurazu Momo. The latter four remained at the top, carrying their early lead while Izuku dropped below the top 40 shortly afterward. While the other heroines were busy watching, Nozomi noted reactions from several of her teachers at the names on the top five. Hikaru flinched, Toshiko's ever-present smile widened, and Hitamu leaned forwards in interest. It was quite an interesting set of reactions, and whether or not they were related was unimportant. Perhaps those five would require her personal attention. Eight minutes into the recording, however, a different area moved to fill the screen. Thirty seconds afterwards, the name. Midoriya Izuku returned to the top 40, accompanied by the same set of reactions. Again, this was not missed by Nozomi as she split her attention between the screen and her employees. Midoriya's return to the top 40 was not unrealistic. The points required to do so didn't even reach 30 at this point in the exam. What was unrealistic was the rate at which the points kept climbing, quickly rising to fifth place and pausing there before breaching the gap between fourth place and the rest of the applicants. The points only kept climbing, and by the time they stopped near the 10-minute mark, Midoriya Izuku held the first place with a solid 235 points, nearly triple. Bakugu Katsumi's score of 87 points in second place. The room was dead silent at this point despite the shaking image on the screens betraying the arrival of the zero-pointers. Toshiko's smile could almost be described as proud, and Hitamu's was. Regretful. Jealous. On the projection, the largest image shifted between the five areas containing the top five students as they took on the zero-pointers. Todoroki Shoko froze the robot in place before it could destroy a single building, spending a solid minute making sure that it would not be moving without external assistance. Bakugu Katsumi tore her way through its head and chest, wreathed in explosions as the metal gave way before her. Yeirazu Momo moved underneath the robot, producing a block of some material that must have held an extremely powerful electrical charge seeing, as a bolt of lightning fell from the clouds, disabling the robot in nature's attempt to equalize the charges. Melissa Shield leaped onto the robot, 
punching her way into its head before doing something to the electronics in there, leaving the robot perfectly still but still functional. If Power Loader had to guess, the girl had disconnected the targeting chip from the main logic board, but only doing so in one direction so that the robot would be unable to receive the results of its requests for targets. On Midoriya Izuku's field, however, the Zero Pointer was unchallenged for several minutes until he arrived on the scene, stopping in a nearby building for a minute before taking down the robot in a frankly puzzling way. He threw some kind of impulse grenade, stabbed himself and made his sword grow larger, and then slashed at a specific point on the robot several times before it fell backward, creating a massive cloud of dust and causing all of the cameras to shake. The extra minute of footage after the exam ended showed him carrying a girl out of the dust cloud, a mask disappearing from the lower half of his face as he re-entered their field of view. As soon as no more movement was detected in the testing sites and the cloud of dust had cleared, the recording ended. At the end of the video, the top 40 spots expanded to fill the screen. As Shiko and Shiori took down the top and bottom half of the names respectively, Nozomi rewound the footage to the 8-minute mark and switched through the cameras in the top scorer's arena to see for herself exactly what had happened. The camera that she finally stopped on was situated directly behind him as he stood, sword drawn, facing a horde of robots that filled the street before him for nearly two blocks, numbering at least 150. Unpausing, she and the unoccupied teachers watched as he carved his way through the swarm of robots with a sword that looked like it would snap before even damaging one of them. Half-heartedly, the rest of the teachers passed around the remote control to focus on particular students. When Shiko and Shiori had finished, Nozomi took the remote back and placed it on the table before her, drawing everyone's attention before speaking. I'm going to address the elephant in the room first. For the first time ever, Yue has a male applicant to the hero course that has passed the exam. He is, by all rights, qualified to be a student at our school. There are several problems that this causes, however. We currently have no accommodations in our hero facilities for male students. The nearest male bathroom to the Wana classroom is in one of the general studies buildings and those are perhaps the most minor concerns. On-campus accommodations will need adjustment, but I'm sure that with the help of heroines like Cementos, those will be solved relatively easily. The more pressing problem lies in his identity. There is simply no way to conceal it for his safety as we do for our other students. Furthermore, he will likely be injured much more easily than his peers during normal activities. At this, Hitamu cleared her throat. Not to interrupt, but if these problems become too pressing, Midoriya Izuku was the applicant that I was considering accepting into the support course in the event that he did not make it into the hero course. Jumping on that idea, Nozomi began to consider it. There had been male students in the support course before, and their identities required much less protection than those of the hero students. After several minutes, she nodded decisively. It's a shame that it's come to this, but it will be safer for him to go to the support course despite his efforts in the hero exam. While he may wish otherwise, it falls to us to make decisions for the greater well-being of our students, and whatever she was about to say was cut off by the screen abruptly changing and the rest of the lights in the room turning off, none of the teachers having left their seats or touched the remote. The screen that had been previously displaying the names of the top 40 contestants had been replaced with a calming blue background with a geometric image of a person's head facing away from them. Over the next few seconds, the figure began to turn around, the screen shaking more and more intensely as it came closer to facing them directly. Every device capable of producing noise in the room, from the overhead speakers to the radio sitting on a table in the corner, began to play staticky noises, as the figure on the screen noticeably glitched. Its eye sockets were glowing orange, a stark contrast to the blues of the rest of the screen. When the head had reached the point that it was looking at Toshiko, the lips curved slightly upwards before the screen abruptly returned to normal, the lights coming back on as if nothing had ever happened. It had only been five seconds, and yet the teachers were all unnerved. At once more and less surprised than her colleagues, Toshiko contemplated what had just happened. Right as Nozomi had been about to assign Izuku to the support course, one of the avatars that he had seen M4 use appeared on the screen, giving off a threatening appearance. As far as she understood the artificial intelligence and its creator, there was no way that Izuku would have ordered M4 to ensure his position in the hero course through such means. M4, however, was perfectly capable of acting on his own and saw Izuku as some strange combination of a father, an older brother, and his creator. It was entirely possible that M4 had taken the initiative to prevent what he saw as an unfavorable outcome. Feeling her phone vibrate in her pocket, she pulled it out to see a message from M4. Who are we to go against fate? Pushing the phone back into her pocket, she reconsidered what she had been previously thinking in a new light. Perhaps Izuku had confirmed that he would make it into the hero course using his quirk, causing M4 to intervene when he saw that things weren't going the way they were predicted. This raised an odd question about the prediction, was it made accurately in the first place? If M4 had done nothing, then Izuku would be in the support course and the prediction would have been wrong. Of course, the prediction could have been banking on M4 knowing about it and interfering to make the prediction come true. 
Likely, even if the prediction had not occurred M4 would have reacted to Izuku's potential placement outside of the hero course. Now, however, M4 had chosen to interfere despite his ability to do nothing, and she was also capable of affecting the outcome. Quickly weighing the options before her in her mind, she spoke up. Perhaps it would be for the best to send an acceptance letter for both courses with the information about the risks of the hero course compared to the support course. As a legal adult, he is capable of making his own decisions, but we can provide him with the information necessary to make an informed decision about his future. We can accept an extra student into the hero course for the time being. After all, we all know Shiko's track record. Nozomi thought through Toshiko's response, considering her stance on the matter. He would likely compare his score with that of other prospective students and find out about their actions in the long run, so it was better to not alienate a student from the administration in such a way. She could already think of the script she would give each teacher when it came time to record their introductory letters. It was obvious to her that Toshiko was trying to guide the outcome of the situation in some way, the sum of a series of actions revealing that she either knew this Midoriya Izuku or the origin of their interruption. Regardless, the boy had performed well on both exams if Hitamu's word was to be trusted, and something about the whole situation triggered her curiosity. Curiosity may have killed the cat, but of all the species she had been labeled a cat was not one of them. She would eagerly see where this went, for better or worse. After all, she had one of the strongest intelligence quirks in history, elevating her from an animal to the principal of the nation's most prestigious school, only growing stronger as time passed. Who could possibly outplay her, the mistress of the game that would soon play out in her school? Izuku, who was currently celebrating his score with Katsumi, Inko, and Mitsuki, felt a sudden urge to sneeze, quickly suppressing it. He didn't believe in superstitions, but a quick statement revealed that somebody was thinking about him at the time. Chalking it up as merely a coincidence, he returned to the celebration unworried. M4, despite not having a nose or body to sneeze with, suddenly blinked, all of his processes pausing for a millisecond before continuing as normal. After checking himself and being unable to find anything in his logs that would cause such a disruption, he resolved to ask Izuku about it later. For Izuku, the day ended peacefully, taking a shower and sending Toshiko the list of tomorrow's crimes before going to bed early. He was looking forwards to receiving his letter from Yue, one that he had confirmed over five years ago would be an acceptance from the hero course. Indeed, all was well for Midoriya Izuku. A week after the entrance exam, two envelopes showed up at the Midoriya's door. Seeing as both Inko and Izuku were out of the house at the time, M4 reformed Midoriya from the barrel of nanobots sitting in Izuku's bedroom and used the body to retrieve the mail. Both letters were addressed to Izuku from Yue, with no discernible differences between the two. Setting them both at Izuku's place at the kitchen table, M4 directed the body to return to the collection of nanobots, the usage of the body and the sender of the letters bringing up the quandary he had found himself in. Was it right to intimidate the staff of UA to accept Izuku into the hero course instead of the support course? He could always rise to the course based on his performance in the yearly sports festival that they held, and was half a year of delaying really worth the impression he had left on them. Izuku could doubtlessly tell him what the correct course of action was, but he would also be disappointed in M4 for the actions that he had taken. He hadn't explicitly threatened them or told them what to do, relying on Toshiko to connect the dots and advocate for his placement in the hero course. After a while, he reached the same conclusion that he had the other times he had asked himself this question. There was no changing what had already happened, so it was better to live with the results than to worry needlessly. Besides, only Toshiko and Meijima Hitamu would have any idea that it was he who interrupted the placement meeting, and both of them had met him beforehand. Shaking himself mentally out of the fit of retroactive self-justification, M4 jumped from the point of view that he had in Izuku's house to the speaker that he always carried with him. Currently, he was at the freshly cleared Dagaba beach enjoying the relative warmth of the Japanese summer with Katsumi, the two of them swimming while his speaker rested back on the sand with Izuku's backpack. That was fine, he was a patient person, after all. Nearly half an hour later, when the two returned to the sand and heard the news of the update from Yue, they quickly changed into their street clothes to return to open the letters. Katsumi dried herself with a series of explosions before slipping her clothes on over her swimsuit while Izuku simply pulled on a shirt and shoes. After a brief check of the route of the person who had delivered Izuku's acceptance letters, M4 confirmed for them that Katsumi had a letter waiting for her at home as well. They stopped by her house to pick up her letter before heading to Izuku's house to open them at the same time. Though an exceptional display of self-control, Katsumi refrained from opening the letter until they arrived. When they arrived at Izuku's house, slipping through the front door before closing it and locking it behind themselves, both teenagers were surprised by the presence of the second letter. Katsumi was surprised because she had assumed that Izuku would be receiving a positive response from the support course, while Izuku was surprised because he knew that he would be receiving an affirmative response from the hero course. 
Picking up the envelopes, neither of them was distinct from the other. They both weighed the same amount as Katsumi's, heavier than if they contained a few pieces of paper to be sure, and were addressed to the same location without even a difference in the return address. With minor usage of his quirk, he confirmed that the letter in his right hand was the one from the support course, and decided to open it first. Katsumi, tired of waiting, picked him up while he was thinking this through and carried him to the living room, setting him down on the couch before tearing open the letter she had been carrying for the past five minutes. From the scraps of paper fell a slab of metal with instructions on how to view the message contained within etched on one face. Prying the metal apart, she pulled the top half of the flat slab upwards, leaving the base on the table suspending its twin nearly 30 centimeters above. The top was supported by telescoping rods at each of the corners, a translucent material filling out the rectangular prism. A second after the device had been fully opened, the projection flickered to life, giving the impression of a floating figure inside the walls of the device. Even before she opened her mouth to speak, both of them recognized the figure of the strongest heroine in Japan. I am here as a projection. Though you most certainly recognize me, you may have some questions about why I am here. The news is not yet public, so please don't go about sharing it, but I will be teaching at UA for the foreseeable future. Now, onto the results of your exam. The projection of All Might shifted to the left, images of Katsumi destroying robots appearing on the right of the screen. As they moved, the heroine continued speaking. With your explosive quirk, you secured yourself a spot in the hero course without a doubt. Your quick reaction to the unannounced start of the exam is exactly the kind of awareness we need in the heroines of tomorrow. However, the villain points were not the only thing that we were measuring. The screen cleared before showing a still frame of Katsumi facing the appearing zero-pointer. All Might's voice was still there in the background despite her lack of visible presence. In a past life, I was an entertainer. Behold. On the screen, the image of Katsumi staring down the zero-pointer as it rose from the ground turned out to be a video. As it unpaused, briefly showing Katsumi standing still before the explosions engulfed her and she launched straight at the zero-pointer, carving her way through the colossal robot before it could move from the platform it had arrived into the exam area on. Once Katsumi had left the robot, the video stopped and shrunk towards the right side of the screen, all might reappearing on the left. The zero-pointer was not actually worth zero points. It was more of a representation of an opponent unbeatable by conventional means to see how you all would react. While this gave others the chance to show us their capabilities in non-combat roles, such as rescue, this gave you the opportunity to show us your willingness to take on the challenges that a hero faces. The video disappeared, quickly replaced by a ranking that displayed the top 100 slots that zoomed in to focus on her position. For your actions with regard to taking down the zero-pointer, you have been awarded 20 extra points, giving you a total of 143 points on the practical exam. In addition to your 84 points on the written exam, your grand total of 227 points has earned you the second-place spot in this year's Hero Course exam. Reopening this display after this video has been played will show you the leaderboard of accepted students, whose names will appear as soon as they have watched this video. Congratulations on your results, and welcome to UA. With that closing line, the projector shut off and the display began to collapse, sliding shut over the course of about 10 seconds. Katsumi figuratively exploded in excitement, jumping on Izuku and hugging him before running around the living room. Izuku, happy for his girlfriend, located the button on one end of the device and pressed it, watching the structure expand in the manner intended by its creator. By the time Katsumi had calmed down enough to return to her seat, the leaderboard was fully visible, 41 places with pictures beside them, more than half still placeholders. The format was odd as well, the first place was centered over the top while the remaining 40 places were split into two columns beneath it. While the rankings were done by total score, the score breakdowns were visible next to the scorer's name. From the scores of the people that had already watched it, it was clear that Katsumi was far above the pack with her second-place score. Both the fifth and sixth-place scores were visible, showing a disparity of nearly 20 points. After the two had looked at the leaderboard for some time, noting as the places filled up as more and more people finished their videos, Katsumi began to badger Izuku to open his envelopes. Opening the one from the support course, Izuku poked fun at his girlfriend by pointing out the instructions on the top and where the button to open it normally was before opening the device. The heroine displayed this time was Power Loader, fitting the course. Hey Izuku, it's me, Power Loader. I have a script that I'm supposed to go through, but it's far too fancy for my liking. I'll show it to you, give me a second. The display went blank for a few seconds before the woman returned to view, holding a piece of paper. Here it is, I'll hold it here for a few seconds if you want to read it. You should know, however, that I'm going to give you the gist of it. After holding it closer to the camera for a few seconds, she balled it up and threw it out of the recording area. In short, congratulations. You've been accepted to the support course, please feel accomplished for being the fifth male to ever make it in. Lots of talk about the accommodations on campus for you, but I'd be sitting here explaining them for 20 minutes when M4 could probably steal the contents of our entire network in the time it takes you to blink. 
In reality, I'd rather hire you as a teacher. I couldn't build one of the things that you have in your lifetime, the nanobots, the AI, probably some that you kept secret, and there isn't a single teacher here who could even try. The whole magnetism thing you used to keep the body together, to reshape it. I don't even know how half of it works and I spent the past week looking it up after seeing your display. I could get the school to hire you after you graduate, but I don't think there's anything I could teach you. If you accept, I'll just give you a lab and let you do whatever you want for the next three years. No strings attached, I'll get you basically any material that you ask for. That's really the only thing that I think you'll get out of UA. Even if you don't accept, you're welcome in the support course whenever you want to visit. Taking a deep breath, Power Loader straightened up, composing herself before ending the recording professionally. When you reopen this display, you'll be able to see my entirely arbitrary ranking of the reasons that the accepted applicants were accepted. I'll see you around, Midoriya Izuku. Izuku was in no small amount of shock. The talk of hiring him as a teacher, the offer of an open lab whenever he wanted, the limitless materials that such an institution no doubt had access to. Katsumi was no less shocked than him, and after opening the rankings for the support course, Izuku and Katsumi distracted themselves by looking at the reasons that other people had gotten in, ranging from a device that could deposit the water vapor from the air into ice to the precision work of someone with a quirk that allowed them to shrink themselves. Just below Izuku's sentient artificial intelligence was a girl named Hatsumi Mei, with a personal jetpack and various forms of capture equipment. It was certainly a promising distribution, and Izuku found himself wanting to talk with several of the people on the list about their creations. Turning to the second letter, Izuku opened it with a strange mixture of curiosity and expectation. It, too, contained a metal slab that expanded into the familiar display screen. After the off-script attitude of power loader, however, All Might's exuberance was a shock to the system. I am here as a projection. Though you most certainly recognize me, you may have some questions about why I am here. The news is not yet public, so please don't go about sharing it, but I will be teaching at UA for the foreseeable future. Now, on to the results of your exam. The recording was identical to Katsumi's so far, but the pre-recorded introduction cut to an image of All Might holding a book in front of her. Good evening, Midoriya Izuko. Or perhaps not evening, but whatever time you're watching this. It's the evening for me, and that's what I'll be going by. You see, there's a bit of a legal issue concerning your applications. Because the artificial intelligence that you controlled your body double is sentient, and therefore meets the definition of a legal person, he should gain entrance to UA. However, we will run into problems when it comes time for him to be in classes without the body of support gear. In light of this, you have been offered admission to both courses, though there will be another segment at the end of this that you need to pay very close attention to should you wish to attend the hero course. All might pause for a moment, giving both Izuku and Katsumi time to think about what they had just heard. Izuku was happy at the news that his work over the past years had finally achieved its first major goal, making it into UA. Now, he would just have to convince Katsumi to let him enter the hero course instead of the support course. Katsumi, on the other hand, was both confused and feeling an odd sense of dread. The message that she had gotten was that Izuku was being accepted into both courses due to some legal mix-up and from what she knew of him he would definitely want to enter the hero course. On the side opposite Izuku, her hand clenched into a fist. She had worked so hard to become stronger so that she could keep him safe, and here he was, being unable to put himself at risk. The longer the pause stretched out, the more she began to wonder if the approach she had taken all along was the right one. She had trained to make herself stronger, but Izuku was the training partner she had practiced with to become stronger, and the exchange certainly wasn't one way. Perhaps the thought of pushing him away from the thing he was working towards wasn't the way she needed to go. The conversations that they had as kids passed through her mind, Izuku's rambling of how he would be a hero, and the two of them would fight crime together. Maybe she just needed to be there with him, able to actively ensure his well-being instead of pushing him away. These thoughts were interrupted by a sudden movement from All Might. Wait, the camera's still running. I hope they edit that out in post. Quickly, the heroine moved out of the view of the cameras and after a second of rustling returned to the upbeat recording of his results in the hero exam. Despite your quirkless nature, you were able to deduce the way that the villains work to bring them to a location of your choosing to fight them. Though it may not have been your intention, your actions also serve to lessen the threat that the robots pose to your fellow examinees, which is commendable. The mentality that you showed us there, of turning the problems you face into ones that you can solve, is exactly what we strive to teach and cultivate at UA. Although your villain points were certainly enough to earn you a place at UA, there was another element to the exam. Similarly to Katsumi's message, the screen cleared before showing Izuku facing the zero-pointer in a much more damaged area than in Katsumi's video. In a past life, I was an entertainer. Behold, the video played out, showing Izuku entering a damaged building before walking out a minute later. The pair watched as Izuku pulled his sword from his back and launched himself at the Titanic robot, toppling it to form a massive dust cloud where the video ended. All Might reappeared on the left of the display, continuing her speech. The zero-pointer was not actually worth zero points. It was more of a representation of an opponent unbeatable by conventional means to see how you all would react. 
While this gave others the chance to show us their capabilities in non-combat roles, such as rescue, this gave you the opportunity to show us your willingness to face problems larger than yourself for the sake of others, and such actions do not go unrewarded. Observe. The video re-expanded to fill the screen, changing to the medical area. The girl that he had met in the partially collapsed building was there, talking with present Mike as she went around to make sure that all of the examinees were okay. Unpausing, the girl began to speak. I'm fine, present Mike. I do have one request, though. There was someone in my exam area who took down the zero pointer while I was trapped. I don't remember his name, but he should have been the only boy in the area. I didn't see him at all during the exam, so if he needs any points to make it into UA, could you give some of mine to him? I might not be here if it wasn't for him, and… Present Mike waved her hand. Don't worry, there's more to the exam than just villain points, and if he took down the zero pointer to protect you, he shouldn't be lacking for points. All might return to the display just as the video ended, carrying on after the other heroine finished her sentence. And indeed you won't. For your actions with regard to the zero pointer, you have been rewarded with 35 extra points. In addition to the 235 villain points you earned and the perfect score on the written exam, you have a grand total of 370 points, earning you the number one spot in this year's hero course exam. Instead of concluding the video as she had for Katsumi, the scene cut back to All Might with her book, looking much more tired. I'm assuming this is going after the normal segment, so I'd like to congratulate you on your acceptance into the hero course. Unfortunately, this isn't over just yet. I'll give you a minute to get something to take notes with. Quickly grabbing a pen and paper as well as M4S speaker, Izuku set himself up to take notes. Okay, I hope you've gotten something to write with by now. So, a few of these problems are caused by you being the first male applicant to ever make it into the hero course. I had to take a list of them and I spent quite a while just now being briefed on them for this video, so bear with me if this takes some time. First of all, there's the dormitory situation. Normally you would share a room with one of your classmates, but for obvious reasons, the university is hesitant to do so. Fortunately, we have the heroine Cementos on our staff, so you will simply have your own room for your stay on campus. Similarly, new facilities have been built for your use in the hero course buildings, such as bathrooms and locker rooms. Second of all is the issue of your identity. With most students, it is a simple matter to keep their identities secret, but with your distinct status it will be much harder to do so. We will try our best, but the public scrutiny of you will inevitably be much greater than of the rest of your classmates. Thirdly, you will be able to either opt out of or use your body double to participate in some of the more dangerous activities that are a part of the hero course. These will be discussed more if you accept this position instead of a place in the support course. Fourth, you should begin to create your heroic persona as soon as possible. Decide on a name and submit your ideas for a costume so that we can get to work on keeping your identities separate. Fifth, and I assure you we're getting through this list, there are three male students in the business course and nine in the general studies. There may be certain activities that you will be expected to work with them in, so I recommend getting to know them. Upon arriving at campus, you will be given an account for our student intranet which will allow you to make contact with them and your classmates. You should also remember that UA isn't just a training facility, it's also a university. Have fun while you're here, whether or not you choose to enter the hero course. Where were we? Seventh, the university would like to congratulate you on being the first male applicant to ever make it into the hero course, and the fifth to ever make it into the support course. It is quite an impressive feat, rivaling the next one. You've been inducted into the one of one A's. Out of all the students that have ever taken our entrance exam, you reached the top 20, putting you in this prestigious category. It's an unofficial organization, but you may be contacted by other members while you attend UA, and potentially after you graduate. Your rank is currently fourth, behind pro heroines Farah, Quicksilver, and yours truly. On behalf of the rest of us, welcome to Class 1S, as we call ourselves. You're invited to our send-off of the member you displaced, pro heroine Bullet Hell, which will take place on campus the night before classes begin. Please don't feel bad about pushing her out, it happens every time a new member joins, and it's an inspiration to keep working harder every time. And last but not least, opening the leaderboard by pressing the button on the side of this device in the next 48 hours will be taken as your decision to enter the hero course at UA. If you have not opened the leaderboard by then, we will take that as your decision to instead enter the support course. Once more, Midoriya Izuku, congratulations on your results and welcome to UA. The screen flickered off and collapsed, leaving the room silent when it finished. After a moment of silence, Izuku turned to face his girlfriend. Normally, he could tell what she was feeling just by looking at her face and body language, but this time the conclusion he was reaching was at odds with the one he expected based on his knowledge of her personality. None of the anger, envy, or impatience that he had expected was there, but instead, resignation. The questions he was about to ask were cut off by Katsumi pulling him into a hug, moving her head to near his ear. Izuku, I know that you want to go into the hero course. I know that I've been against it, but, so long as you keep yourself safe and I'm there with you, I'll support you, okay? Izuku returned the hug, squeezing her tightly as he replied. 
Thank you, Katsumi. I thought I was going to have to convince you to let me go, but it's amazing that you're with me. I couldn't ask for a better girlfriend than you. After a moment of hugging, Izuku spoke up again. Out of curiosity, why did you change your mind? Pulling herself backward for a moment, she looked him in the eyes. I know you, Izuku. As wonderful of a person and boyfriend as you are, you are the most stubborn person I have ever known. Even if I told you not to, you'd still press that button or find a way into the hero course. It's pointless to try and stop you, so I figured that I might as well make sure that you do things right. It's certainly odd to be the reasonable one in our relationship, but someone has to do it. Once she had leaned back into the hug, she muttered. Also, I remembered you talking about being a hero team back before the hospital incident. Izuku laughed, holding Katsumi close to him for a while longer before the two broke apart. Looking over at Katsumi as he reached for the button, she gave him a nod. The button was pressed and the device expanded, displaying Izuku's name at the top of the leaderboard. His smiling face next to his score as he answered the question that so many other applicants had been asking and caused many more. Some of the applicants tried to find out who he was, only to be blocked by either UA or M4 before any of their searches even began. Izuku immediately went to the UA website, entering his applicant number to log in before moving to the residency page. As one of the first applicants to do so, he was able to select the earliest time to move in but when he moved to select his room, he found that it had already been chosen for him. The other icon in the room grayed out. None of the rooms were particularly bad, and Izuku took some time to look at the structure of the dormitory as Katsumi signed up for the room next to Izuku's on her phone. The building was shaped like a U, with the entrance and common area forming the bottom, and the student rooms forming the sides of the U there were two floors to the building, each wing of rooms holding three rooms per floor. All told, 24 students could comfortably live in the building. There wasn't much detailed information about the sizes of the rooms or the contents of the common areas, but Izuku wasn't worried about that right now. After all, he had made it in, and in two weeks' time, he would be moving out of the house he had lived in his entire life. He shook his head to clear those thoughts out before they could get to him. He wasn't leaving anything or anyone behind, he was only a train ride away and could visit at any time. Instead, he was moving forwards, acquiring new friends and knowledge while retaining everything he already had. Both mothers were overjoyed to hear that their children had made it into UA, and after hearing the specifics of Izuku's situation and Ko broke down in tears of joy. She had always known that Izuku could do it, ever since he revealed his quirk to her, but to hear that he had gone above and beyond in such a way filled her with pride for her son. They celebrated for hours that night, the mothers reminiscing about how their children were all grown up and the fact that their children would be headed off to university in such a short amount of time. The next two weeks were packed for the two of them, each mother trying to cram in all of the time that they could with their children before they were left alone. Izuku and Inko went on hikes, watched old films, and spent some time traveling around the country. Katsumi and Mitsuki, who had a slightly less close relationship, spent their time together visiting the places that Masaru had mentioned taking Katsumi in one of the videos he had recorded so long ago. It was melancholic, but the two bonded over the experience as much as they could. Still, the two weeks passed faster than any of them expected and the day came for Izuku to move in at UA. Fortunately, with Inko still running her moving company, she was able to skillfully fit everything that Izuku wanted to take with him into the back of the truck she had bought so long ago in less time than it would have taken a team of professionals to move a quarter of the amount. After an hour-long drive, they arrived at the gates of the university. Izuku hopped out of the passenger seat of the moving truck to talk to the person at the gate, showing her the message confirming his move in time for that day. After Inko parked the truck in the nearest space to the dorms and turned the hazard lights on, the two of them got to work. Before they took anything out of the truck, the two of them made their way into the building and climbed to the second floor before heading for Izuku's room. It was located on the right side of the main room at the farthest room from the center, giving him an extra set of windows where there would have been a wall. As he entered the room, he couldn't help but feel odd about the fact that half of it was simply empty. On one wall was his bed and desk, the closet and the chest of drawers provided to him by the university resting along the same wall that held the door. The empty half was the one that had the extra set of windows, allowing light to stream into the room. Over the course of the next hour, Izuku and his mom brought everything from the truck upstairs to his room, arranging it from there to Izuku's preference. The two left the room in an unfinished state as they left to look around the rest of the building. All of the furniture moved a meter away from the walls and buckets of paint sitting around the room. After having lived in a house where the walls were covered in art, the dormitory simply felt empty with its plain walls, something that Izuku definitely intended to fix. On the second floor, the main area was roughly split four ways. In the corner closest to the door leading to Izuku's room was an assortment of furniture intended for either studying or relaxing, while on the farther wall was a kitchen area. In the other half of the room, there was a large table with 20 seats, its proximity to the kitchen suggesting that it was meant for them to eat it when there were more than could fit at the kitchen table. The farthest corner from the door leading to Izuku's room was empty in a purposeful way, leaving the residents to fill it. While Inko left to look around the first floor, Izuku checked out the kitchen. 
It was likely that he would be using it quite frequently in the near future, and it was clearly larger and better equipped than the one at home. Opening the cupboards, he was unsurprised to find plates and bowls, several pots and pans, cutlery, and other basics, but when he found boxes of food in one of them his interest was piqued. Upon looking through the rest of them, he found all kinds of pre-prepared food, non-perishable products, and other microwavable food. When he opened the fridge, however, he was met with a wide array of fresh food and was suddenly aware of the feeling of emptiness in his stomach. Checking the clock on the oven, he saw that it was just afternoon. He picked several of the ingredients he had found in the fridge and cupboards and began to prepare a simple stir-fry for himself and his mom. Just before he actually turned one of the burners on the stove on, however, he heard a shout that was distinctly not his mother's voice coming from downstairs. As quickly and safely as he could, he made his way downstairs, only to see the proctor from the exam trying to avoid his mom's gaze. De-escalating the situation as quickly as he could, he found out that the proctor had arrived to bring him his student ID and a bag full of information, supplies for decorating his room, and UA merchandise that was provided to every student. For some reason, however, she had reacted poorly at the sight of his mom and had received a similar response. Accepting the bag, Izuku slowly guided his mother back upstairs and continued preparing lunch. However, when he asked her why the two disliked each other, Inko's response was uninformative. Quite a few years ago we had a rather negative interaction. But it isn't anything you need to worry about. I have faith that our relationship won't affect you, so it isn't worth worrying about. With his quirks confirmation, Izuku decided to drop the subject and focus on preparing lunch. Half an hour and a filling lunch later, Izuku hugged his mother before she left, leaving him to his own devices to finish setting up his room. A few hours later, Izuku had finished redecorating his room, and while the paint dried began walking around the rest of the building. It was, in a word, empty. He was the only hero course student moving in today, and the silence of the building was beginning to get to him. Carrying around a collection of paintings that he had picked out for this very occasion, Izuku began to hang them around the building. They were mostly landscapes, and as Izuku used his quirk to predict where the best spot to hang each of them was, he quickly began to realize how much the silence was getting to him. Connecting the servers that he had brought from his room to power and Ethernet, Izuku brought M4 back to his full capacity. A few requests later, and calming background music began to play from the speakers in the main room, always loud enough that Izuku could hear it but never loud enough to be distracting, fluctuating in volume with his position in the building. By the time the sun set, Izuku was happy with how he had decorated both his room and the building as a whole. With the art covering his walls now dry, Izuku moved the furniture back to the walls of his room, placing the additional pieces that he had brought with him in their respective places. Some people may not consider a tower of servers or a vat of nanobots a piece of furniture, but to Izuku they were irreplaceable parts of his life. After a lonely dinner and angling his blinds to lessen the effects of the morning sun, Izuku lay in bed, staring at the ceiling of his dark room. The morning couldn't come soon enough. The moment Izuku woke up, he knew that it was far too early. For the past 12 years his sleep schedule had been relatively consistent. People went through various stages as they slept, one full cycle taking anywhere between an hour and two hours as the night went on. Izuku had long since used his quirk to time his sleep cycles, but the problem was that they were seemingly random, changing from night to night. He could predict them far in advance, but in the end, he had found a far simpler solution. Using a variety of means, Izuku had been able to shape each cycle closer to an average of an hour and 15 minutes. These cycles were still slightly shorter at the beginning of his sleep and longer towards the end, but the difference was closer to 5 minutes instead of half an hour. Because of this, he usually slept for anywhere between 5 hours and 7 and a half hours before he woke up, M4 choosing when to wake him up based on the events of the coming day. So when he woke up and the sky was not light with the arrival of the sun, he knew that something was off. A quick look at the alarm clock beside him revealed that it was 4.38, nearly an hour and a half before he planned on waking up. Unfortunately, he was not the type of person who could just roll over and go back to sleep. Once he was awake, he would be hard-pressed to fall back to sleep. Pulling on a pair of slippers, Izuku got out of bed and left his room. Under M4S control, the lights in the hallway slowly brightened as he walked. By the time he had reached the common area, the lights were at their normal level of brightness. Looking in the cupboards, Izuku confirmed the presence of the varieties of tea that he had seen last night. Because of the rapid collapse of most coffee-producing countries during the rise of quirks, it was unlikely that one would find any outside of one of those areas. Similarly, chocolate had been quick to die out unless one lived in an area that traditionally made it. There had been a period roughly 25 years after the first quirks appeared when the world truly began to devolve into chaos that many products abruptly became more scarce. Overseas trade entirely vanished for a decade, only returning after decisive action on the part of the few global superpowers that remained. Women with aerokinetic and hydrokinetic quirks were offered large government incentives to take up roles in the shipping industry to ensure the safety of the goods and vessels containing them. In recent years, the situation had improved, with piracy decreasing on the whole. 
Still, the regions producing the missing products were not stable enough to maintain internal production, and as much as some companies would lobby for the invasion of Brazil to restart coffee production, it simply wasn't going to happen. Returning to the present, Izuku closed the cupboard door and moved to the fridge. Sitting inside where he had seen it last night was a liter of apple cider. Pouring some of it into a ceramic cup, he turned one of the burners on the stove on before placing the cup there, and waiting. Six minutes later, Izuku had a steaming cup of apple cider in his hand as he made his way downstairs. While he described the central area of the second floor as the common area, the first floor's analog fit the title much more appropriately. On one wall was the largest television that Izuku had ever seen, resting on a short cabinet with a pair of remotes placed before it. Inside the cabinet was a large collection of DVDs and two TV boxes, both of which were linked to the monitor above. Surrounding the television were a set of couches in an arc. One corner of the room was clearly set aside for games, with ping-pong tables, an air hockey table, and several pre-quirk arcade machines set up for their use. Similar to the second floor, there was a kitchen and dining area on the first floor, which Izuku assumed was equally as well-stocked if not better. As soon as he sat down at one of the seats at the kitchen table, Izuku realized again just how lonely it was to be the only person in the building. He had assumed that other people would have moved in on the first possible day, but apparently, he was the only one who wanted to. Regardless, his loneliness would only be temporary. Katsumi had signed up for the spot this morning, and while he could use his quirk to find out who the other two people moving in today were, it was more interesting to leave it as a surprise. Unfortunately, it would be just over two hours before the move-in time started for the day, so Izuku had plenty of time to kill. Returning to his room, he opened one of the boxes that he hadn't unpacked the previous night, and pulled out a change of clothes for the day and a towel. Bundling those in one arm, he grabbed the student ID he had been given yesterday before leaving his room. As his slipper-muffled footsteps echoed through the halls, he wondered for the first time how the whole bathroom, shower situation would work. He was, after all, going to be in the distinct position of being the only man in a building full of women. If they were shared, he could simply wake up before anyone else like he had today. But as he finished walking down the stairs and entered the bathrooms, he found that his worries were only partially founded. Unfortunately, the bathrooms were not separated by gender, but the only common area was the sinks. There were a set of doors along the wall opposing the sinks, half-labeled shower, and the other half-labeled toilet. Each door had a visible lock on it and upon entering, he found that they were single units. After taking a shower and otherwise going through his morning routine, moving his toiletries from his room to one of the smaller lockers near the sinks in the process, Izuku felt refreshed. Making his way back to the second floor's kitchen, he put the now cold mug of cider back on the stove before returning to his room. While his cider reheated, Izuku moved a blank canvas on a frame and a stand to prop it up against to the first floor, bringing his paint down in several more trips. After laying down a tarp on the hardwood floor and setting up his equipment in its center, he retrieved his beverage from the stove and turned it off. Back on the first floor, Izuku figured that now would be as good of a time as any to paint the lobby as it was before everyone else arrived and its pristine nature was ruined by 21 teenagers. Rotating the canvas into a landscape orientation, Izuku spent a moment being grateful for his mother's insistence that he bring a supply of blank canvases with him. Without her wisdom, he would be sitting bored until more of his classmates arrived. Seeing as the frame he was using was nearly a meter and a half tall and two meters wide, this project would take much longer than he had initially anticipated. That was fine with him, however. It was only 5.15, and Katsumi would be arriving at 9 at the very earliest. Dragging over a small table from near one of the windows, Izuku set his cider down on a coaster and picked up the finest paintbrush he possessed. It was time for a masterwork. Four hours later, he heard the distinct sounds of his girlfriend's quirk behind him, snapping him out of the focus he had on his painting. By this time, he had covered very little of the canvas in appearance but in actuality was nearly a quarter of the way done with the piece of art. Setting down his paintbrush and reaching for his cup of cider, he raised it to his lips only to find that it was empty. Setting it back down on the coaster he had been using, he turned around and walked out of the main entrance to intercept Katsumi. Despite his size and the lack of apparent cover, the application of stealth-related skills and the generous use of his quirk to confirm whether or not she was looking in his direction allowed him to quickly and effectively sneak up behind her. Once he was in position, he tapped lightly on Katsumi's shoulder, causing her to spin around in surprise before good-naturedly punching him in the shoulder. Don't sneak up on me like that, Izuku. I still don't understand how you can do that, even though you do it so often. After she got over her surprise, she gave him a quick hug before returning to her excited state. How are the dorms? What's your room like? Izuku laughed briefly. The dorms are fine, Kakin. They were a bit empty when I moved in, but I like to think that I did my best to remedy that in my particular way. It's a bit too quiet now, but I have no doubts that that will change very quickly. My room's pretty nice, but even with them four there, it feels too large. You'll see what I mean when you get to your room. Their conversation was interrupted by Mitsuki coming around the side of the car, prompting both of them to pick up a box and carry it into the building. 
After some good-natured ribbing about Izuku's art setup, the trio made their way to Katsumi's room, the door next to Izuku's. Katsumi was surprised by how large the room was. Even though she only had half of it to herself, that half was still larger than her room at home. She supposed that it made sense for Yue to provide such accommodations for their students. After all, they had worked hard and longed to get in and there was no downside to rewarding that effort. Several trips later, and the three of them had moved all of Katsumi's things from the car to her room. After relaxing for a few minutes, Izuku offered to make them both something to eat. Both Katsumi and Mitsuki declined, having eaten breakfast just before driving over. After the two said their goodbyes, Mitsuki left the campus, leaving the two of them there with very little to do. Eventually, Izuku returned to the first floor to continue painting and left Katsumi to unpack some of the things that she had brought with her. By 10.30, however, she had finished and was beginning to realize what Izuku meant by how quiet it was. From her room, with the door open, the loudest noises that she could hear were the familiar hum and whir of M4S servers, the background noise of several appliances in the kitchen, and the sounds of Izuku painting on the floor below her. Shrugging to herself, she made her way downstairs to hang out with Izuku while waiting for other people to arrive. He acknowledged her presence but otherwise didn't react to her arrival. She took the time to walk around and explore the building looking through the supply of food in the kitchen and at the paintings she knew Izuku had put up on the walls. While she was making her way through the hallway on the opposite side of the second floor when she heard the distinctive sound of engines outside the building, making her way downstairs and outside as quickly as she could to find out who was moving in, she passed Izuku, still hard at work. Deciding to leave him be, she left through the front door. Upon laying her eyes on the newcomers, she realized that her earlier assumption had been incorrect. The sound of engines had not been from a vehicle, as she had assumed but from the two people at the center of the group that had just arrived and the engines that seemed built into their legs. Just as she was about to call out to them, however, she locked eyes with the younger engine-bearing woman. She recognized her from the written exam, where she had called out Midoriya. Though Midoriya wasn't her boyfriend's true self, to her new classmate the two may as well have been one and the same. Repressing both the urge to scowl at the girl and the urge to grin sadistically, she made her way over to introduce herself to the group. After explaining that she was one of the Hero Course students, the group basically pushed the younger engine-bearing girl at her as they made their way to the entrance of the dormitory. Each of the eight people that had arrived with them were carrying two medium-sized boxes, and from the chatter that she picked up they were actually part of a hero agency working for her new classmate's older sister, the older woman with engines. When they made their way into the lobby, the first thing that she noticed was that Izuku wasn't there. Chalking it up to him just having gone to use the bathroom or get something from his room, she waited in the main lobby while the group made their way to the closest room to the common area on the right side of the first floor. The other heroines in the group left the building after setting their boxes in the room, some of them giving odd looks to Izuku's art setup as they left. Shortly afterwards, the older woman left as well, giving her a wave as she left. Their drop-off had been much more efficient than hers, only taking a few minutes in total. Most of that time had been spent for the goodbyes between the sisters, but she supposed that having three times as many people made things go faster by default. From upstairs she could hear the sound of something boiling. Figuring that it was Izuku, she didn't do anything about it and waited for either of the other two people to return to the common area. Izuku got back first, sipping from a cup of steaming liquid. Seeing her looking at it, he offered her the cup and she took a sip. It wasn't what she had expected, but the taste of the boiling apple cider was certainly better than she would have thought. Instead of returning to his position in front of the easel, he chose to sit on a nearby chair, looking at the hallway where the sounds of drawers being opened and shut could be heard. A few minutes later, the nearest door opened and the room's sole occupant came out, walking into the common area before truly recognizing Izuku's presence. There was an awkward silence for a few moments as the three of them looked at each other. The newcomer had a mixture of surprise, confusion, and guilt on her face as she looked at Izuku, missing the sadistic grin slipping free from Katsumi's control spreading on her face. Izuku maintained his calm facial expression, eventually deciding to break the ice. It's nice to meet you. My name is Midoriya Izuku, and I'll be one of your classmates for the foreseeable future. The structured greeting served its purpose, to prompt her to respond in kind. It's nice to meet you as well. My name is Ada Tomoyo, and I'll be your classmate as well. While she tried to find the words to put the thoughts running through her mind into reality, Izuku gave his girlfriend a look, trying to get her to complete their introductions. It took a few seconds for her to notice, but eventually she got the message. And my name is Bakugu Katsumi. Ignoring the missing parts of her introduction, Izuku stood up and stretched his arms and hands before turning to face the two of them. Do either of the two of you feel like having lunch now? I could eat for sure, but if the two of you would like me to prepare extra I could certainly do so. Seeing Katsumi's enthusiastic agreement, Tomoyo accepted as well. The room was soon filled with the sounds and smells of the food Izuku was preparing, and not 15 minutes later the three of them were seated around the kitchen table eating lunch. While Izuku ate the food as if it was nothing special, Katsumi's and Tomoyo's reactions were very different. Katsumi savored the food, eating it less than half as quickly as she would have if Izuku hadn't made it. 
Tomoyo, having never tried one of Izuku's perfected recipes, was floored by the unexpected quality of the food. Seeing the two of them eating normally, however, she decided to save the questions that she had and take Katsumi's approach to eating the food. When Izuku finished, significantly before the rest of them, he washed off his plate before returning to his painting. The two girls also finished eventually, putting their dishes in the sink before talking to each other, not really getting anywhere due to the one-sided animosity that Katsumi held for Tomoyo. Not removing his focus from his work, Izuku spoke up at one of the lulls in their conversation. I may not be the best with words, Kakin, but I do know you. I don't know why you're holding a grudge against her, but it's best that you resolve it now. You can't simply live with someone that you dislike for the next few years, after all. Could you try to talk it out? Katsumi huffed in frustration. All right, Izuku. I don't like her because she called you out in the written exam, saying that you didn't belong there. Are you happy now? Before Tomoyo could speak up, Izuku replied. Kakin, you don't have to be enemies with everyone who looks at me strangely. I've forgiven her for what she said, and I think that my presence here refutes the point that you thought she was trying to make. She was likely just trying to prevent me from getting hurt, as one of the top rescue point scorers who didn't take down a zero-pointer. Her attitude since she arrived has been regretful, even if she hasn't had the chance to show it. Setting his paintbrush aside, he looked over at the two of them. Tomoya was looking relieved, while Katsumi was struggling to hold on to her anger in the face of Izuku's argument. Going back to his painting, he noticed the two of them engaging in a slightly more in-depth conversation, talking about their entrance exams, high schools, quirks, and friends that they left behind to go to UA. As Izuku was nearing the completion of his painting, the three of them heard the sounds of their latest classmate arriving. Izuku paused for a second, and then set down his paintbrush, and left the building with Katsumi and Tomoyo close behind. When he saw the girl who was stepping out of the visibly expensive car, he couldn't help but think that she looked familiar. After digging through his memory for a few moments, he finally placed a name to her face. She was Yeyurazu Momo, the daughter of one of his first clients for painting. She bore a remarkable similarity to her mother at the time, but common sense indicated that she was the girl who had spoken to him while he painted. If he remembered correctly, her quirk was potentially one of the most useful ones that he had ever seen, and it was no surprise that she had made her way into the top five in the entrance exams. While the three other people in the car unloaded her belongings and brought them into the dorm, she introduced herself to the three of them, prompting a round of introductions. When the four of them made their way back into the dorm, Izuku returned to his spot in front of the canvas, causing Momo to feel like she should be remembering something. Fifteen minutes later, Izuku had finished his painting of the entrance of the dormitory, and was cleaning up the supplies he had brought to the first floor. On his second trip back up to his room, he heard the conversation turning to their quirks, specifically Momo's. He didn't catch the beginning of the discussion, but when he returned to the first floor and took a seat nearby, both Katsumi and Tomoyo were staring at Momo. I'm telling you, it's not that impressive of a quirk. It requires a lot of memorization if I want to make anything more complex than base elements, and it's pretty slow when I need to make complicated things. Katsumi shook her head. You've got to be kidding me. You can make anything you can think of given enough time and you think your quirk isn't that impressive. As soon as Izuku gets back, I'm sure he'll come up with some broken way to use your quirk. Taking the opportunity provided, Izuku spoke up, startling the three girls who hadn't noticed his arrival. I've already done that to a lesser extent. I think we met each other very briefly. 13 years ago. 14. I told her to make objects out of carbon to lessen the difficulty of converting body mass into other objects. Now, however, I'm sure that I could give better advice. The reminder, in combination with the image of Izuku painting, finally jogged Momo's memory and connected the boy she barely remembered talking with so long ago with the one sitting next to Katsumi. Katsumi, instead of reacting to Izuku's sudden presence beside her as one of them would have, sat perfectly still as she took a deep breath. Izuku, you shouldn't do that to anyone else until they get used to you. They haven't known you for as long as I have, you need to let them get used to you before you start doing things like that. Izuku shook his head. But you see, Kakin, that's where you're wrong. If I don't demonstrate the abilities that brought me this far, they'll think less of me simply because I don't have a quirk. I am an anomaly, and it's best if they know that as soon as possible. Speaking of which, I think we're missing someone in this conversation. M4. Can you join us? Who's M4? Tomoyo asked, confused. Before either of them could answer, there was an odd sound from the stairs, like pieces of metal or glass were falling down in a wave. As she turned her head to watch, she saw a mass of metal with flecks of color flow down the second half of the stairway. The group was silent as the formless mass made its way across the floor of the room before assembling into a copy of Izuku, taking a seat across from him. That would be me, Ida-san. Though I may not be a student, if we're having a meeting of everyone who lives here, I should certainly be present in one form or another. M4S display caused the two unfamiliar to fall silent, looking between Midoriya and Izuku as the two of them faced off. Katsumi was enjoying their confusion, remembering her first reaction to seeing the two of them waiting outside her front door. Izuku quickly tired of the lack of conversation. M4, how about you introduce yourself? Manipulating Midoriya to seem as if he was speaking, 
M4 happily obliged. Of course, Izuku. My name is Masaru 4, though you may call me M4 or, when I am in this form, Midoriya. I am the fourth generation artificial intelligence created by Midoriya Izuku, and despite my artificial nature, I am just as much a person as anyone else. It is a pleasure to meet you both, Ada-san, san with the metaphorical ice broken, the five of them continued their conversation well into the afternoon, only interrupted by present Mike's arrival to deliver the welcoming packages to the three new arrivals. She had a double take at Midoriya's presence, but after his form turned a metallic silver, she got over her confusion, chalking it up as the reason that Power Loader had wanted him in the support course. After that, the four organic people in the room sat down to eat dinner, prepared by Izuku and M4 as they blurred around the kitchen. When they sat down to eat, however, Momo raised a question that had been on her mind ever since M4 replicated Izuku's form. How are we supposed to tell the difference between you and M4, Izuku? Katsumi laughed. Good luck with that. The only differences between the two of them that I've found are the fact that Midoriya is made of metal, and that M4 is much more formal than Izuku. When Izuku's wearing his armor, the only real way to tell the difference is from how they talk and act. While Izuku began to eat, M4 gave a more detailed explanation. There are a few more differences between the two of us, Katsumi. For example, I intentionally lack several external biological structures, such as body hair and pores on my skin. Though I have the appearance of them, it is simply inefficient to replicate them to such a degree unless we need to give the appearance of Izuku being somewhere beyond any doubt. As for how we talk and act, I assure you that I am capable of imitating Izuku far more accurately than anyone outside of yourself, and his mother would be able to tell. Things like creativity and originality are certainly different between the two of us. I lack the ability to make something exactly like the paintings decorating the walls of this building or to fight as Izuku would, but I am certainly capable of creating new ideas and fighting. Quirks that target humans will be unable to affect me, while those that target inanimate objects will. The vast majority of quirks that affect the onaic energy present in women will be unable to affect either of us, but that's neither here nor there. And if the two of us ever end up fighting against one another, I will certainly lose whether we are both limiting ourselves to physical bodies or not. I believe that that concludes the various ways of telling us apart. Between bites, Tomoya raised a valid point. Couldn't we also tell you apart because you are needing right now? Midoriya nodded. Though that's certainly a way to tell us apart, I am certainly capable of consuming food and drinks up to a limited capacity. Perhaps two meals the size of this one and I will need to discharge the matter or a liter of water. However, unless both of us are in the same room, you should assume that it is Izuku unless informed otherwise. In the end, the TV screen across the room switched on, showing the geometric face that M4 used when not wearing Izuku's face, and artificial intelligence such as myself has no need for a body to be present. The last line was spoken from the speakers set up near the television, the voice carrying across the room. Taking the moment where the three girls in the room looked over to the television, M4 made Midoriya wink before dissolving, silently making his way back to Izuku's room. Momo and Tomoya were surprised by Midoriya's absence when they looked back, looking at Izuku for a few seconds before returning to their meal. After dinner was finished and the dishes were washed, Izuku, Tomoyo, and Momo sat around the TV while Katsumi brought down a gaming console to hook up to the big screen. With some assistance from M4, four different profiles were set up so that they could all play at the same time. They played a racing game at first, switching between several other multiplayer titles, as the sky darkened. They began bantering as they played, trash-talking their opponents as they fell before the teamwork of the four students. After the third hour, Tomoyo suggested that they play against each other for a while instead of with each other. Despite Katsumi shaking her head vigorously, Momo agreed, and the team of four split up into a free-for-all. They were still playing against nearly a hundred other people at the same time, but the four of them usually lasted long enough to find each other before dueling to the death. In the third round, when Katsumi made it to the very end with Izuku as her only opponent, and won, she punched him lightly in the shoulder and told him to stop holding back. Izuku debated whether or not it was a good idea to do so, but before asking his quirk he threw his caution to the wind. It was all a game anyway, so he might as well have a little fun if he could. The fourth round started, and Izuku spawned in near a sniper rifle. Equipping it, he took a moment to look at the screens of the girls sitting beside him. Getting a sense of their locations from the minimap as well as the directions they would be moving, Izuku aimed the sniper rifle into the air, and fired in three seemingly random locations before using a taunt. Two seconds later, after the bullet drop caused the shots to fall to the ground, Momo's, Katsumi's, and Tomoyo's characters all died in quick succession, the replay of their death showing Izuku's character giving a thumbs up and smile reminiscent of All Might. Contrary to what one might expect, the three girls beside him were not discouraged. Quickly leaving the game, Izuku started a new one, and the four of them began once again with a new goal in mind, taking down Izuku. Keeping a close eye on Izuku's screen as well as their own, the three of them adopted a new style of play, changing direction whenever Izuku made one of his seemingly random shots in the air, 
and staying inside buildings as much as possible to force a confrontation in their favor. Despite their efforts, Izuku still managed to split them apart and take them on one-on-one, -on -one, winning each encounter despite taking damage. On the fifth round, both Katsumi and Momo spawned in near Izuku and quickly joined forces, and took him out before he could amass any weaponry or armor. After that, they played for a few more rounds before suggesting that M4 take over for their opponents. As they began a 4v4 with M4 controlling their opponents, it quickly became clear that M4 was better than standard computer opponents. To attack him was met with an impenetrable defense, and to try and defend was met with overwhelming strength. Playing against him was truly a test of their teamwork, and with time they became able to hold their own, finally winning just as Katsumi was beginning to yawn. The four made their way back to their respective rooms and went to bed, eagerly waiting for the next day to come. Six hours later, as was usual, Izuku woke up to a dark and silent building. No longer uncertain, he made his way to the showers and began his morning routine. After finishing his daily message of crimes to All Might, Izuku sat down at the kitchen table on the first floor. Enjoying the peace of the early morning, he leaned forwards, stretching his arms to reach the far edge of the table, and pressing one cheek against the wooden surface. Lying there for a minute, Izuku wondered what he would do today. He could wait around the building for his classmates to arrive, he could wander around the campus, he could paint something new, he could train. Suddenly, Izuku connected a few dots. Power Loader had invited him to stop by the support course building if he ever wanted to, and he really had nothing better to do before anyone else woke up. M4 could puppet Midoriya to tell them where he went if they woke up he got back, and he could get a sense of perspective on what UA had access to. I can visit the support course building today. True. That decision made, Izuku spoke his plan for the morning into the air, and was answered by Midoriya silently showing up in the kitchen, carrying Izuku's backpack with him. Izuku took the backpack from Midoriya's outstretched hand and left the building to explore the campus. Half an hour later, Izuku made his way to the front door of the support course building. Experimentally scanning his student ID on the black box near the front door, he heard the telltale whir, and buzz of the mechanism in the door handle moving to unlock the door. Stepping through the door, he was greeted with an informative sign showing which direction led to the classrooms, which one led to the labs, and which floors each year of students would meet on. There was even a set of helpful indicators for where Power Loader, the department head, and the various pro-heroines working under her were. Currently, Power Loader was the only other person in the building, with her marker placed on the second floor labs. As Izuku passed by the first floor labs, he couldn't help but look in and try to make out the equipment in the dark room. He couldn't be sure of everything that he was identifying, but if even half of the pieces of technology in the room were what he thought they were, it would be better than his setup at home. Climbing the stairs at the end of the hallway, Izuku pushed open the door leading to the second floor. This lab was well lit, and inside he could see Power Loader adjusting one piece of equipment or another. Gently knocking on the glass of the window next to him, he watched as the pro heroine looked towards the back corner of the room. Seeing that it was him, she turned back and made a final few adjustments to the machine that she was fixing, likely a circular saw or a disc sander by what he could glimpse of it. After that, she set down the tools she was holding and made her way over to the doorway that Izuku had walked over to. Midoriya Izuku, a pleasure to see you. That is, if you are truly him and not M4 again. Izuku returned her greeting. A pleasure to meet you as well, Meijima-sensei. I am the original, so to speak. I'm sorry that I couldn't show up to the exam in person, but I was preoccupied at the time. Hitamu laughed. Preoccupied, he says. Don't worry, with a score as impressive as yours on the hero course exam I don't fault you for sending the copy to the support course. Unless we were all deceived, and both of them were copies in the end. Izuku shook his head. No, I was physically there for the hero exam. It wouldn't do to not show up to at least one of them, after all. Anyways, I'm here this early because I moved in two days ago and I don't really have anything to do. With M4 and Midoriya there to introduce me to my classmates, I decided to take a walk around the campus and get a feeling for the place. When I passed by, I remembered your offer to let me work in the labs whenever I wanted to, so I thought I'd stop in. Hitamu nodded. Yes, yes. I'll show you around the place, follow me. After Hitamu turned off the lights and locked the doors to the second floor lab, the two of them went back downstairs and made their way into the first floor labs. The layout was similar to the second floor, though it was clearly missing some of the more specialized equipment. That made sense, however. Not every student worked on the same types of support gear or technology, so the more expensive and niche equipment would likely be acquired after the year began and moved upstairs, as the classes graduated. Izuku's tour of the lab was brief, seeing as Power Loader had to get back to work on the equipment. But the heroine had pointed out the pieces of equipment that required her supervision to operate, though both of them knew that that would be more of a legal concern than a practical one. Alone in the room, he made his way around, looking at the wall of shelves filled with basic components, various colors of wire, resistors, solder, and so forth, and the table with a form on it for requesting more specialized materials. Though there wasn't anything too special in stock, it was still far more than Izuku had ever seen in one place at the same time. 
Most of his tinkering and building was planned out with the help of his quirk that he never ordered a surplus of materials, and to see massive spools of various colors of wiring seemed extravagant. The form was also more of an open-ended request than a checklist to go through. It gave the unspoken impression that so long as you could find an item, it could be bought, built, or otherwise acquired by UA. This was the difference between his reach, even with the help of M4, and that of one of the most prestigious institutions in the world. After spending about 15 minutes in the lab Izuku left, turning the lights off behind him and locking the door from the inside before closing it. Stepping outside as the first rays of sunlight peeked over the horizon, Izuku stretched his arms, contemplating if there was anywhere in particular that he should go next. Deciding not to overthink it, he made his way around the rest of campus at a leisurely pace. It was picturesque in a sense, with each building possessing its own character despite the relatively recent construction of the university. Still, the campus was much smaller than average for Japanese universities, only hosting a few thousand students at a time. Due to this, his entire trip went unnoticed by his classmates, none of whom had woken up by the time he returned to the dorm. Taking over for M4, Izuku moved over to the first floor kitchen and began to prepare breakfast for himself, Katsumi, and perhaps Momo and Tomoyo if they wanted some. According to the move-in website, the rest of his classmates would move in over the next two days. For that, Izuku was grateful. A patient person he may be, but the fact that he was living at the school of his dreams made every uninteresting second seem wasted. Hearing the sounds of movement from above him, a smile graced Izuku's face. At least when there were other people around, things would be more interesting. For the better or the worse. Katsumi slowly made her way down the stairs, a towel and a change of clothes under one arm as she held the railing with her other hand. In her half-awake state, she noticed the sounds and smells coming from the kitchen and looked over as she reached the bottom of the stairs. Seeing Izuku preparing breakfast, she made her way over and set her towel and clothes on the kitchen table before giving hugging Izuku and mumbling a good morning. As his warmth registered to her cold body, she began to squeeze him tighter. The feeling of the arm Izuku wasn't using to cook wrapping around her back only caused her to pull herself deeper into his warm embrace. After far too short of a period for her liking, Izuku pulled his arm away from her and gently began to pull her arms from their hold on his torso. Somewhere in her brain, the realization that she had come downstairs to shower overpowered the feeling of Izuku's warmth, and she let go of her boyfriend, picking up her clothes and towel from the kitchen table and making her way over to the showers. Ten minutes later, and Katsumi was much more awake, taking her clothes back to her room and then joining Izuku for breakfast. Today it was blueberry muffins, the kind that Izuku and Enko always made too many of and stored in the freezer for later. As good as they were reheated, however, the still warm muffins were delicious, being another one of the recipes that Izuku and M4 had perfected over the years. Twenty minutes later, as they were finishing up, Momo came out of the hallway leading to her room and started to walk towards the smell of food before realizing that Izuku and Katsumi were sitting there. She had a double take at Izuku's presence before she remembered what had happened yesterday. After greeting them and asking if she could have some of the food Izuku had prepared, she sat down with her breakfast and watched as Izuku and Katsumi began to start playing the same game that the four of them had been playing last night. Watching them work together without herself and Tomoya was fascinating to watch. The two of them worked together in a way that belied the fact that they had known each other for a long time, often working in silence with only the occasional hum from one of the two of them to bring something to the other's attention. Their tactics and distribution of equipment were well practiced, with Katsumi playing the role of the tank and dealing damage while Izuku supported her and healed the two of them. At times, however, he would take unreasonably long shots with the sniper rifle that they invariably acquired. They weren't like the ones he had made last night before they teamed up on him, where if she hadn't seen him make them in person she would have accused him of cheating, but rather shots that she could see herself making given enough time to line them up. Despite her knowledge that he didn't have a quirk to enhance his vision, his reaction time and mastery of the mechanics of the game made every shot a guaranteed kill. Halfway through her breakfast, two things happened. First, Tomoyo got up and joined her in eating some of the best food she had ever eaten. After last night's dinner, she was beginning to wonder if all of the food that Izuku made was this good and how much time it took him to cook food that well. Second, and more interestingly, Katsumi leaned into Izuku on the couch as they played, his arm around her shoulders as he continued playing with only one hand. Momo had lived a sheltered life, but even she was able to put the pieces together from what she had observed and realized that the two of them were, if not in a relationship, extremely close friends. She watched closely, attention lost on the last two bites of muffin sitting on her plate as she compared the two of them to her parents, trying to narrow down the specifics of their relationship. Only when Tomoyo rose from the table did she realize that she was staring and quickly finished her second muffin. 
The four of them were all relatively early risers, and as Momo and Tomoyo took their places around the couch and picked up their controllers the clock hadn't even reached 7.30. Today was the busiest day for move-ins, with 11 of their classmates scheduled to be moving into the dorms over the course of the day. Still, with campus opening at 9, the four of them had this time to themselves. Over the course of their peaceful hour and a half, the four of them got to know each other better, going into each other's interests more thoroughly than they had yesterday. As the clock ticked past 9, however, their solitude came to an abrupt end. In the short minute that it took to drive from the gate to the dormitory, the quartet heard the sounds of two different vehicles approaching. One held the softer tones of an electric car, while the pitch of the other implied a diesel engine. Izuku, Katsumi, and Tomoya went outside to greet the new arrivals, both of whom had probably been waiting outside the gate to make it in so early. Out of the electric car jumped a pink-skinned girl with horns, who rushed over to the other car before it even stopped and pulled open the passenger door. By the time both cars were parked, the two girls were already on their way to greet the welcoming group. The pink-toned girl, who introduced herself as Ashido Mina, gave Izuku a few odd looks until he introduced himself, allowing her to connect the dots between him and the top scorer in the exam. She excitedly asked him a few questions faster than Izuku could hope to reply before the other girl gave a long-suffering sigh, and grabbed her by the shoulder, shaking her lightly to try and return to the introductions. She introduced herself as Kirishima Aiko, and explained that the two of them had been friends since middle school. After a few minutes and the combined work of all five of them, the cars were quickly unloaded, and their contents brought to the same room on the second floor. A round of goodbyes later and the pair of newcomers split up, Aiko choosing to unpack some of the things she had brought with her while Mina stayed with the group on the first floor. Now that Aiko was too far away to stop her, she asked Izuku quite a few questions about how he had gotten in with such a high score even though he was. Well, a he. She was clearly unsatisfied by some of Izuku's answers, wanting to know more about how he had managed to take down 200 points worth of robots with only a sword. But the glare that she was receiving from Katsumi caused her to back off slightly. Picking up the fifth of eight controllers, she joined them in their game. Foreseeing a future problem, Izuku glanced towards the security camera that he knew M4 was watching him through and tapped his controller a few times, confirming that his message was properly conveyed with his quirk. A few minutes of fabricating a design for the controllers that used as few nanobots as possible, and a significant portion of the backup batteries that Izuku had brought with him later, M4 was ready to bring the 13 new controllers downstairs with Midoriya. His choice to maintain the human form instead of the crawling nanobot swarm proved to be the right one as he encountered Aiko on his way down to the first floor. Once he arrived, however, the fear that he avoided with his form was replaced with confusion as Aiko looked between the Izuku that was sitting on the couch, and Midoriya, who was walking towards the couch. Mina and Katsumi, due to the angle they were sitting at, could see him as he walked closer, but their reactions couldn't have been more different. Katsumi looked up at the motion in her peripheral vision, registered Midoriya, and then returned her focus to the game. Mina, unaccustomed to the oddities that followed Izuku, dropped her controller into her lap in shock. Huh, who's that? Izuku. No, wait you're sitting right how can there be? Her black eyes unfocused for a second before gleaming, staring at Midoriya as he continued to approach. A twin brother. Izuku, why didn't you tell me that you have a twin brother who also got in? That seems like it would be an important thing to know. Izuku glanced up to see Midoriya standing behind him, nodding before looking over at Mina. I hate to break it to you, Mina, but I don't have a twin brother. He is just a robotic body being piloted by my artificial intelligence, M4. For the sake of convenience, we call him Midoriya and me Izuku. Though, I guess he also passed the entrance exams if you think about it. Mina and Aiko reacted to this news in their own ways, with Aiko simply shrugging and accepting the odd occurrence, saving her questions for later. Mina blue-screened, freezing for a few seconds at the refutation of her theory and the bombshell that Izuku had just dropped on her. What? You can't just say something like that and not give any more details, Izuku. M4, fabricating the controllers inside Midoriya's chest, picked up the explanation. Though you may lack the context, I believe it was a descriptive enough statement. I am M4, the fourth generation artificial intelligence created by Midoriya Izuku 13 years ago. This body is simply an avatar comprised of nanobots to allow me to interact with the physical world. As you can see, by this point M4 had pulled the fourth controller from a rippling portion on his chest, I am clearly non-organic. The two of them who had not been introduced to M4 already were staring at the incredibly realistic copy of their classmate pulling large objects out of his chest with a mixture of horror and awe. Momo, quite used to the idea of pulling her creations from her skin, looked on with interest, not too concerned with the sight. Tomoyo had a similar look of discomfort to Aiko and Mina, while Izuku and Katsumi paid almost no attention to the scene in front of them. After he had finished delivering the controllers, Midoriya said his goodbyes and made his way back to Izuku's room. After the round ended, Aiko picked up one of the old controllers while Izuku deliberately switched to one of the newly created ones, taking advantage of the fact that they had a near-zero input lag due to M4 hosting the different accounts of the six of them in tandem with his monitoring of the inputs from the controllers. 
The six of them continued playing throughout the morning as new people rolled in, a suitsuyu, a girl with a frog quirk who sat at the kitchen table and slowly worked her way through some of the leftover breakfast, Takoyami Fumiko, a crow-headed girl who stayed in her room, and Kayo Kajiru, who had headphone jacks coming out of her ears who joined the six of them in their game. For lunch, they threw together items that they found in the fridge and cupboards to go with the remaining ten muffins from breakfast. It was an odd assortment of final meals that came out of this plan, but everyone was satisfied with the arrangement. During lunch, two new people arrived, Minoru Minerva and Todoroki Shoko. Neither of them had the opportunity to do more than introduce themselves, but the general impression was that Shoko was withdrawn and Minerva was mischievous. Their impression of Minerva as merely mischievous would quickly be updated. After finishing his lunch, Izuku excused himself to use the bathroom. With his departure, the whispering questions about his presence from Shoko, Fumiko, and Suyu surfaced, and the girls who had arrived earlier were happy to answer their questions. Minerva, however, was simply not of the same mind. There's a man living with us in the dorm. How do you think he got in? Do you think he's single? Maybe he'd be willing to. Perverted, they agreed, was a better descriptor than mischievous. And judging by Katsumi's growing fury at the increasingly suggestive questions she was asking, perhaps unaware and lacking self-preservation, the explosive pops of Katsumi's quirk, had Izuku been nearby, would have been familiar enough for him to calm her down. Unfortunately for the purple-haired girl, nobody present was knowledgeable enough about Katsumi's quirk or her tells for various emotions to save Minerva from her fate. Does anyone know what room he's staying in? The little midnight stroll wouldn't. Minerva was cut off by the rather loud explosion punctuating the pops of individual beads of sweat. All of the heads in the room turned to the girl who was slowly becoming truly incandescent with rage. Her clothes all being made of material that would resist her explosions, Katsumi's only limitation was not damaging anything inside the building. Listen up, Minoru. Izuku is my boyfriend, and if you so much as try a single one of the things that you suggested, nobody will find your body. Well, perhaps M4 could, but that's beside the point. You are going to shut up and find some other target for your perversions. M. I clear. Each of her last words was punctuated with a louder than normal explosion, the ringing sound dying out to the sounds of Minerva's hasty agreements, and the sink running in the bathroom. A few seconds later, Izuku left the bathroom and quickly made his way over to where Katsumi was staring down Minerva, who was doing her best to look anywhere other than at the two of them. Izuku's words were quiet as he pulled her away from the diminutive girl, but they still carried through the silent room. Kaken, you didn't need to threaten anyone with explosions, no matter what they said. Remember, we're all going to be classmates and live together, and you can't start off a relationship like that. This is an Aldra, remember. Katsumi's response was louder and carried just as easily through the common area. If you'd heard what she was saying, Izuku, you'd have reacted just like I did. Perhaps not with the explosions, but with the causal apocalypses that you make for fun. With that, Katsumi left to go to her room. Excusing himself, Izuku followed her upstairs, hoping to calm her down as best he could. After the rest of them finished lunch, they went over to continue playing their game on the console. Before they could start, however, the screen turned blue and a geometric head with glowing green eyes filled the center of the screen. Momo and Tomoyo recognized this as the face that M4 had used yesterday night, but before they could say anything a voice came from every device capable of producing sound in the room. Although Katsumi may have gotten the point across, Minoru Minerva, I would like to reiterate, actions of that nature taken against my creator will not end well for you, and there is nowhere that you can hide from me. With that said, welcome to the dormitory. I hope that all of us can get along well despite a rocky start. The screen flickered and returned to the welcome screen of the game. Over the rest of the day, Minerva would attempt to rebuild bridges with her classmates, and most of them would tentatively accept. Izuku and Katsumi, however, never returned to the common area, not even for dinner. Katsumi had locked herself in her room, but Izuku's persistence eventually won out over her anger at Minerva for being exactly the type of girl that she thought she would never encounter again after leaving Aldera. She unlocked the door and went back to her bed, lying down as she simmered in her emotions. After a series of dull thuds on the floor, she started at the feeling of the bed moving. The bed with her in it was picked up off of the ground and carried away from the wall before being set down. Lifting her head to look around, she saw Izuku walking away from the bed and walking towards a plastic bin that he had brought into the room, the opaque material occluding the contents from her. From the box he first pulled a roll of blue painter's tape, using it to split the room in half along the walls. Following that, he began to remove cans of paint and brushes of varying size. It was at this point that Katsumi caught on to what Izuku was going to do. Back when she and Izuku were ten, Izuku had gotten it into his head to paint the walls of his room instead of merely hanging paintings there. It had taken him a few days at the time with parental supervision, but in the end, she had been impressed enough to ask for him to paint her room as well. His initial design for his own room had been a series of mountain peaks surrounding the walls with himself, her, Inko, Mitsuki, and Masaru split across the five segments of wall. The two of them had their places on either side of the door, while the adults looked on from the other walls. Over the years it had changed to reflect their changes in appearance as they aged, with only Masaru untouched by the passage of time. 
The general theme remained, however, and she would be willing to bet that if she were to walk into Izuku's room next door right now, the scene would either be replicated there or be in the process of being replicated. Before he began painting, Izuku pushed open the two windows as far as he could, trying to establish air circulation so that they wouldn't be inhaling the fumes of the paint as he worked. The buckets that he started to open immediately confirmed her suspicion of the scenery that he was going to adorn her walls with. In her room, so long ago, she had asked him to paint the scene of a forest, one of the places that Masaru had mentioned wanting to bring her in the videos that he left for her, and her mom. The four of them had taken a trip to the forest, walking around on one of the trails while Izuku ran ahead to find the best views to recreate. It had been a fun time, even if it was tempered by Masaru's absence, but the very next day Izuku was at the door to her house bright and early with a handful of paintbrushes, and co-trailing behind with an assortment of paint cans. Over the next week, the light blue walls of her room were repainted into one of the many offshoots of the trail, trees surrounding the room with a slightly sparser amount as they neared the door, which had taken the place of the path. Unlike Izuku, she had never tried or asked to update the paint. For her, the immortalized moment of that day was far more valuable than the way the forest may look now. From her spot on the bed, she watched as Izuku popped open the various cans of paint and began his work. There was something relaxing about watching the process of the off-white walls of her new room turning into a replica of her room at home, and being able to vent her frustrations to Izuku certainly helped. A few hours later, Izuku was nearly a third of the way done with painting her half of the room. Katsumi was at her desk, switching between a few mindless games as she watched Izuku slowly but surely make his way through his self-assigned task. It was taking significantly longer than his room had, but Izuku had skipped a significant portion of the walls by simply using a paint roller for the sky instead of the smaller brushes he preferred for higher levels of detail. While he was working, however, a knock came from the door of the room. The door was ajar, so the knock was more for courtesy than anything else. Nevertheless, both Katsumi and Izuku turned to look at the sound. They were greeted with the sight of a set of clothes floating in mid-air with two disconnected gloves, one hovering near the door while the other rested at the side. Having both of their attention, the invisible girl introduced herself. I, hello. My name is Hagakure Toru, and I'll be your classmate for the year. Rising from her bed, Katsumi greeted her. It's nice to meet you, Hagakure-san. My name is Bakugu Katsumi, and if this is your room as well then I'll be your roommate this year. Izuku stood up as well, introducing himself to Toru. It's a pleasure to meet you as well, Hagakure-san. My name is Midoriya Izuku, and I'll be living in the room next door. Sorry for intruding in your room, but I'm just here to decorate for Katsumi for the time being. Toru took a moment to look at the section of the wall that Izuku had already finished painting, one which stretched from the painter's tape above the door to a quarter of the way along the wall beside Katsumi's bed. It was by no means inferior to the artwork that she had seen decorating the walls on her way up here, and she found that she actually liked the aesthetic. While she was admiring the forest scenery, Izuku picked up his box of supplies and moved it out of the way into the room. The gentle thud of Izuku setting down the box snapped the invisible girl back to the present. Oh, it's fine. I'll go downstairs and get my stuff, I'll be right back. Over the next half hour, Toru brought her belongings up from the car parked outside the building to the room, politely declining Izuku's and Katsumi's offers of help. After sorting her clothes into her drawers and closet, she sat on her bed and opened her phone. Between browsing through her social media and playing a game, she watched Izuku as he methodically worked his way across the wall. One of the perks of being invisible, in her opinion, was that she could simply turn her head while maintaining the motions of her hands, and nobody would be able to tell what she was actually looking at. Of course, the downsides of being invisible were also readily apparent, such as people not noticing you, people forgetting about you, and generally having to be much more aware of the people around you at all times. This wasn't even getting into the problems that arose from not even being able to see herself, but she had learned to deal with those or work around them as quickly as she could. Izuku, however, was very aware of her presence. He had been trying to piece together how her quirk worked, eventually arriving at the conclusion that her skin, flesh, and bones were somehow entirely transparent instead of using onaic energy to manipulate the light around her. The obvious counter to this idea was that recently eaten food should still be visible, which would make it much harder to remain undetected. He had confirmed that the food she had eaten wasn't visible, but the mechanism was eluding him entirely. So, as he worked through the task he had set for himself, he was constantly checking on her presence, and status using his quirk and was well aware that she was watching him work. Eventually, Katsumi got fed up with the silence and began to talk with the introverted girl, trying to coax her into opening up about herself. Slowly, she succeeded, beginning with more inane topics such as her quirk and activities that she liked doing before moving into more personal subjects. While they were talking about quirks, she would occasionally glance over to Izuku, feeling slightly guilty about talking about quirks in front of someone who could never have one. When she actually voiced this discomfort to Katsumi, the explosive girl shrugged it off. Toru, if he cared that much about things other people said, do you really think that he would be here right now? 
Besides, even without a quirk, he managed to become the top scorer in the entrance exam, which is proof enough that it doesn't matter. Almost done with the second stretch of wall, Izuku voiced his opinion. A quirk is certainly a great aid to people that want to be heroes, but I've found that they too often tend to force people into certain mindsets. For instance, your invisibility quirk lets you perform reconnaissance and stealth operations far better than almost anyone else without any training on your part. Because of this, you've probably trained to hold your breath longer, to avoid making noise, and all manner of things related to stealth. However, such a reliance on the skills you are naturally gifted with narrows your vision. You could learn how to fight effectively with a weapon, how to fight hand-to-hand -hand against unsuspecting opponents, or any number of other skills. Few heroines learn to expand from their initial gifts, but many would benefit from a change of perspective. Katsumi, who had heard a similar argument from Izuku in various forms over the past decade, rolled her eyes. What he tactfully wasn't mentioning was that there was a certain set of heroines that could simply ignore the advice that Izuku had given. Women with particularly strong quirks could simply ignore everything else in favor of learning how to use their quirks more effectively. All Might with her strength and speed, Endeavor with her pyrokinesis, and herself with her explosions. Any of them could simply rely on their quirks to power through most scenarios they found themselves in. For people like Toru, who couldn't expand the ability or scope of their quirk, such advice was much more useful. Learning a supplementary skill to their quirk could propel them far beyond what they limited themselves to by only using their quirk. Izuku was an example of this advice taken to its logical extreme. Even without a conventional quirk, he could hold his own against one of the strongest heroines of all time through a mix of his own ability to sword fight. The technology he had built, and training his senses to the point where he could predict and react to attacks moving thousands of times faster than most would be able to. After an hour and a half more, Izuku finally stood from his position and stretched, his arms moving laterally upwards to avoid the ceiling. All right Kakin, that's my work done. I'm going to head back to my room and work for a bit, so if you want to talk just let M4 know. He hugged her briefly before packing up the paint and brushes and making his way back to the room. Breaking away from the conversation to return the hug, she took a moment to look at the completed artwork covering her half of the room. It was certainly different from when they had visited in the early spring so long ago, now mimicking the same view in midsummer. Her eyes traced the trunks on the walls, lost in the updated scenery until a gloved hand poked her in the shoulder. Turning around, she was faced with a much closer outfit than before, Toru's head much closer to her own by the sound of her voice. Are the two of you, you know, together? Or are you just really good friends? I didn't want to ask while he was still in the room in case you weren't, but now that he's gone you have to tell me everything. This was surprising behavior coming from the reserved girl, but Katsumi wasn't one to distance herself from her roommate before the year even began. And for someone with a more respectful interest than Minerva, she was happy to oblige. We are both good friends and boyfriend and girlfriend. I've known him for as long as I can remember, and he asked me if we could be boyfriend and girlfriend on New Year's this year and I said yes. If I had my way, that would have happened a lot earlier, but I didn't want. Their voices dropped out of Izuku's earshot as he closed the door to his room behind him. Setting down the box of painting supplies in the unused closet space, Izuku moved over to his desk and turned on his computer. Now that he had a better idea of what Yue could provide for him, it was time to get to work planning for some of the more lucrative ideas that he had come up with years ago. Pulling up the document, he moved it over to a spreadsheet and started putting his quirk to use, asking questions such as this project is completable at UA, and this project will take less than a week to complete to sort them. Unfortunately, there were still some ideas that even UA couldn't help him with, such as building vehicles larger than a motorcycle, or machines running on more exotic forms of energy. For the smaller and more mundane projects, however, he would certainly be able to make progress on them where he had been stuck for so long. After spending some time doing this, however, he was sidetracked by a message on his phone. Plugging it into his computer, M4 did the legwork of projecting the phone's screen onto the computer. The notification was from the messaging app that UA used, unimaginatively titled UChat. He had been invited to several groups, which was the subject of the notification. Three of them were marked as official, those being the group chats for the hero course in general, the first year group chat, and the read-only chat for school-wide messages. The other two, however, lacked this tag and were much less structured in the notification inviting him. One of them was the chat for 1A, the invite coming from Kyokajiru indicating that she was the one who had created the chat. He accepted it without thinking, the chat automatically opening to reveal a list of messages indicating other people accepting the invitation. The other invitation was much more interesting. You've been invited to join UA Boys by Sakamoto Kai accept, reject. Accepting the invitation, Izuku was immediately met with a message from Kei welcoming the freshman boys to the group chat. It was a formulaic opening, introducing himself and the group as a whole, along with the resources available to them as a student organization. Kei was in the business course, and he mentioned the male seniors currently in the different courses in the message as well. While he was reading the introduction, another message appeared, also from Kay. Also, we're proud to announce that for the first time ever, one of us has made it into the hero course. Congratulations to Midoriya Izuku for his groundbreaking accomplishment. 
We are excited to be here for this historic event and look forward to meeting in person at our first event, a celebration tomorrow evening in room C211 of the Macquarie Economics Building. Before he could even ask, M4 pulled up his calendar in a smaller window and added the event, location, and time. Izuku smiled. It was such a minor detail, something that would only have taken a few seconds, but the gesture meant more to him than it should have. Taking some time to look through the other group chats, some more populated than others, Izuku leaned back in his chair. Classes wouldn't begin for another few days, and yet the feeling had definitely shifted from the loneliness of a few days ago to that of a community. Abruptly aware of how hungry he was, Izuku looked at the clock sitting on a short table next to his bed. Noticing that it was nearly an hour after he normally ate dinner, he stood up and headed to the second floor kitchen to make himself some dinner. Half an hour later and Izuku was seated at the kitchen table, slowly eating as he checked his phone. The one a group chat was lively, and Izuku was happy to get to know the people he had missed while calming Katsumi down. Everyone's introductions were pinned, allowing him to easily look through what his classmates had to say about themselves. While he was preparing his dinner, M4 had posted an introduction for Izuku as well as himself, both of which attracted significantly more attention than any of the others. With Izuku's introduction they were curious about how he had gotten in more than anything. But with the latter introduction some of his classmates were freaking out. M4, the digital entity that he was, had no problem creating an account in the UA intranet or hiding it from detection. To him, Katsumi, and Izuku, such a thing was expected. To his classmates, however, it only reinforced his image as the ghost in the machine that he had shown while rebuking Minerva when they couldn't find him in the group of people in the chat. Kayoka Jiru, who created the chat and invited everyone personally, only fanned the flames when she asked how he was in the chat. His response, if you were capable of making a chat that Izuku could join but I couldn't I'd be astonished. The chaos died down with time, moving on to speculation about the rest of their classmates and their upcoming classes. The other group chats that he was in were much less eventful but far more chaotic due to their much larger size. The first year group chat was a mess of people asking legitimate questions and others trying to answer, while the vast majority of messages sent were off topic. Interestingly, there was a single announcement in the read-only channel telling the students about an upcoming assembly on the first day of classes. Included were directions to the stadium used for the yearly sports festival, presumably the only place on campus that could host the entire student body at once. Izuku noticed that instead of a notification telling him that the channel was read only at the bottom of the screen, he had an open box that he could presumably type in. Chalking it up to M4, Izuku swiped out of the application before pocketing his phone and washing his dishes. Opting to go to bed early tonight, Izuku walked back to his room. It felt odd to be in the state of purposelessness that he was currently in, but with a few events in the near future and the following classes, he was sure that it would soon be put to an end. 